Nonis, Dionysiaca. Translated by W. H. D. Rouse. Volume 3. Book 36. In the 36th, Bacchus, after his surges of madness, changes his shape and attacks Dyriades. With this speech he encouraged the glad leaders, and Dyriades on his part put his own soldiers under arms. The gods who dwell in Olympus ranged themselves in two parties to direct the warfare on both sides, these supporting Dyriades, those Lyaeos. Zeus lord of the blessed throned high on Kern held the tilting balance of war. From heaven sea blue hair of the waters challenged fiery Helios, Ares challenged bright eyes, Hephaestus Hidaspus, Highland Artemis that facing Hera, Hermes rod in hand came to conflict with Leto. A double din of divine battle resounded for the two parties of the blessed. As they rushed to conflict, seven rude Ares joined battle with Tritogenia, and cast a valiant spear, the goddess was untouched, but it struck full on the aegis, and ran through the snaky crop of hair on the gorgon's head, which none may look upon. So it wounded only the shaggy target of Pallas, and the sharpened point of the whizzing unbending spear scored the counterfeit hair of Medusa's image. Then the battle-stirring maiden, motherless Pallas, rushed forwards in her turn and raised her birthmate spear, the weapon as old as herself, with which at her birth she leapt out of her father's pregnant head born in armor. Huge Ares was hit, and sank to the ground on one knee, but Athena helped him up and sent him back to his dear mother Hera unwounded, when the duel was done. Against Hera came Highland Artemis as champion for hill-ranging Dionysus, and rounded her bow aiming straight. Hera as ready for conflict seized one of the clouds of Zeus, and compressed it across her shoulders where she held it as a shield proof against all, and Artemis shot arrow after arrow moving through the airy vault in vain against that mark, until her quiver was empty, and the cloud still unbroken she covered thick with arrows all over. It was the very image of a flight of cranes moving in the air and circling one after another in the figure of a wreath, the arrows were stuck in the dark cloud, but the veil was untorn and the wounds without blood. Then Hera picked up a rough missile of the air, a frozen mass of hail, circled it and struck Artemis with the jagged mass. The sharp, stony lump, broke the curves of the bow. But the consort of Zeus did not stop the fight there, but struck Artemis flat on the skin of the breast, and Artemis smitten by the weapon of ice emptied her quiver upon the ground. Then the wife of Zeus mocked at her, Go and shoot wild beasts, Artemis. Why do you quarrel with your betters? Climb your crags, what is war to you? Wear your trumpery shoes and let Athena wear the greaves. Stretch your cunning nets. Dogs, not winged arrows, hunt and kill your beasts. You handle no weapon to kill lions, the sweats of your paltry labors are timid hares. Attend to your stags and your horned team, attend to your stags, why should you exalt the son of Zeus, the driver of panthers and the charioteer of lions. Keep your bow, if you like, for Eros also bends a bow. What you ought to do, you virgin marriage hater, you midwife, is to carry the cestus, love's ferry, the helper of childbed, in company with Eros and the Paphian, for you have power over birth. Be gone then to the bedchambers of women in labor of child, you the guide of creative birth, and shoot women with the arrows of childbirth, be like a lion beside the young wife in labor, be midwife rather than warrior. Nay, cease to be chaste yourself because of your chaste girdle, since Zeus our lord on high assumes your shape to woo virgins unwedded. The Arcadian woods still tell of that love-stealing copy of you which seduced unwedded Callisto, the mountains lament still your bear who saw and understood, and reproached the false enamored image of the archeress, when a female paramour entered a woman's bed. Come, throw away your useless quiver, and cease fighting with Hera who is stronger than you. Fight Citherin, if you like, the childbed nurse against the marriage maker. So Hera spoke, and passed on, leaving Artemis discomfited and drunken with fear. Phoebus threw both his arms about her in pity, and brought her out of the turmoil, he left her in a lonely coppice, and returned unnoticed, to join the battle of the gods. And now a fiery chief stood up to the champion of the deep, Phoebus, to fight with Poseidon. He set shaft on string, 
and also lifted a brand of Delphic fur in each hand, double dexterous, to use fire against the surging sweep of water, and arrows against the trident. Fiery lance and watery arrows crashed together, while Phoebus defended, his home the upper air rattled a thunderclap for a battle song, the stormy trumpet of the sea brayed in the ears of Phoebus, a broad-beard triton boomed with his own proper conch, like a man half-finished, from the loins down a greeny fish, the Nereids shouted the battle cry, Arabian Nerus pushed up out of the sea and bellowed, shaking his trident. Then Zeus of the underworld rumbled hearing the noise of the heavenly fray above, he feared that the earth shaker, beating and lashing the solid ground with the earthquake shock of his waves, might leave out of gear the whole universe with his trident, might move the foundations of the abysm below and show the forbidden sight of the earth's bottom, might burst all the veins of the subterranean channels and pour his water away into the pit of Tartaros, to flood the moldering gates of the lower world. So great was the din of the gods in conflict, and the trumpets of the underworld added their noise. But Hermes lifted his rod as peacemaker and checked both parties, and addressed one speech to three of the immortals. Brother of Zeus, and you his son, you, famous archer, throw to the winds your bow and your brand, and you, your pronged trident, lest the titans laugh to see a battle among the gods. Let there not be intestine war in heaven once again, after that conflict with Kronos which threatened Olympus, let me not see another war after the affray with Iapetus. Let not Zeus be angry again for late-born Bacchus as for Zagreus, and set the whole earth ablaze with his fire a second time, and pour down showers of rain through the air to flood the circuit of the eternal universe. I hope I may not behold the sea in the sky and Selene's car soaking, may Phaethon never again have his fiery radiance cooled. You then yield to your elder, the ruler of the sea, do this grace to your father's brother, because earth, shaker the ruler of the brine honors your Seagit Delos, cease not to love your palm tree, to remember your olive. And earth shaker, what second sea crops will be judge here? What second in Achos has awarded her city to hear that you take arms against Apollo as well as Athena, and seek a second quarrel after your quarrel with Hera? And you, horned one, father of great Deriades, beware of the fire of Hephaestus after the torch of Bacchus, or he may consume you with his fire-pronged thunderbolt. This appeal put an end to the gods' intestine strife. Then Deriades, mad and furious, when he saw the Bacchants unharmed, began the battle again, when he saw Bacchus whole on the field he goaded his fugitive captains to rally, and to footmen and horsemen alike he roared his barbaric threats in a loud voice. This day either I shall drag Dionysus by the hair, or his assault shall destroy the Indian nation. You, fall on the satyrs and check them by main force, let Deriades confront Dionysus. Burn the vine plants and all the various gear of Bacchus and set fire to their camp, bring the Mainalids as slaves to triumphant Deriades, consume with fire every Thyasus of the enemy, as for the Oxhorn Salinoi and the crowds of satyrs, shear off like a crop all their heads with devastating steel, and hang the oxhorn skulls in strings round all our houses. May Phaethon not turn his fire-blazing horses to his setting before I bring in the satyrs, and Bacchus bound with galling fetters, with his spotted cloak torn to rags on his chest by my spear and his thyasus thrown away. Burn to ashes with my brand the long flowing hair of the women and their wreaths of vine. Courage all! After the Indian battle you may sing the glorious victory of Deriades, that even in many generations to come people may shiver to face the unconquerable Indians born of the earth. He spoke, and passing from one to another of his chieftains he goaded on the drivers of the elephants, those creatures of endless life, and set the chiefs in their places to lead the army of foot soldiers to the battle in close columns. With equal passion for the fight, Bacchus Thyajmad drove to the combat his line of wild beasts from the wilderness. These mountain-bred warriors roaring under the divine whip rushed madly on. Many wild beasts were there with their weapons in their mouths. There were serpents spitting from their ravening teeth fountains of poison, which they sent far shot into the air with hissing gape and rattling throat. Leaping sideways and darting at their foes, the snaky arrows found a mark which offered itself, the bodies of the Indians were surrounded and imprisoned by the coils, the feet of men starting to run were entangled in a rope. 
The war maddened women imitated the attack of Fidelia the snake thrower, who once was stung to show what a woman could do in battle, and conquered her enemies with clusters of snakes. One shooting a spike of poison from his mouth like a long shafted spear bespattered Deriades, and his corslet of steel was wetted by the deadly drops. Dead on the ground lay a body struck by a living missile, lifeless with a living shot in him. A panther leapt through the air with his feet upon the curved neck of a straight leg elephant, and stuck close to the monster's head delaying the course of all the long-legged elephants. A great swarm fell, when they heard the lions from the wilderness, and the terrible loud roar resounding from their throats. One was conquered trembling at the bellow of a bull, and seeing the point of his formidable horn stabbing sideways into the air, another leapt into flight shuddering at the jaws of a bear, the hounds of an invincible pan gave tongue one after another, in concert with the roars of the wild beasts, and the swarthy Indians feared their loud barking attack. There was hard fighting on both sides alike, the thirsty earth was inundated with blood and gore in the common carnage, and Lethe was choked with that great multitude of corpses brought low and scattered on every side. Hades heaved up his bar in the darkness, and opened his gates wider for the common carnage, as they descended into the pit the banks of Charon's river echoed the rumblings of Tartaros. Loud indeed was the battle-stirring noise, many the wounds of the falling combatants on both sides. One struck in the throat slipped from his horse, one pierced through the chest in his rounded bosom, one wounded in the belly fell from a chariot. Another hit just in the mid-nipple with a barbed arrow rolled himself over to meet approaching death, one fell struck right on the waist, one through the shoulder, another left his swift horse truck, and fleeing on foot fell pierced by a lance through the spine. Another, fell before the down was on his face, mourned for his year's mate youth. Another mortally wounded by an arrow in the liver, fell tumbling off his elephant with a thud into the dust, his head sank on the ground, he scrabbled with his hands and clutched the bloody soil in despair. A man stood sideways to meet a horseman, he had filled the hollow of his shield with dust, and fixed his foot firmly awaiting the man's onset. Pushing out the handsome shield in his bold hand, he smothered the horse's head with sand. The horse reared wildly and threw up his head shaking the dust out of his mane, and spat out the curved ends of his jeweled bit. His champing teeth and jaw were covered with foam, he rose high, shaken, mad, and now free of the bit he rose up on his hind legs quivering and shivering his outstretched neck, then pawing the dust with his hoof he shot his rider flying to the ground. The other man rushed fiercely upon him as he lay, with swift sword drawn, and cut the throat of the black soldier stretched on the ground. Another horse hearing the crack of some driver's whip hard by, took fright and bolted in retreat, trampling on his own rider, who lay wounded and dying, poor wretch, gasping in the dust. Collates with his huge body, immense, formidable, nine cubits high, equal to Alionius, went raging through the fighting hosts of Bacchus. He wished after the battle to drag a company of Bassarids to his bed, and no bride price paid for the forced bridles. But that was an empty hope he fought for, that mighty man, like bold Otos, who would tread the forbidden ground of heaven for lust of the holy bed of Archeress the unwedded, like Ephialtus, whose love was for wedlock with pure Athena, when he attacked Olympus in the clouds on high. Such was Colites, gigantic, heaven high, having in him the sacrilegious blood of his giant ancestor the founder of the Indian race. He was great enough to put Ares in prison like the sons of Iphimedia. But huge as he was, a woman killed him with a sharp stone, Charapia leader of the Bacchic dance. And one seeing the noble deed of the high-necked girl, spoke in trembling tones with wonder and anger mixed. Ares. Ares. Leave your bow and shield and your spear. Ares, you are conquered. Leave the Caucasus, for Dionysus is bringing another sort of Amazons into the field, to kill men. Shield lest they rout men at arms. Not from your Thermodon has he brought his women. I have seen a strange and incredible spectacle, the Amazons of Dionysus have no shields on their shoulders, carry no valiant spear, with strong corslets and all, the Caucasian women do not so play the heroes. The Bacchant women cast bunches of leaves from foliage-loving hands, and they need no steel. 
Alas for the madman Deriades, when women tear coats of mail with their fingernails. This he said, when he marveled at the rude missile which the backhand girl picked up and killed that huge high-headed man. But Deriades ran untouched against the frenzied Bacchantes, and pursued Kuropu through the stone, but she escaped, and took her stand fighting boldly beside Dionysus, stabbing with her flower Ithiasus in the Ewan battle. Then Deriades killed Orithalos with his spear, one of the Curetian tribe from the land of the Abantes. Their chief Melissius in anger for his comrade's fall, struck down Silleros king of the Carminians, cutting his throat with his sharp sword, and Logosides, who alone, because he was accomplished in the art of war, was more precious to Deriades than any of the bold Indian spearmen, and the king loved him best after Marius, often he touched one table with Orsibo herself and the king, living in the family with the king's daughters, for both with spear and wits he surpassed all his year's mates. Then many a captain fought against captain, tall agile-footed Halimedes against Persicios, Maron against Flogios, Lenius against Theus. Father Cronion tilted the balance of battle. Now Dionysus attacked mighty Deriades, matching spear with Thyasus. As the chieftain stabbed and thrust, the god changed his shape, and put on all sorts of varied forms. Sometimes he confronted him as a wild storm of fire, shooting tongues of crooked flame through dancing smoke. Sometimes he was running water, rolling delusive waves and sprinkling watery shots. Or taking on the exact image of a lion's face, he lifted high his chin straight up and let out a harsh roar through the hairy throat, with a noise like his loud crashing father's rattling thunder. Next like something with an overshadowing mass of variegated fruitage he changed into another shape, and like a sapling of the earth he ran up self-made, bursting into the sky untouched, a perfect pine, or a plain, for his head changed and his hair became what seemed the counterfeit foliage of a tree, his belly lengthened into the trunk, he made his arms the boughs and his dress the bark and rooted his feet, and knocking up with his long branches he whispered into the face of the fighting king. Then he wove a dappled pattern over his limbs, and like a panther he was up in the air with flying leaps, and dropping with gentle steps upon the neck of some lofty elephant, the elephant lunging sideways smashed the car and shot the impious driver to the ground, shaking off yoke pads and bit and bridle. Even though fallen the gigantic warrior would not leave him alone, but fought with Lyaeos transformed and wounded the panther with his spear. But again the god changed his shape, a moving firebrand he rose high, heating the air and shooting a fiery bolt through the wind, running all over the breast and shaggy chest of Deriades. His Arabian mail coat was blackened as the gusts of smoke struck on his white flanks from above and the sparks fell on him, his crest burnt up and the helmet grew hot, half scorched upon the fire-struck wearer. Then he took a lion's shape, and from a grim lion he changed to a wild boar, opening the wide gape of his hairy throat, and bringing his bristles close to the belly of Deriades he stood up straight rearing on his hind legs, and tore through his flank with sharp hooves. Proud Deriades went on fighting against these unsubstantial phantoms, driven by vain hopes, ever seeking to grasp the intangible image with hands that could not touch. At last he thrust his lance in the face of the lion before him, and cried threatenings against Bacchus of many shapes. Why do you hide yourself, Dionysus? Why tricks instead of battle? Do you fear Deriades, that you change into so many strange forms? The panther of runaway Dionysus does not frighten me, his bear I shoot, his tree I cut down with my sword, the pretended lion I will tear in the flank. Well then, I muster against you my wise Brahmins, unarmed. For they go naked, but their inspired incantations have often enchanted Selene as she passes through the air like an untamed bull, and brought her down from heaven, and often stayed the course of faith and swiftly driving his hurrying car. He spoke, surveying the varied visions of Bacchus, and his mind was still unbelieving, with implacable will he hope to contrive some scheme of magic against Dionysus, and to conquer the son of Zeus by mystic arts. Then he leapt unhindered into his car, but the god seeing the impious man still foolish, made a vine grow to help his attack. The god sent plant laden with clusters of wine fruit crept quietly upon the cart with its silver wheels, and smothered Deriades in its threatening clusters, and entangled him round about and over all, dangling bunch after bunch new grown upon itself before the mad king, 
shading his face and enveloping the whole man. And Geriades was intoxicated by the sweet-smelling fruit of the self-grown vine, it threw fetters not of steel about his two feet, and rooted to the ground the legs of the yoked elephants with trails of unbreakable ivy, not so firmly as the sea-going barge held fast on the main by the toothed bond of a hold the ship, when she fastens her sharp fangs on the timbers. Yes, it was just like that. In vain the driver whipped up his elephants and swung his cracking lash, tearing the obstinate hide with sharper prickles. The great Indian prince, whom countless blades could not kill, was conquered by the tendrils of a champion vine. Deryades struggling with his throat entangled in the vine twigs was choked and crushed in the winding trails. For all his labor he could not stir, wherefore he adjured in tones of madness and sent out a stifled cry from a throat now pious, and prayed with voiceless movements shedding tears of supplication, held out a dumb hand, with eloquent silence uttered all his trouble, his tears were a voice. Then Dionysus dispersed his entangling fruit, and broke off the fettering grapes from Deryades, then shedding the twines of ivy, he undid the wreathing garland of garden vines from the yoked elephant's necks. Yet Deryades, now free from the woody bonds of the long branching clusters crawling of themselves, and the constraint which threatened him, did not desist from his wonted threats and boasts. Once more he was the chieftain defying the gods, he only hesitated whether to slay Bacchus or to make him a slave. But darkness surrounded both armies and put a stop to the fight. Night passed, the battle began again, when they awoke from sleep and bed, the succeeding dawn armed them once more. Not yet was it the end of conflict for impatient Dionysus, yet first there must be many cycles of rolling years while the trumpet blazed the tune of war in vain, but after the varied course of so many battle-stirring years, now the conflict of Bacchus grew more violent for the end. Now the Radamanes of Dicta did not neglect the command of Warmad Dionysus, nor left it for the forgetful winds to care for, but with one accord they built ships of war for Lyaeos. Through the woods they were busy, some here, some there. One was turning pegs, one worked at the middle of the keel, one fitted the planks straight over the pairs of ribs, and fastened the long side planks fixed to the ribs making the vessel's wall, an Arabian shipwright raised upright in the middle of the deep mast box the master midships, reserved for the spreading sail, and skilled workmen of deft Hephaestus and Athena rounded the wooden yard for the top. So they wrought ships for Bacchus with really incomparable art. And Dionysus amid the anxieties of war remembered the prophecy of his own Rhea, that the end of the war would be seen, when Bacchants fought by sea against Indians. Lycos appointed by irrevocable command of Dionysus to serve as commander on the surface of the sea, drove his sea chariot undrenched traveling upon its way to the place, where the Radamanes, those clever voyagers into foreign parts, had built the ships for seafaring Dionysus. And then circling time, rolling the wheel of the four-season year, was whirling along for the sixth year. King Deryades summoned to assembly the black-skinned nation of Indians, the herald with hurrying steps went gathering the people and cried his call in their different languages. At once the many tribes of Indians assembled, and sat down in companies on rows of benches, and Prince Marius addressed the assembly. You all know, I think, my friends, what labors I went through among the mountain strongholds, until the Cilician land and the Assyrian nation bowed their necks as slaves under the yoke of Deryades. You know also what I have done in resisting Dionysus, fighting satyrs, and cutting off the hateful heads of that ox-horned generation with shearing steel, when I dragged away and delivered to Deryades that fettered swarm of Bassarids, the prizes of war, and how the paved streets of the city were purpled by their gore as they were massacred, how others had a dance in the air with their necks choked in a throttling noose, how others were swallowed in a deep dug hollow pit and learnt what a watery death is like. But again I weave a better notion still for our people. I hear that the Radamanes have built ships for Dionysus the runaway by some woodcutters out of theirs. However, I fear not the sea-fighting tree. When was it known in war that women with paltry leaves kill a man in a ship full of shields? When will Highhorn Pan, the crazy ranger of the hills, tear Indian ships to pieces with sharp claws? No sailinos can row over the loud rumbling waters, and sink a ship of war with a peaceful for all, leaping to bloody dance with frenzied foot, striking up a chant with death in it, 
In the sea he will never transfix a man with his bull horns, and get near enough to cut him in two at the waist and vanquish him. No. One blow shall send him headlong, and he shall lie in the billow where he will find no tomb, the backend women struck down with long spears shall sink into the depths of the sea soiled in blood. And the ships of Dionysus I will destroy, thrusting a twenty cubit sea fighting spear through the hulk. Come on, friends, fight with all confidence. Let no one shrink when he sees opposed to us the ships of Bacchus in line, for Indians are used to fighting by sea, indeed they have more prowess when they fight by sea than by land. My invincible steel shall not take many satyrs, but instead of two hundred warriors I will drag home one by the hair alone, woman mad Dionysus, to be the servant of Dariades. With this appeal, Marius, cunning man, persuaded implacable Dariades. The people all cheered loudly and applauded the speech, one concordant cry resounded from all throats like the noise of stirring waves. The king dismissed the assembly. The herald was sent to Bromius to declare war by sea against willing Bacchus. But both men agreed to forbid war and make a truce for three circuits of the moon, until they should do the solemn burial rites for the host of the dead who had fallen. So for a short time there was peace, never far from war, spreading abroad a calm that was pregnant with strife. Book 37. When the 37th takes its turn, there are contests about the tomb, the men competing for prizes. So the Indians, now sensible and busy with friendship, threw their bacchic war to the winds, and buried their dead with tearless eyes, as prisoners now set free from the earthy chains of human life, and the soul returning whence it came, back to the starting place in the circling course. So the army of Bacchus had rest. When Dionysus saw friendly calm instead of war, early in the morning he sent out mules and their attendant men to bring dry wood from the mountains, that he might burn with fire the dead body of Apheltis. Their leader into the forest of pines was Faunus who was well practiced in the secrets of the lonely thickets which he knew so well, for he had learnt about the highland haunts of Circe his mother. The woodman's axe cut down the trees in long rows. Many an elm was felled by the long edge of the axe, many an oak with leaves waving high struck down with a crash, many a pine lay all along, many a fir stooped its dry needles, as the trees were felled far and wide, little by little the rocks were bared. So many a hamadryad nymph sought another home, and swiftly joined the unfamiliar maids of the brooks. Parties coming up would often meet, men on the hills traversing different mountain paths. One saw them up aloft, out in front, coming down, crossing over, with feet wandering in all directions. The sticks were packed in bundles with ropes well twisted and fastened tight and trim, and laid on the mules' backs, the animals set out in lines, and the hooves rang on the mountain paths as they hurried along, the surface of the sandy dust was burdened by heavy logs dragged behind. Satyrs and pans were busy, some cut wood with axes. Some pulled it from tree after tree with their hands. Or lifted trunks with untiring arms and rattled over the rocks with dancing feet. All this woodman laid out upon the earth, where Uios had marked a place on the ground for the tomb of Apheltis. There was a great swarm of men from different cities. Over the body they cut the tress of mourning with the steel of sadness. Groaning for him, they streamed one after another, and covered the whole body with their hair each in his turn. Bacchus lamented the dead with unmournful face and tearless eyes, and cutting one lock from his uncropped head he laid it upon Apheltis as his gift. The Idaean servants of mountain-bred Dionysus built the pyre a hundred feet this way and that way, and on the middle of the pyre they laid out the body. Asterius of Dicta drew the sword that hung by his side, and cut the throats of twelve swarthy Indians over the body, then brought and laid them in a close orderly circle around it. There also he placed jars of honey and oil. Many oxen and sheep of the flock were butchered in front of the pyre, he heaped the bodies of the slain cattle round the body, together with rows of newly slaughtered horses, taking from each of them in turn all the fat which he laid like a rich girdle all round the body. Now fire was wanted. So Faunos the son of rock-loving Circe, the frequenter of the wilderness, who dwelt in the Tyrsenian land, who had learnt as a boy the works of his wild mother, brought from a rock the fire-breeding stones which are tools of the mountain law, 
and from a place where thunderbolts falling from heaven had left trusty signs of victory, he brought the relics of the divine fire to kindle the pyre of the dead. With the sulphur of the divine bolt he smeared and anointed the hollows of the two fire-breeding stones. Then he scraped off a light dry sprig of erythrian growth and put it between the two stones, he rubbed them to and fro, and thus striking the male against the female, he drew forth the fire hidden in the stone to a spontaneous birth, and applied it to the pyre where the wood from the forest lay. But the fire kindled would not run round the dead man's pyre, so the god came near, and fixing his eye on Phaethon, called upon Euros the eastern wind to bring him a breeze to blow on his pyre and help. As Bromius called, the morning star hard by heard his appeal, and sent his brother to Lyaeos, to make the pyre burn up, by his brisker breath. The wind left the rosy chamber of dawn his mother, and fanned the blazing pyre all night long, stirring up the wind leaping fire, the wild breezes, neighbors of the sun, shot the gleams into the air. Along with sorrowing Lyaeos, Asterius of Dicta who was one of his kindred, holding a two-handled cup of sweet fragrant wine, made the dust of the earth drunken in honor of the soul of Aristor's son now carried on the wind. But when morning, the harbinger of dawn's dewy car, scored the night with his ruddy gleams, then all awoke, and quenched their comrades' pyre with cups of Bacchus's juice in turn. Then the hot wind returned on quick pinions to the light-bringing mansion of Helios. Asterius collected the bones, and wrapping them in folded fat laid the relics of the dead in a golden urn. Then the whirling corybants, since their lot was cast in the haunts of Ida, gave burial to the body as an inhabitant of one country, a true-born son of Crete, and digging the foundations deep they made his round tomb in a hollow dug in the earth, and last of all they poured foreign dust over Apheltis. They built up his barrow with taller stones, and engraved these lines on this monument of their recent sorrow, here lies Aristor's son who untimely died, Clossian, Indian slayer, comrade of Bromius, Apheltis. Then the god of the vine brought the funeral prizes. He kept the people there, and marked out a wide space for games with the goal for a chariot race. There was on the ground a stone of a fathom's width, rounded into a half-circle, like the moon, well smoothed on its two sides, such as an old craftsman, has fashioned and rounded with industrious hands wishing to make the statue of a god. A giant cyclops lifted this in his hands and set it in the earth for a stone turning post, and fixed another like it at the opposite end. There were various prizes, cauldron, tripod, shields, horses, silver, Indian jewels, cattle, Pactolian silt. The god offered prizes of victory for the charioteers. For the first, a bow and Amazonian quiver, a demiloon buckler, and one of those warlike women, whom once as he walked on the banks of Thermodon he had taken while bathing and brought to the Indian city. For the second, a bay mare swift as the north wind, with long mane overshadowing her neck, still in foal and gone half her time and her belly swollen with the burden her mates had begotten. For the third, a corslet, and a shield for the fourth. This was a masterpiece made on the Lemnian anvil and adorned with gold patterns, the round boss in the middle was wrought with silver ornaments. For the fifth, two ingots, treasure from the banks of Pactolos. Then he stood up and encouraged the drivers. My friends, whom Ares has taught city storming war, to whom sea blue hair has given the racer's horsemanship. You whom I urge are men not unacquainted with hardship, but used to heavy toils, for our warriors hold dear all sorts of manly prowess. If one is of Lydian birth from Tomolus, he will do deeds worthy of the victorious racing of Pelops. If one comes from the land of Pisa, nurse of horses, a man of Elis with its fine chariots, a countryman of Oinomaus, he knows the sprigs of Olympian wild olive, but this is not the race of Oinomaus, our drivers here have not the goad of a marriage fatal to strangers, this is a race for honor and free from the foam born. If one has the land of Aeonia or the blood of Phocis, he knows the Pythian contest honored by Apollo. If he holds Marathon, rich in olives, the home of artists, he knows those jars teeming with rich juice. If one is a habitant of the fruitful land of Achaia, he has learnt of Pellini, where men wage a shivery contest for the welcome prize of a woolen cloak, a coat to huddle up their cold limbs in winter. 
If he has grown up to live in sea-girdled Corinth, he knows the Isthmian contest of Apollemon. He spoke, and the leaders came hastening up and ran round each to his chariot. First Erechtheus brought his horse Bayard under the yoke, and if they are from the regions near Delphi, 144, they are neighbors of the Pythian games, that these were not founded till centuries later does not seem to trouble Nonis. If they are from the Isthmus of Corinth, 152 to 153, they are to remember that the games there are in honor of Polemon, cf 9. 90. Apparently a chronological scruple prevents him naming the Nemean games, said to have been founded by the seven champions on their way to Thebes. Of the minor games, the prizes for which were not wreaths but objects of value, he mentions 146, the Heraclea at, Marathon, but obviously confuses them with the Panathenia, for the Marathian prizes were silver goblets, shoal. Find. 01. 13. 110, oil being the prize of the Panathenia. In 148 to 149 the allusion is to the Hermat at Polini in Achaia, where the prize was a woolen cloak. Probably, he had his information from Pindar and his scoliast. Fastened in his mare Swiftfoot, both sired by North Wind Boreas in winged coupling when he dragged a Stormfoot Scythonian harpy to himself, and the wind gave them as love price to his good father Erechtheus when he stole Attic or Rathuia for his bride. Second, Actaen swung his Ismenian lash. Third was speedy foal Skelmes, offspring of earth, shaker lord of the wet, who often cut the water of the sea driving the car of his father Poseidon. Fourth Forno slept up, who came into the assembly alone bearing the semblance of his mother's father, with four horses under his yoke like Helios, and fifth the Cates mounted his Sicilian chariot, one insatiable for horsemanship, full of the passion which belongs to the river that feeds the olive trees of Pisa. For he lived in the land of the nymph love by hapless Alpheos, who brings to Arethusa as a gift of love his garlanded waters untainted by the brine. Bold Actaen was led away from the crowd by his father, who addressed these loving injunctions to his eager son. My son, your father Aristos has more experience than you. I know you have strength enough, that in you the bloom of youth is joined with courage, for you have in you the blood of Apollo my father, and our Arcadian mares are stronger than any for the race. But all this is in vain, neither strength nor running horses know how to win, as much as the driver's brains. Cunning, only cunning you want, for horse racing needs a smart clever man to drive. Then listen to your father, and I will teach you too all the tricks of the horsey art which time has taught me, and they are many and various. Do your best, my boy, to honor your father by your successes. Horse racing brings as great a repute as war, do your best to honor me on the race course as well as the battlefield. You have won a victory in war, now win another, that I may call you prize winner as well as spearman. My dear boy, do something worthy of Dionysus your kinsman, worthy both of Phoebus and of skillful Cyrene, and outdo the labors of your father Aristos. Show your horse mastery, win your event like an artist, by your own sharp wits, for without instruction one pulls the car off the course in the middle of a race, it wanders all over the place, and the obstinate horses in their unsteady progress are not driven by the whip or obedient to the bit, the driver as he turns back misses the post, he loses control, the horses run away and carry him back where they will. But one who is a master of arts and tricks, the driver with his wits about him, even with inferior horses, keeps straight and watches the man in front, keeps a course ever close to the post, wheels his car round without ever scratching the mark. Keep your eyes open, please, and tighten the guiding rein swinging the whole near horse about and just clearing the post, throwing your weight sideways to make the car tilt, guide your course by needful measure, watch until as your car turns the hub of the wheel seems almost to touch the surface of the mark with the near circling wheel. Come very near without touching, but take care of the stone, or you may strike the post with the axle against the turning post and wreck both horses and car together. As you guide your team this way and that way on the course, act like a steersman, ply the prick, scold and threaten the whip without sparing, press the off horse, lift him to a spurt, slacken the hold of the bit, and don't let it irk him. Manage your car like a good steersman, 
guide your car on a straight course, for the driver's mind is like a car's rudder if he drives with his head. With this advice, he turned away and retired, having taught his son the various tricks of his trade as a horseman, which he knew so well himself. One after another as usual each put a blind hand into the helmet, turning away his face, and hoping to get the uncertain lot in his favor, as one who shakes his fingers for a throw of the doubtful dice far from him. So the leaders in turn took their lots. Horsemad Fornos, offspring of the famous blood of Phaethon, was first by lot, and Achates was second, next came the brother of Damnamines, and next to him Actaine, but the best racer of all got the last lot, horsewhipper Erechtheus. Then the drivers lifted their leather whips, and stood in a row each in his chariot. The umpire was honest Iacos, his duty was to view the crown eager drivers turning the post, and to watch with unerring eyes how the horses ran. He was the witness of truth, to settle quarrels and differences. The race started from the barrier. Off they went, one leading in the course, one trying to catch him as he raced in front, another chasing the one between, and the last ran close to the latter of these two and strove to graze his chariot. As they got farther on driver caught driver and ran car against car, then shaking the reins forced off the horses with the jagged bit. Another neck and neck with a speeding rival ran level in the doubtful race, now crouching sideways, now stretching himself, now upright when he could not help it, with bent hips urging the willing horse, just a touch of the master's hand and a light flick of the whip. Again and again he would turn and look back for fear of the car of the driver coming on behind, or as he made speed, the horse's hoof in the spring of his prancing feet would be slipping into a somersault, had not the driver checked his still hurrying pace and so held back the car which pressed him behind. Again, one in front with another driver following behind would change his course to counter the rival car, moving from side to side uncertainly so as to bar the way to the other who pressed him close. And Skelnes, offspring of the earth shaker, swung Poseidon's sea whip and drove his father's team bred in the sea, not Pegasus flying on high so quickly cut the air on his long wings, as the feet of the seabred horses covered their course on land unapproachable. The people collected together sat in rows on a high hill, to see the race, and watched from a distance the course of the galloping horses. One stood anxious, another shook a finger and beckoned to a driver to hurry. Another possessed with the fever of horses' rivalry, felt a mad heart galloping along with his favorite driver, another who saw a man running ahead of his favorite, clapped his hands and shouted in melancholy tones, cheering on, laughing, trembling, warning the driver. The fine chariots, faster than the furious bear, now flew high aloft, now skimmed the earth scarcely touching the surface of dust. The track of the car dashing straight on with quick circling wheels scratched the sandy soil as it passed. Then there was a confused struggle, the dust also was stirred and rose to the horses' chests, their manes shook in the airy breezes, the busy drivers shouted all with one voice together louder than their cracking whips. Now they were on the last lap. Skelnes with a swift leap was first of all pressing on his sea chariot. Erechtheus was close upon him whipping up his team, and you might almost say you saw the second car ready to climb aboard the car of the maritime Telkis, for the spirited stallion of Erechtheus was up in the air, panting and snorting with both nostrils, so as to warm the back of the other charioteer. The eyes of Skelmes were turned back again and again on the other driver, and he might have pulled Erechtheus' horse by the mane, and the foaming stallion might have shaken his jaw with a quick jerk and spat out the bit, but Erechtheus checked the car, and turned it to one side with a vigorous pull at the stout reins, wrenching the horse's jaws, slowly towards himself. Then again he drove close, having escaped the disaster of a horse without bit and bridle. And Skelmes when he saw him making for his car shouted in threatening tones. That will do now. It's of no use to run a match with horses of the sea. Pelops long ago driving another car of my father's beat in a race the unconquered horses of Oinomaus. As guide of my horsemanship I will call on the horse god of the deep, you, my friend the horse flogger, direct all your hope to Athena the perfect Webster. I do not want your paltry olive, I'll carry off a different garland, a vinwreath and not your trumpery olive. Erechtheus was a hasty man, 
and these words of Skelmes made him angrier than before, and his quick intelligent mind began at once to weave plots and plans. His hands went on with his driving, but in his heart he uttered a quick prayer to Athena the queen of his own city in his own country language, to crave help in his horsemanship. Lady of Scropia, horse mistress, palace unmothered. As thou didst conquer Poseidon in thy contest, so may Erechtheus thy subject, who drives a horse of Marathon, conquer Poseidon's son. With this appeal he touched up the flanks of his colts and brought up level car to car and yoke to yoke, and with his left hand caught at the mouth of his rival's horse, and pulled at the heavy grip of the bit, forcing back by the bridle the car running by his side, with his right hand he lashed his own high-necked steeds putting on a spurt. So he took the place of Skelmes on the course, and made that charioteer fall behind. Then he looked back with a laughing countenance on the son of Poseidon, and mocked him in his turn with raillery, the words tumbling over his shoulder in a stream. Skelmes, you're beaten. Erechtheus is a better man than you, for my old ambling mare Swiftfoot has beaten your piebald, with Zephyrus for sire, a horse too, and a young one, and one that can run on the sea without getting wet. If you were so proud of the skill of Pelops and praised the sea-coursing car of your father, it was Myrtilos who contrived that cheating victory, with his clever invention, when he made a wax model of an axle to deceive his master. If you are haughty because of your father Earth Shaker, the horse god as you call him, who rides in the chariot of the deep, himself lord of the sea and master of the trident, Athena, a female, has beaten your backer, the male. As he said this, the man of Athena's town ran past the Telchis. Next after him came Fornos flogging his four-horse team. Fourth was Actaean the cunning and artful, who had not forgotten his father's good advice, and the last was Tyrsenian Achates. Now bold Actaean thought of a cunning plan. His car was just behind Fornos and catching him up, when with a sharper cut of the whip, he turned his horses aside and drove them up level, slipping by the driver and getting a little in front, then pressing his knees against the rail, he scraped the rival car with his own crossing car and scratched the horse's legs with his running wheel. The car was upset, and over the wreckage three of the horses lay fallen on the ground, one on the flank, one on the belly, one on the neck. But one kept clear by a swerve and remained standing, his feet firmly rooted on the earth, shaking his trembling neck, he supported the whole leg of the horse yoke next to him, and lifting the yoke band pulled the car up again. There they were in a mess on the ground, the driver rolled in the dirt beside his wheel, close to the car, the skin of his forehead barked, his chin soiled, his arm stretched out in the dust and the elbow torn by the ground. The driver leapt up quickly, and in a moment he was standing beside his wrecked car, dragging up the prostrate horse with shamed hand and flogging the discomfited beast with quick lash. Bold Actaean watched Fornos in difficulties beside his car, and made merry at his plight. That will do now. It's of no use to press your unwilling horses. That will do, it's all of no use. I shall be there first, and I will inform Dionysus that Fornos will let all the other drivers pass, and he will come in last dragging his own car. Spare your whip. It really makes me sorry to see your poor horses torn like that with a flesh-cutting prick. Fornos was furious to hear these words, as the speaker drove his team quickly on with speeding whip. He pulled at the thick tails of the horses lying on the ground, and with great difficulty made the beasts get up from the dust. One colt which had struggled out of the untied yoke strap he brought back again and fastened into the bridle. He put the feet of the struggling horses into their places on both sides, and mounted the car, taking his stand firmly in it, then once more whipped up the team with his terrible lash. Harder than ever Fornos drove and urged on his galloping horses, quicker than ever he pursued the driver in front of him, and he caught up the team ahead, for horse god Earth Shaker put spirit into the horses to honor his bold son. Then seeing a narrow pass by a beetling cliff, he wove a tangled web of deceitful artifice, to catch Achates and pass him by skillful driving. There was a deep ravine, which the errant flood of rain pouring from the sky had torn by the side of the course under the wintry scourge of Zeus, the torrent of rain confined there had cut away a strip of earth and hollowed the ground so as to form a narrow ridge. 
Achates when he got there had unwillingly checked his car, to avoid a collision with the approaching driver, and as Faunus galloped upon him, he called out in a trembling voice. Your dress is dirty still, foolish Faunos. The tips of your harness are still covered with sand. You have not yet dusted your untidy horses. Clean off your dirt. What's the good of all that driving? I fear I may see you tumbling and struggling again. Take care of that bold Actane, or he may catch you and flick your back with his leather thong and shoot you headlong into the dust again. You still show scratches on your round cheeks. Why do you still rage, Faunos, bringing disgrace alike on Poseidon your father and Helios your gaffer? Pray have respect for the mocking throat of the satyrs, beware of the Salinoi and the attendants of Dionysus, or they may laugh at your dirty car. Where are your herbs and your plants, where all the drugs of Circe? All have left you, all, as soon as you began this race. Who will tell your proud mother the tale of a tumbling chariot and a filthy whip? Such were the proud words that Achates shouted in mockery, but Nemesis recorded that big speech. Now Faunos came close and drove alongside. Chariot struck chariot, and hitting the middle bolt with his axle he broke it with his rolling wheel, the other wheel rolled off by itself and fell twisting on the ground, as with the chariot of Oinomaus when the wax of the false axle melted in Phaethon's heat and ended the horsemanship of that furious driver. Achates remained in the narrow way, while Faunos in his car, leaning over the rail of his foreign hand, passed him with speeding whip as if he did not hear, he lifted his lash more than ever, flogging the necks of the galloping horses beyond pursuit. Now he was next behind Actaeon, as far as the long throw of a hurtling quoit when some stout lad casts it with strong hand. The spectators were mad with excitement, all quarrelling and betting upon the uncertain victory that was not yet. They lay their wages on the storm-foot horses, tripod or cauldron or sword or shield, native quarrelled with native, friend with comrade, old with old and young with young, man with man. All took sides shouting in confusion, one praised up Achates, a second would prove Faunus the worse, for falling to the ground from his upset car, another maintained that Erechtheus was second behind Telchis the driver from the sea, another would have it that the resourceful man of Athens was visible close by, that his team was in front and he had won after passing Skelmis the leading driver. The quarrel had not ended when Erechtheus came in first, a near thing. Unceasingly lashing his horses right and left down from the shoulder. Sweat ran in rivers over the horses' necks and hairy chests, their driver was sprinkled with plentiful dry spatterings of dust, the car was running hard on the horses' footsteps amid rising whirls, and the undisturbed surface of the light dust was disturbed by the rolling tires. After this flying race, he came into their midst in his car. He wiped off with his dress the sweat which poured from his wet brow, and quickly got out of the car. He rested his long whip against the fine yoke, and his groom Amphidamus unloosed the horses. Then quickly with happy hand he lifted the first prize of victory, quiver and bow and helmeted woman, and shook the flat half shield with the boss in the middle. Skelmes came second in his chariot from the sea, for he drove Poseidon's car from the sea, as far behind as the round wheel is behind the running horse, as he gallops, the hairy tip of his long waving tail just touches the tire. He took the second prize, the mare in foal, and gave her in charge to Damnamines, offering her with jealous hand. Third Actaeon lifted his token of victory, the corslet shining with gold, the gorgeous work of Olympus. Next came Faunos, and there checked his car. He lifted the shield with rounded silver boss, and he still showed those relics of the dirty dust. When Achates arrived despondent beside his slow rolling car, a Sicilian groom displayed two ingots of gold, a consolation from his kind friend the splendid Dionysus. Next the god put up the boxing, a hard match that. For the first man, he offered a bull from an Indian stall as a prize, for the second, he put up a barbaric many-colored shield which had been a treasure of the black-skin Indians. Then standing up he called with urgent voice for competitors, inviting two men to contend for the prize of ready hands. This is the battle for hardy boxers. The victor in this contest shall have a shaggy bull, to the loser I will give a shield with many layers of good hide. 
When Bromius had spoken, Shake Shield Milicius stood up, one well practiced and familiar with boxing, and seizing the bull's horn he shouted these big words. This way anyone who wants a painted shield. For I will not let another have the fat bull as long as I can hold up my hands. At these words, silence sealed all lips. Only Eurymedon rose to face him, one to whom Hermes had given the gear of strong-limbed boxing. This man, a son of Hephaestus, had always been used to remain busy beside his father's furnace hammering away at the beaten anvil. Now his brother Alcon attended him full of excitement, placed his body belt beside him, and fitted the girdle to his loins, coiled the straps of dry leather neatly round his brother's long hands. Then the champion advanced into the ring, holding his left hand on guard before his face like a natural shield, and the flesh-cutting straps of his artificial hand did for a wrought lance. Always he kept on his defense before the dangerous attack of his adversary, that he might not get one in upon brow or forehead, or land on the face and draw blood, or smash his temple with a lucky blow, tearing away to the very center of his busy brain, or with a hard hook over the temples tear the eyes out of his blinded face, and smash his bloody jaw and drive in a long row of his sharp teeth. But now as Eurymedon rushed him, Melissius landed one high up on the chest, he countered with a lead at the face but missed, hit nothing but air. Shaking with excitement, he skipped round the man past his chest with a sidestep and brought home his right on the exposed breast under the nipple. Then they clinched, one against the other, shifting a bit their feet carefully in short steps, hands making play against hands, as the blows fell in quick succession the straps wreathed about their fingers made a terrible noise. Cheeks were torn, drops of blood stained the hand straps, their jaws resounded under the blows, the round cheeks swelled and spread on the puffy face, the eyes of both sunk in hollows. Eurymedon was badly shaken by Melissius and his artful dodging. He had to stand with the sun shining intolerably in his face and blinding his eyes, Melissius rushed in, dancing about with quickened twists and turns and popped in a sudden one on the jaw beneath the ear, and Eurymedon being distressed fell on his back and rolled in the dust helpless, fainting, like a drunken man. He inclined his head to one side and spat out a foam of thickish blood. His brother Alcon slung him over his back and gloomily carried him out of the ring, stunned by the blow and unconscious, then quickly lifted the great Indian shield. Next Dionysus called for a couple of competitors in wrestling, and announced the contest for this prize. He offered a tripod of twenty measures as prize for the winner, and brought out a cauldron with flower ornaments reserved for the defeated man. Then he rose, and called out with announcing voice, This way, friends, for the next fine contest. He spoke, and at the summons of crown-loving Dionysus, Aristos first rose, then second Iacos, one well schooled in the law of strong-armed wrestling. The athletes came forward naked but for the body belts that hid their unseen loins. They both began by grasping each the other's wrists, and wreathed this way and that way, and pulled each other in turn over the surface of the widespread dust, holding the arms in a close grip of the fingers. Between the two men it was like ebb and flow, man drawing man with evenly balanced pulls, dragging and dragged, for they hugged each other with both arms and bent the neck, and pressed head to head on the middle of the forehead, pushing steadily downwards. Sweat ran from their rubbed foreheads to show the hard struggle, the backs of both were bent by the pull of the arms, and pressed hard by the two pairs of twined hands. Many a wheel ran up of itself and made a purple pattern with the hot blood, until the fellows' bodies were marked with it. So they showed each against the other all the various tricks of the wrestler's art. Then first Aristos got his arms round his adversary and heaved him bodily from the ground. But Iacos the crafty did not forget his cunning skill, with insinuating leg he gave a kick behind the left knee of Aristos, and rolled him over bodily, helpless upon his back on the ground, for all the world like a falling cliff. The people round about all gazed with astonished eyes at the son of Phoebus, so grand, so proud, so famous, taking a fall. Next Iacos without an effort lifted the gigantic son of Cyrene high above the ground, to be an example of valor for his future sons, Peleus the unwearying and Telamon the mighty, he held the man in his arms, bending neither back nor upright neck, carrying the man with both arms by the middle, 
so that they were like a couple of cross rafters which some carpenter has made to calm the stormy compulsion of the winds. Icos threw down the man at full length in the dust, and got on his adversary's back as he lay, thrust both legs along under his belly and bent them in a close clasp just below the knees, pressing foot to foot, and encircling the ankles, quickly he stretched himself over his adversary's back and wound his two hands over each other round the neck like a necklace, interlacing his fingers, and so made his arms a fetter for the neck. Sweat poured in streams and soaked the dust, but he wiped away the running drops with dry sand, that his adversary might not slip out of his encircling grip, by the streams of hot moisture which he sent out of his squeezed neck. As he lay in this tight embrace, the heralds came running up at full speed, men chosen to be overseers of the games, that the victor might not kill him with those strangling arms. For there was then no such law as in later days their successors invented, for the ease when a man overwhelmed by the suffocating pain of a noose round the neck testifies the victory of his adversary with significant silence, by tapping the victor with submissive hand. Then the Myrmidons laid hands on the twenty-measure tripod as the servants of the victorious prince, and Actaeon quickly lifted the cauldron, his father's second prize, and carried it away with sorrowful hand. Then Bacchus set the contest of the footrace. For the first man he offered as treasures of victory a silver mixing bowl and a woman captive of the spear, for the second he offered a Thessalian horse with dappled neck, for the last, a sharp sword with well-wrought sling strap. He rose and made the announcement, calling for quick foot runners. Let these be the prizes for men who can run. At these words, came Dicton aside whose, falls counted, in which A throws B off his feet while still standing himself. The name inferred from what follows. A line has dropped out. Wagging his experienced knees. Next ran up fleet Erechtheus, a man full of craft, and dear to victorious Pallas, after him fleet foot Priassos won from the arable land of Sibylle. Off they went from scratch. A sight whose led, light as the storm wind on his feet, going straight ahead and keeping his lead. Close behind came Erechtheus, second at full speed, with his breath beating on the back of a sight who's close by, and warming his head with it, as near as the rod lies between the web and the breast of a girl who loves the shuttle, when she holds it at measured distance with skillful hand working at the loom, so much was he behind a sight who's, and he trod in his footmarks on the ground before the dust could settle in them. Then it would have been a dead heat, but Asaitus saw this rival running pace for pace with himself, so he made a spurt and ran past the fellow by a longer distance, as much as a man's pace. Then Erechtheus anxious for victory addressed a prayer to Boreas and cried out, Goodson, help your own Erechtheus and your own bride, if you still cherish a sweet passion for my girl, your sweetheart. Lend me the speed of your swift wings for one hour, that I may pass knee quicker sight who's now in front. Boreas heard his supplicating voice, and made him swifter than the rapid gale. All three were moving their legs like the wind, but the balance was not equal for all, as far as Erechtheus was behind Asaitus running before him with swift foot, so far behind, near storm swift Erechtheus, was Priasos the proud son of Phrygia. So they ran on, until just as the end of the race was coming for their bounding feet, knee swift Asaitus slipped in the dirt, where was an infinite heap of dung from those cattle which had been slaughtered by the Migdonian knife of Dionysus beside the tomb. But he sprang backwards with a quick whirling spring of his foot and jumped back again, then off he went, and he would have quickly passed the travelling step of his rival running in front if there had been even a little space to run, whereby he would either have made a dead heat by a spurt or he would have passed the Athenian. Swift Erechtheus then lifted the Sidonian mixing bowl, that treasure adorned with curious workmanship on the surface, a sight who's took off the Thessalian horse, Priasos quietly walked in third, and received the sword with silver sling strap. The company of satyrs laughed in mocking spirit when they saw the corybant smeared all over with dirt, and spitting out the dung that filled his throat. Now Dionysus brought out a lump of crude ore and laid it before him, and summoned competitors to put the weight. For the first, he brought and offered two spears and a helmet with horse hair crest, for the second, a brilliant round body girdle, for the third, a flat bowl, and for the fourth a fawn skin, which the craftsman of Zeus had fastened with a golden brooch. Then he rose, 
and made his announcement among them in a rousing tone. This contest calls for competitors with the weight. At these words of Bromius up rose Shakeshield Melissius, second after him came footlifting Halimedes and third, Eurymedon, and fourth, Archman. The four stood in a row side by side. Melissius took the lump, swung it well and threw, the Salanoi laughed loudly at the fellow's miserable throw. Second, Eurymedon rested his hand on the weight, and threw it farther. Then high-crested Archman took the lump, swung it well with experienced wrist, and cast the heavy missile hurtling through the air, the missile traveled through the air like the wind, and passed Eurymedon's mark by a longer measure, whirling swiftly. Then Halimedes, towering high on his feet, sent the weight traveling through the air to the mark, the mass whistled amid the storm winds in the sky when hurled by that strong hand, for it flew like an arrow straight from a bow, twirled by unstable breezes, down from the sky to the earth it fell after its long leap, and rolled along the ground still under the impulse of the accomplished hand, moving of itself, until it had passed all the marks. The spectators of the contest crowded and cheered all together, amazed at the unchecked movement of the weight bounding along. Halimedes proudly received the double prize, and went off with the high-plumed helmet shaking the pair of spears. Archman came shuffling up and lifted the body belt shining with gold, third Euvmedon took up his treasure, the brand new bowl with two handles, Melissius with downcast countenance lifted the dappled fawnskin. Now Dionysus put prizes ready for champions of the bow, the offering for good archery. He led out for the contest a hardy seven-year mule, and made it stand before the company, and laid down a well-finished goblet as prize of victory to be kept for the less competent man. Then Eurylos planted a ship's tall mast in the ground, upright above the sandy soil, and fastened a wild pigeon by a string to the top of the mast, winding a light cord about the two feet. The god called to all those assembled for the games, inviting any to shoot at the flying mark. Whoever shall pierce the skin of the pigeon, let him receive this valuable mule as witness to his victory, whoever shall draw at the mark and miss the pigeon, leaving the bird unwounded by the barbed arrow, but shall touch the string with his feathered shaft, he will be a worse shot and he shall receive a worse prize, for instead of the mule he shall carry off the goblet, that he may pour a libation to archer Apollo and wine god Dionysus. Such was the proclamation of wealthy Lyaeos. Then Hymenaios the long shot, with his flowing hair, came forward, and after him Asterius. The lot fell to Asterius, and he taking aim straight at the mast in front of him, with his Colossian bow and the string pulled back from it, let fly the first shot, and hit the string. When the shaft cut the string, the bird flew away up into the sky and the cord fell to the ground. Archer Hymenaios followed round the bird's high course with his eye and watched for him over the clouds, he had his bowstring quite ready, and let fly a swift shot through the air at his high-flying mark, aiming at the pigeon. The winged arrow sped traveling through the air visible on high, grazing the surface of the cloud in the middle, whistling at the winds. Apollo held the shot straight, keeping faith with his lovesick brother Dionysus, the point hit the flying pigeon, and struck it upon the breast as it sped, and the bird fell through the air quick as the wind to the earth, with heavy head, and half dead the pigeon beat about with its wings in the dust, fluttering about the feet of Dionysus weaver of dances. Then the god leapt up on the young man's victory, and clapped his hands to applaud Hymenaios, and the company one and all who were present at the contest were astonished at the long shot of Hymenaios near the clouds. Dionysus laughing led forward with his own hands the mule which was due as a prize to Hymenaios, and gave it to him, and the comrades of Asterius lifted his prize, the goblet. Now Bacchus invited those present to a friendly match at casting the javelin, and brought forward Indian prizes, a pair of greaves, and a stone from the Indian sea. He rose and made his announcement, and called for two warriors, bidding them show a fictitious image of bloodless battle, with not killing steel in sport. This contest summons two javelin men, and knows only Ares gentle and Enyo tranquil. So spoke Bromius, and Asterius came up armed, shaking his weapons of steel, and Iacos stepped forward, holding a bronze spear and shaking a shield gorgeously adorned, like a lion in the country charging a bull or a shaggy boar. Both these spearmen of Ares marched forward covered with steel corslets. 
Asterius cast a furious spear with the vigor of Minos's father, and he wounded the right arm grazing the skin. Icos, doing a deed worthy of his father's use lord in the highest, aimed his iron spear at the gullet and tried to pierce the throat right in the middle, but Bacchus checked him and caught the deadly blade, that he might not strike the neck with the cast spear. Then he made them both stop, and called out with wild voice. Drop those spears. Yours was a friendly battle. This is a peaceful war, a contest without wounds. So he spoke. Icos proudly received the prize of battle-stirring victory, and took the golden greaves, which he handed over to his servant. Asterius carried off the second prize, the Indian stone taken by force of arms. Book 38. When the 38th takes its turn, you have the fate of unhappy Phaethon in the chariot, with a blazing brand. The games were over. The people retired into the recesses of the forest, and entered their huts. The rustic pans housed themselves under shelter in the ravines, for they occupied at evening time the natural caverns of a lioness in the wilds. The satyrs dived into a bear's cave, and hollowed their little bed in the rock with sharp fingernails in place of cutting steel, until the light bringing morning shone, and the brightness of dawn newly risen showed itself peacefully to both Indians and satyrs. For then time rolling in his ambit prolonged the truce of combat and strife between Indians and Migdonians, there was no carnage among them then, no conflict, and the shield which Bacchus had borne for six years lay far from the battle covered with spiders' webs. But as soon as the seasons brought the seventh year of warfare, a foreboding sign was shown to wine-faced Bacchus in the sky, an incredible wonder. For at midday, a sudden darkness was spread abroad, and a midday obscurity covered Phaethon with its black pall, and the hills were overshadowed as his beams were stolen away. Many a stray brand fell here and there scattered from the heavenly car, thousands of rain showers deluged the surface of the earth, the rocks were flooded by drops from the sky, until fiery Hyperion rose again shining high on his chariot after his hard struggle. Then a happy omen was seen by impatient Bacchus, an eagle flying high through the air, holding a horned snake in his sharp talons. The snake twisted his bold neck, and slipped away of itself diving into the river Hydaspus. Trembling silence held all that innumerable host. Edmon alone stood untrembling, even on the treasury of learned lore, for he had been taught the secrets of Urania, the muse who knows the round circuit of the stars, he had been taught by his learned art the shades on the moon's orb when in union with the sun, and the ruddy flame of faith and stolen out of sight from his course behind the cone of darkness, and the clap of thunder, the heavenly bellow of the bursting clouds, and the shining comet, and the flame of meteors, and the fiery leap of the thunderbolt. Having been taught all these doings by Urania the goddess he stood with dauntless heart, while the limbs of every man were loosened. But even on that ancient seer encouraged all the host, with laughing countenance, and words of confident persuasion upon his lips, I know, he said, that victory is near, and soon it will end this long struggle. Erechtheus also inquired of the accomplished Phrygian prophet, when he saw the portents of highest Zeus, whether they were favorable to the enemy or to Indian slaying Dionysus. He did not so much wish for the end of the conflict, but rather to hear the message from Olympus, the theme of mystical tales, and the orders of circling stars, and the round moon, and the sunset at midday which has no light of Phaethon because this is stolen away. Always the citizens of ancient Athens are ready to hear discourses concerning the gods. Nor was the old seer neglectful, but shaking his ewan Thyasus instead of the Panopean laurel, he uttered these words of interpretation with his mouth. Do you wish, Erechtheus, to hear the heart-consoling tale which only the gods know who dwell in Olympus? Well, I will speak, as my laurel Apollo has taught me. Tremble not at the lightning, fear not the travelling brand, nor the darkened course of Helios, nor the bird of Olympus, first harbinger of Laeos's victory to come, as that horned snake, torn by the sharp, pointed claws of the robber bird and pierced by its talons, slipped into the waters of the river, and old Hidaspus swallowed the reptile corpse, so Deriades shall be swallowed in the flood of his father's stream under the likeness of his bull-horned sire. Thus spoke the old prophet, and at the diviner's words all the host was glad, 
but beyond others the citizen of unmothered Athene mingled gladness with wonder, as full of joy in his sweet hopes as if he were triumphing in Marathon itself after the war with Dorides. And now to Dionysus, alone among the rocks which he loved, came Hermes his brother from heaven as messenger of Zeus, and spoke assuring him of victory. Tremble not at this sign, even though night came at midday. This sign, fearless Bacchus, your father Cronion has shown you to foretell your victory in the Indian war. For I liken Bacchus the light bringer to the sun shining again, and the bold black Indian to the thick darkness. That is what is meant by the picture in the sky. For as the darkness blotted out and covered the light of shining day, and then Helios rose again in his fire-shining chariot and dispersed the gross darkness, so you also shall shake from your eyes far far away the darksome sightless gloom of the Tartarian fury, and blaze again on the battlefield like Hyperion. So great a marvel ancient eternal time our foster father has never brought, since Phaethon, struck by the steam of fire divine, fell tumbling half burnt from Helios's light-bearing chariot, and was swallowed up in the Celtic river, and the daughters of Helios are still on the banks of Eridanos, lamenting the audacious youth with their whimpering leaves. At these words, Dionysus rejoiced in hope of victory, then he questioned Hermes and wished to hear more of the Olympian tale which the Celts of the West know well, how Phaethon tumbled over and over through the air, and why even the daughters of Helios were changed into trees beside the moaning Eridanos, and from their leafy trees dropped sparkling tears into the stream. In answer, friendly Hermes opened his mouth and noised out his inspired tale to Bacchus eagerly listening. Dionysus, joy of mankind, shepherd of human life. If sweet desire constrains you to hear these ancient stories, I will tell you the whole tale of Phaethon from beginning to end. Loud booming Oceanos, girdled with the circle of the sky, who leads his water earth encompassing round the turning point which he bathes, was joined in primeval wedlock with Tethys. The watery bridegroom begat Clymene, fairest of the naiads, whom Tethys nursed on her wet breast, her youngest, a maiden with lovely arms. For her beauty Helios pined, Helios who spins round the twelve-month licked gang, and travels the seven zone circuit garland wise, Helios dispenser of fire was afflicted with another fire. The torch of love was stronger than the blaze of his car and the shining of his rays, when over the bend of the reddened ocean as he bathed his fiery form in the eastern waters, he beheld the maiden close by the way, while she swam naked and sported in her father's waves. Her body gleamed in her bath, she was one like the full moon reflected in the evening waters, when she has filled the compass of her twin horns with light. Half seen, unshod, the girl stood in the waves shooting the rosy shafts from her cheeks at Helios, her shape was outlined in the waters, no stomacher hid her maiden bosom, but the glowing circle of her round silvery breasts illuminated the stream. Her father united the girl to the heavenly charioteer. The light-foot seasons acclaimed Clymene's bridal with Helios Lightbringer, the naiad nymphs danced around, in a watery bridal bower the fruitful maiden was wedded in a flaming union, and received the hot bridegroom into her cool arms. The light that shone on that bridal bed came from the starry train, and the star of Cyprus, Lucifer, herald of the union, wove a bridal song. Instead of the wedding torch, Selene sent her beams to attend the wedding. The Hesperides raised the joy cry, and Oceanus beside his bride Tethys sounded his song with all the fountains of his throat. Then Clymene's womb swelled in that fruitful union, and when the birth ripened she brought forth a baby son divine and brilliant with light. At the boy's birth his father's ether saluted him with song, as he sprang from the childbed, the daughters of Oceanus cleansed him, Clymene's son, in his grandsire's waters, and wrapped him in swaddlings. The stars in shining movement leapt into the stream of Oceanos which they knew so well, and surrounded the boy, with Selene our lady of labor, sending forth her sparkling gleams. Helios gave his son his own name, as well suited the testimony of his form, for upon the boy's shining face was visible the father's inborn radiance. Often in the course of the boy's training Oceanos would have a pretty game, lifting Phaethon on his mid-belly and letting him drop down, he would throw the boy high in the air, rolling over and over moving in a high path as quick as the wandering wind, and catch him again on his arm, then he would shoot him up again, 
and the boy would avoid the ready hand of Oceanos, and turn a somersault round and round till he splashed into the dark waters, prophet of his own death. The old man groaned when he saw it, recognizing the divine oracle, and hid all in prudent silence, that he might not tear the happy heart of Clemeni the loving mother by foretelling the cruel threads of Phaethon's fate. So the boy, hardly grown up, and still with no down on his lip, sometimes frequented his mother Clemeni's house, sometimes travelled even to the meadows of Thrinacia, where he would often visit and stay with Lampetti, tending cattle and sheep. There he would long for his father the charioteer divine, made a wooden axle with skilful joinery, fitted on a sort of round wheel for his imitation ear, fashioned yoke straps, took three light withies from the flowering garden and plaited them into a lash, put on an herd of bridles on four young rams. Then he made a clever imitation of the morning star round like a wheel, out of a bunch of white flowers, and fixed it in front of his spoke-wheeled wagon to show the shape of the star Lucifer. He set burning torches standing about his hair on every side, and mimicked his father with fictitious rays as he drove round and round the coast of the Seagate Isle. But when he grew up into the fair bloom of youth, he often touched his father's fire, lifted with his little hand the hot yoke straps and the starry whip, busied himself with the wheel, stroked the horse's coats with snow-white hands, and so the playful boy enjoyed himself. With his right hand he touched the fire-shotten bridle, mad with longing to manage the horses. Seated on his father's knees, he shed imploring tears, and begged for a run with the fiery chariot and heavenly horses. His father said no, but he only begged and prayed all the more with gracious pleading. Then the father said in affectionate words to his young son in the high-faring car, Dear son of Helios, dear grandson of Oceanos, ask me another boon, what have you to do with the chariot of the sky? Let alone the course of horsemanship. You cannot attain it, for you cannot guide my car, I can hardly drive it myself. Furious Ares never armed him with flaming thunderbolt, but he blares his tune with a trumpet, not with thunder. Hephaestus never collects his father's clouds, he is not called cloud-gatherer like Cronion, but hammers his iron anvil in the forge, and pours artificial blasts of artificial wind. Apollo has a winged swan, not a running horse. Hermes keeps his rod and wears not his father's aegis, lifts not his father's fiery lightning. But you will say, he gave Zagreus the flash of the thunderbolt. Yes, Zagreus held the thunderbolt, and came to his death. Take good care, my child, that you too suffer not woes like his. So he spoke, but the boy would not listen, he prodded his father and wetted his tunic with hotter tears. He put out his hands and touched his father's fiery beard, kneeling on the ground he bent his arched neck, pleading, and when the father saw, he pitied the boy. Clemeni cried and begged too. Then although he knew in his heart the immovable inflexible spinnings of fate, he consented regretful, and wiped with his tunic the rain of tears from the unsmiling face of sad Phaethon, and kissed the boy's lips while he said. There are twelve houses in all the fiery ether, set in the circle of the rounded zodiac, one close after another in a row, each separate, through these alone is the inclined winding path of the restless planets rolling in their courses. All round these Kronos crawls from house to house on his heavy knees along the seventh zone upon the circle, until at last with difficulty he completes thirty circuits of returning Selene. On the sixth, quicker than his father, Zeus has his course opposite, and goes his round in a leiched gang. By the third, fiery Ares passes, one sign that is, of the zodiac. In sixty days, near your father, I myself rise in the fourth, and traverse the whole sky garland wise in my car, following the winding circles of the heavenly orbits. I carry the measures of time, surrounded by the four seasons, about the same center, until I have passed through a whole house and fulfilled one complete month as usual, I never leave my journey unfinished and change to a backward course, nor do I go forward again, since the other stars, the planets in their various courses always run contrary ways, they check backwards, and go both to and fro, when the measures of their way are half done they run back again thus receiving on both sides my one-sided light. One of these planets is the horned moon whitening the sky, when she has completed all her circuit, she brings forth with her wise fire the month, 
being at first half seen, then curved, then full moon with her whole face. Against the moon I move my rolling ball, the sparkling nourisher of sheaf producing growth, and pass on my endless circuit about the turning point of the zodiac, creating the measures of time. When I have completed one whole circle passing from house to house I bring off the lychd gang. Take care of the crossing point itself, lest when you come close, rounding the cone of darkness with your car, it should steal all the light from your overshadowed chariot. And in your driving do not stray from the usual circuit of the course, or be tempted to leave your father's usual goal by looking at the five parallel circles with their multiple bond of long encompassing lines, or your horses may run away and carry you through the air out of your course. Do not, when you look about on the twelve circles as you cross them, hurry from house to house. When you are driving your car in the ram, do not try to drive over the bull. Do not seek for his neighbor, the scorpion moving among the stars, the harbinger of the plow tree, when you are driving under the balance, until you complete the thirty degrees. Just listen to me, and I will tell you everything. When I reach the ram, the center of the universe, the navel star of Olympus, I in my exaltation let the spring increase, and crossing the herald of the west wind, the turning line which balances night equal with day, I guide the dewy course of that season when the swallow comes. Passing into the lower house, opposite the ram, I cast the light of equal day on the two hooves, and again I make day balanced equally with dark on my homeward course when I bring in the leaf-shaking course of the autumn season, and drive with lesser light to the lower turning point in the leaf-shedding month. Then I bring winter for mankind with its rains, over the back of fish-tailed Capricorn, that earth may bring forth her gifts full of life for the farmers, when she receives the bridal showers and the creative dew. I deck out also corn tending summer the messenger of harvest, flogging the wheat-bearing earth with hotter beams, while I drive at the highest point of my course in the crab, who is right opposite to the cold Capricorn, both Nile and grapes together I make to grow. When you begin your course, pass close by the side of Kern, and take Lucifer as guide to lead the way for your ear, and you will not go astray, twelve circling hours in turn will direct your way. After this speech, he placed the golden helmet on Phaethon's head and crowned him with his own fire, winding the seven rays like strings upon his hair, and put the white kilt girdle-wise round him over his loins, he clothed him in his own fiery robe, and laced his foot into the purple boot, and gave his chariot to his son. The seasons brought the fiery horses of Helios from their eastern manger, Lucifer came boldly to the yoke, and fastened the horses' necks in the bright yoke straps for their service. Then Phaethon mounted, Helios his father gave him the reins to manage, shining reins and gleaming whip, he shook in trembling silence, for he understood that his son had not long to live. Clymene his mother could be half seen near the shore, as she watched her dear son mounting the flaming car, and shook with joy. Already Lucifer was sparkling, the dewy star, and Phaethon rose traversing the eastern ambit, after his bath in the waters of Oceanos his grandsire. The bold driver of brilliant horses, running on high, scanned the heavens dotted with the company of the stars, girdled about by the seven zones, he beheld the planets moving opposite, he saw the earth fixed in the middle like a center, uplifted on tall cliffs and fortified on all sides by the winds in her caverns, he scanned the rivers, and the brows of Oceanos, driving back his own water into his own stream. While he directed his eye to the upper air and the flood of stars, the diverse races of earth and the restless back of the sea, gazing round and round on the foundations of the infinite universe, the shining horses rolled along under the yoke over their usual course through the zodiac. Now inexperienced Phaethon with his fiery whip could be seen flogging the horses' necks, they went wild shrinking under the goad of their merciless charioteer, and all unwilling they ran away over the limit of their ancient road beyond the mark of the zodiac, expecting a different call from their familiar driver. Then there was tumult along the bounds of the south and the back of the north wind, the quick foot seasons at the celestial gate wondered at the strange and unreal day, dawn trembled, and star Lucifer cried out. Where are you hurrying, dear boy? Why have you gone mad with reins in your hand? Spare your headstrong lash. Beware of these two companies, both planets and company of fixed stars, lest bold Orion kill you with his knife, 
lest ancient Boötes hit you with fiery cudgel. Spare this wild driving, and let not the Olympian whale entomb you in his belly in high heaven, let not the lion tear you to pieces, or the Olympian bull arch his neck and strike you with fiery horn. Respect the archer, or he may kill you with a fire-barbed arrow from his drawn bowstring. Let there not be a second chaos, and the stars of heaven appear at the rising day, or erratic dawn meet Selene at noonday in her car. As he spoke, Phaethon drove harder still, drawing his car aside to south, to north, close to the west, near to the east. There was tumult in the sky shaking the joints of the immovable universe, the very axle bent which runs through the middle of the revolving heavens. Libyan Atlas could hardly support the self-rolling firmament of stars, as he rested on his knees with bowed back under this greater burden. Now the serpent scraped with his writhing belly the equator far away from the bear, and hissed as he met with the starry ball, the lion roared out of his throat against the scorching dog, heating the air with ravening fire, and stood boldly to attack the eight claws of the crab with his shaggy hair bristling, while the heavily lion's thirsty tail flogged the virgin hard by his hind leg, and the winged maiden darting past the wagoner came near the pole and met the wain. The morning star sent forth his straying light in the setting region of the west and pushed away the evening star who met him there. Dawn wandered about, blazing Sirius grabbed the thirsty bear instead of his usual hair. The two starry fishes left one the south and one the north, and leapt in Olympus near Aquarius, the dolphin danced in a ring and tumbled about with Capricorn. Scorpios also had wandered around from the southern path until he came near to Orion and touched his sword, Orion trembled even among the stars, lest he might creep up slowly and pierce his feet once again with a sharp sting. The moon leapt up at midday, spitting off the half-completed light from her face and growing black on the surface, for she could no longer steal the counterfeit light from the male torch of faith and opposite, and milk out his inborn flame. The seven star voices of the Pleiades rang circling round the seven zone sky with echoing sound, the planets from as many throats raised an outcry and rushed wildly against them. Cyprus pushed Zeus, Ares Kronos, my own wandering star approached the Pleiad of Spring, and mingling a kindred light with the seven stars he rose half seen beside my mother Maya, he turned away from the heavenly chariot, beside which he always runs or before it in the morning, and in the evening when Helios sets he sends his following light, and because he keeps equal course with him and travels with equal portion, astronomers have named him the sun's heart. Europa's bridegroom the Olympian bull bellowed, stretching his neck drenched with damp snowflakes, he raised a foot curve for a run, and inclining his head sideways with its sharp horn against Phaethon, stamped on the heavenly vault with fiery hooves. Bold Orion drew sword from sheath hanging by his glowing thigh, Boötes shook his cudgel, Pegasus neighed rearing and shaking the knees of his starry legs, half seen the Libyan courser trod the firmament with his foot and galloped towards the swan his neighbor, angrily flapping his wings, that again he might send another rider hurtling down from the sky as he had once thrown Belrophontes himself out of the heavenly vault. No longer the circling bears danced back to back beside the northern turning post on high, but they passed to the south, and bathed their unwashen feet in the unfamiliar ocean beside the western main. Then Father Zeus struck down Phaethon with a thunderbolt, and sent him rolling helplessly from on high into the stream of Eridanos. He fixed again the joints which held all together with their primeval union, gave back the horses to Helios, brought the heavenly chariot to the place of rising, and the agile hours that attended upon Phaethon followed their ancient course. All the earth laughed again. Rain from life-breeding Zeus cleared all the fields, and with moist showers quenched the wandering fires, all that the glowing horses had spat whinnying from their flaming throats out of the sky over all the earth. Helios rose driving his car on his road again, the crops grew, the orchards laughed again, receiving as of yore the life-giving warmth from the sky. But Father Zeus fixed Phaethon in Olympus, like a charioteer, and bearing that name. As he holds in the radiant chariot of the heavens with shining arm, he has the shape of a charioteer starting upon his course, as if even among the stars he longed again for his father's car. The fire-scorched river also came up to the vault of the stars with consent of Zeus, and in the starry circle rolls the meandering stream of burning Eridanos. 
But the sisters of the charioteer fallen to his early death changed their shape into trees, and from the weeping trees they distill precious dew out of their leaves. Book 39. In the 39th, you see Deryades after the flood trying to desert the host of fire-blazing Indians. This story told, Hermes went into the heavens unapproachable, leaving joy and amazement to his brother Dionysus. While Bacchus was wondering still at the confusion of the disordered stars, and Phaethon's fall, how he slipped down among the Celts into the western river, fire scorched, the foreign ships were arriving, which the Radamanes had been navigating over the tranquil sea, guiding their columns on the deep towards the Indian war of ships, splashing into the deep with alternating motions, oarsmen of battle, to suit the haste of Lyaeos, a following wind whistled against the ships. And Lycos led them driving his car over the waters, and skimmed over the flood, where the horse's hooves left no mark. But gigantic Deryades high on his battlements saw with angry eye the sails of the ships like a cloud, and in his overweening pride, as he heard that an Arabian shipwright had built battle-rousing ships, he swore to make war on the wood-cutting Arabs, and threatened to mow down the Radamanes with destroying steel and to devastate the city of Lycurgos. The fearless Indians trembled at sight of the fleet, when they surveyed the sea-beaten armada, until even the knees of daring Deryades gave way. With a forced laugh on a calm face, the Indian king ordered men to be marshalled from three hundred islands along the unapproachable slopes of his elephant-feeding land. In haste a herald went on his way, travelling from land to land with many a twist and turn, and a fleet came with speed from the many scattered isles at the summons of their king, boldly he stretched his neck, and drew the helmeted ships into the maritime war, with words of encouragement to all his men which he uttered in high-hearted tones. My men, bred beside my stand-fasted Aspus, now fight again with confidence. Bring flaming fire into battle, light unquenchable torches, that I may burn those newly come ships with blazing brand and sink in the sea that water-faring host, with spear, with corslet, with ships, with Dionysus. If Bacchus is a god, I will destroy Bacchus with my fire. Is it not enough, that he has sprinkled those cunning poisons in the water and reddened my Hidaspus with Thessalian flowers? That I have looked on him in silence, and let myself quietly behold the yellow streams of my maddened river. For if that stream came from a foreign river, if the warlike Indian Hidaspus were not my own father, then I would have filled that flood with heaps of dust to drown the viny stink of Dionysus, I would have walked upon the drunken stream of my father and crossed unwetting water with dusty feet, as once it is said among the Argives that earth shaker made water dry, and a horse's hoof left his prints on the dust of river Inachos dried up. No god, no god is that man, he has lied about his birth. For what Olympian aegis of Cronion does he brandish? What spark has he of Zeus thrown thunderbolt? What heavenly lightning of his fathers does he lift? No Cronides equips himself for war with vine leaf and ivy. I cannot compare the music of thunder to rattling cymbals. I will not call the Thyasus anything like the thunderbolt of Zeus, I will not allow an earthly corslet to be equal to the clouds of Zeus. How can I liken a dappled fawn skin to the pattern of the stars? But you will say, he received the grapes and the liquid wine as gifts from Cronion his father, who blesses the crops with increase. Well, Zeus gave Olympian nectar to one of Trojan blood, a country clown, a cowman, Ganymede the cupbearer, and wine is not equal to nectar, Thyasus, you have the worst of it. Bacchus feasts on earth with satyrs, Ganymede banquets with the heavenly immortals. If this mortal had a heavenly father, he would have touched one board with Zeus and the blessed. I have heard how Zeus once gave his throne and the scepter of Olympus as prerogative to Zagreus the ancient Dionysus, lightning to Zagreus, vine to wine face Bacchus. He spoke, and away to battle. The people rushed together armed with spears, with shields, and now transferred their last hope of victory from land to sea. Then Dionysus called to his leaders with wild voice. Mighty sons of Ares and corsleted Athena, whose life is the works of war, whose hope is conflict. Make haste now, destroy the Indian race on the sea as well, and finish your land victory with another by sea. Come, take in hand those messengers of sea warfare, 
spears coupled together with double rings, welded sea pikes with bronze fixed at the mouth, and join sea terrifying battle with your enemies, get in before them, that Deriades may not lift his fire blazing torch and burn up the warlike timbers of our ships. Fight without fear, Mimalones. For the hopes of our sea fighting adversaries are all empty boasts. If for all his efforts the Indian chieftain could not finish off his war on land, seated on the neck of mountainous elephants, near the clouds, unapproachable, unwounded, a neighbor to the sky, then I never lack champions, I will call on no other helper after my father Cronion, charioteer of sea and sky, or if it please me, I will arm Poseidon the brother of my Cronides, to wipe out all the Indian host with his trident, and I have as my ally Earth Shaker's offspring Glaucos, the broad-bearded champion. As neighbor of my own Thebes and seaborne inhabitant of the land of Onian Anthedon, yes, Glaucos I have and Phorsis. And Melicertes will drown the vessel of Deriades flogged by the sea, he shall glorify Dionysus his kinsman, for his mother once nursed baby Bacchos, since Eno of the sea gave one milk to both Polemon and Dionysus. I am also the friend of Proteus the old man prophetic, who told with a voice out of the deep waters my coming victory on the sea. My Thetis also prepares the daughters of Nerus for war, and in the battle my Eno is arming to help the Basarids. I lost two I will arm for warfare, that I may behold east wind shooting arrows and north wind hurling javelins, north wind goodson of my champion and the spoiler of the Marathonian bride, south wind the Ethiopian defender of Lyaos. West wind also much more shall destroy the ships of my adversaries with stormy tumult, for he has to wife Iris the messenger of my father's use. No, better let bold Iolos keep away from the battle of Indian and Thyasus and remain in peace and quiet, let him tie up tight his windy bag by its usual cord, that the winds may not be heroes on the deep and slay the Indians with their blasts. I will finish the battle shaking a ship destroying Thyasus. With these words, he armed his confident captains. Already the trumpet was there as harbinger of war, and the pipes of war gave out their battle-rousing tune collecting the army. The stricken shield sounded with bronze-rattling noise for the sea fight, and the host assembling syrinx mingled its piercing tones, and Pan's answering echo came from the sea with faint warlike whispers instead of her rocky voice. Then there was din amongst the fighters, and the noise of clamor arose. The host fought with their accustomed skill, and surrounded all the enemy in ring, the Indian fleet was in the middle girt about with an unbroken circle of ships like a shoal of fish enclosed in a net. Then Ico's beginning the battle cried aloud with inspired voice this prophecy of the watery strife at Salamis for the descendants of Ico's. If ever, O Zeus of the rains, thou hast heard our voice of prayer, and driven away seedless drought from the broad threshing floors of our country, and brought life-giving water upon the thirsty land, then give us again an equal boon now at last, and glorify me here also with water. Then men may say when they see our victory, as Zeus showed honor to his son on land, so he shows him honor on the sea. Some other man of Achaia may say, Iacos is both Indian slayer and life-bringer at once, he both cuts off his enemies' heads and brings fruit to the furrow, giving joy to Demeter and a merry heart to Dionysus. Protect thou the sailing of our ship. As I brought life-giving water to the hollow of the parched earth, so now I arm this flood from the hollows of the deep to bring death, battling against the armies and ships of Deriades. Come, O Father, monarch of life, monarch of battle. Send me an eagle, the auspicious herald of my birth, on the right hand of my captains and your own Dionysus. Let another omen come on the left for my adversaries, and let these two be opposite tokens for both. Let me see the one sailing along with robber's wing and lifting a huge horned serpent, dead and torn by sharp points of his keen talons, proclaiming the end of my horned enemy, let the other come to my host of adversaries black-hued, with dark wings, foretelling the carnage of the Indians, the black image of self-inflicted death. If it be thy pleasure, foretell my victory with claps of thunder, and send the lightning which lighted the birth of Bromius to honor your son once again with fire, and let thunderbolts strike the helmeted ships of the foe. Yes, father, remember Aeina, and do not shame the bridegroom of thy bride, the lovebird of a like feather with this. After this prayer, he began the fight, 
Erechtheus also east up his eye to the heavenly path of the ever-returning bear, and prayed to his good son in these words. Goodson Boreas, put on your armor, and send a helping blast to your bride's father in battle. Give victory by sea as the price of your bride. Bring a ship stirring wind for Bromius's fleet and grant a boon to Erechtheus and Dionysus alike. For the ships of Diriades, flog the maddened deep into waves with your blast and arm your tempests, for you are well practiced in fighting, as one whose habitation is Thrace, well practiced as Ares himself, then drive a stormy wind upon the host of our enemies, arm yourself against Diriades with your icy spear. Raise a hurricane of war against our enemies, shoot the foe with your frozen shafts, and keep faith with Zeus and Pallas and Dionysus. Remember Scropia with its lovely girls, where the women weave with their shuttle the love story of your wedding. Honor Elysos who led the bridal train, when the robber breezes made robbery of your attic bride, sitting unshaken upon your unmoving shoulder. I know that another wind will come to help our adversaries, the east wind their neighbor, but I fear not bold Euros in battle, because all the winged breezes that blow are servants of Boreas. Let Corimbasos the chief of the Ethiopians never return to the arable land of the south, let him be brought low, although he is helped by his own hot Ethiopian south, let him drink the cold water of death beyond the sea. I care nothing for Zephyrus, when Boreas is under arms. Show that you are of one heart with your good father. From heaven by your side will come Poseidon fighting for my Bacchiad armies with his trident, and Athena, she helping her countrymen, he his brother's son, and fiery Hephaestus honoring the blood of Erechtheus will come full welcome to the watery war, swinging a warlike torch against the ships of Diriades. Grant me victory on the sea also, and after victory let Erechtheus take his people home to Scropia unhurt, and let Athens chant of Boreas and Orathuia. Thus he cried loudly, and fell to the fight on the eddies of the brine with well-skilled spear, as a man of marathon he was in love with sea-fighting. In that tumult of many oars Ares was then an excellent mariner, rout held rudder in hand, terror was pilot of the fray and threw off the hawsers of the javelin-bearing ships. Troops of Cyclopeans navigated the sea, showering rocks from the shore upon the ships, Eurylos shouted the war cry, and Halimedes high as the sky dashed raging into battle with brine blustering tumult. In both armies the sea battle roared after the conflict on land, while Indian ships charged Bacchic ships with brine blustering yells. There was carnage on both sides, and the waves boiled with gore, a great company fell from both armies, the back of the blue sea grew red with newly shed blood. Many on this side and that side fell into the mess of carnage, and navigated the sea swollen and floating. The merciless winds dragged with them the crowds of dead bodies, tossed about by the surge with breezes to ferry them. Many fell of themselves under the whirlwind of battle, and slipped into the flood, then drank of the bitter brine, for they could not help it, and weighed down with their corslets knew the threads of the fate who drowned them in the waters. The black water covered the black livid bodies of the swollen dead with seaweed in the depths, slimy mud-covered coat of mail and seafaring wearer together, the sea was their grave. Many again had sepulture in the moor of sea monsters, or the darting seal entombed the inanimate corpse in her fishy throat and belched out a stream of brownish blood. The sea took the armor of the dead, the plumed helmet worked loose from the strap and floated upon the water by itself, its owner newly slain, many a round shield swam at random on the flood with soaking sling driven by the gale, and under the surface of the waves masses of red foam bubbled up from the grey brine, marking the spread of white with streaks of blood. Melicurtis also was stained by the drops of gore, Leucothea cried out for joy, she the nurse of Lyaeos, raising a proud neck, and the nymph crowned her hair with flowers of seaweed for the Indian slaying victory, and Thetis unveiled peeping up out of the sea, with her hands resting on Doris and Panopea, turned a glad semi towards Dionysus with his Thyasus. Galatea too came from the depths and moved half visible through the bosom of the deep sea, wrinkling the calm surface, and looking upon the sea affrighting battle of murderous Cyclops she was shaken, and her cheeks changed color from fear, for she thought she saw Polyphemus fighting for Lyaeus against Diriades in this Indian war, and in dismay she besought Aphrodite of the sea to protect that heroic son of Poseidon. And she prayed the loving father sea blue hair to defend his son Polyphemus in the battle.
The daughters of Nerus gathered round the bearer of the deep sea trident, earth shaker the sea god leaning upon his trident watched the neighboring conflict, and scanning the host of corseleted Dionysus, he observed with jealousy the valor of another Cyclops, and loudly reproached Bacchus for disturbing the waters with battle. Bacchus, my friend, how many Cyclopeans you have brought into your war, and left only one far from the battle. Your conflict has lasted through many cycles, seven years, feeding the varying hopes of endless strife, because all the foremost champions of your great contest lack one, Polyphemos the Invincible. If my son the Cyclops had come to your conflict, and brandished the prong of my trident, his father's, then indeed as the ally of Dionysus he would have pierced the chest of horned Dariades on this field, he would have destroyed a great and terrible host with my three tooth, and slain the whole Indian nation in one day. Before this another son of mine with a hundred hands helped your father to destroy the Titans, again many arm, when he put Kronos to flight and stretched the far-spread legion of his high-climbing arms and shadowed the sun with hair flying high over his neck, so that the grim Titans were driven from Olympus cringing, before the attack of Briarios and all his arms. So he spoke, in a tone of grudging jealousy, and Thusa sank down her cheeks in shame that lovesick Polyphemos was not present in the battle. But when the end came of this loud blustering conflict, Nerus or his familiar sea flooded with blood, Earth Shaker was amazed at the brownish surface of the deep, as he saw fishes eating men, and the back of the neighboring sea bridged over dry with the heaps of corpses. The troops of Bacchus poured upon the swarthy people. There lay an infinite multitude of the enemy, struck down in the fight by swords and sharp arrows. One had a shaft lodged over the flank, one was struck by a bronze spear over the round of his temple, the wound running deep into the cloven head. Great numbers of the far-scattered oarsmen on both sides cleft the dark flood with continuous strokes of alternating oars, and whitened it with foam, but the labor of the hurrying oarsmen was in vain, for the commander cut the ropes with his sword and severed with aiding steel the tangled mass of lashings. From each army flew straight a shower of long-shafted arrows whizzing unerring through the air. One struck full upon a mast, one ran noisily through a flapping sail quick as the wind, another pierced the four stays, another fell and stuck in the mast box, an arrow again flying through the air hit the end of the yard which supported the sail, another stuck straight up on the foredeck. Others came near the helmsman, but missed the way in which they had been sent and scraped the top of the moving rudder. Floggios the famous archer drew a shot through the air, and hit the ship's deck but missed Lyaos. You could see a winged arrow fly and skim over the sea, then embraced in the feelers of a curling squid. Many missed, but one with Erythrian steel aimed at Dionysus hit a pilot fish. Corimbasos cast a lance at a satyr's tail, but the lance missed him and scored the forked tail of a water-faring fish with its sharp point. Dariades aimed his steel at a target impossible to hit, as he cast at unwounded Dionysus, the deadly point missed Bacchus and got to work on the backbone of a dolphin, where the curving neck of the fish joins the bristling back, the fish leapt of itself in its usual curving course, and already half-dead skipped with the leap of a dancing fate. On all sides many a fish with pierced back tumbled about in his dance of death. Steropis also fought in the forefront, Halimedes high uplifted upon his feet grasped the crag of a seaborne cliff and threw it at the foe, a stray ship sank, struck by the rounded mass of hard stone. Or again, a spear cast over the sea at close quarters joined ship to ship and coupled the pair together, holding two vessels fast in a common bond, while they were all crushed together in a cloud, great was the clamor on both sides. The two fleets were engaged in four divisions, one facing the backbone of the scorching east wind, one by the wing of the rainy southwest, one in the region of the north, one in the south. Marius with alternating rushes marched kneeswift from ship to ship and scattered the sea-scared array of Basarids, a conquering hero equally on the sea, but Uios wounded him with his thiasis and checked his valor on the deep, then Marius in agony was gone back to the city. While the divine wound which had got him was being healed by the godly hand of a pain-quelling Brahman with Apollo's art, who cooed of a boast ditty of solemn incantation, so long the Lydian war god prevailed against his enemies. Their assault awoke a new conflict, Enya went before their sails, and the struggle of the two navies in the brine-plashing battle was different. 
For those of the enemy who were struck by volleys of hard stones, or deadly leaves, or spears or swords, paddled the black water with unaccustomed hands and found a grave in the sea with staggering steps, but if any warrior of Bromius fell stricken into the brine, he darted out his arms and swam cutting the waves with sea-battling hands, as he fought the surge with brine-blustering noise and cleft water instead of men. Now Cronion inclined the balance of the sea fight, preparing a watery victory for Dionysus, Sea Blue Hair armed him with his trident of the deep to fight the foe, and Melicertis madly drove the unwetted car of Poseidon. The winds also rode on four tempests over the sea, armed for the fray and towering up the waves, with a will to destroy the lines of their enemies' ships, these to help Diriades, those Lyaeos, Zephyrus was ready, Notos whistled against Euros, Boreas brought up his Thracian breeze as a counterblast and flogged the back of the maddened sea. Discord guided the warlike navy of Diriades and led the battle, but victory filled out the sails of Dionysus with a hand which bore death for the Indians. Nerus pressed his conch of war with dripping lips and boomed a tune through the sea trumpet, and Thetis shrilled a tune of warlike sound and defended Lyaeos with her father's billows. Eurymedon the Carbaros lifting his familiar torch invented a useful stratagem of war. He set fire to his own long vessel on purpose, then the vessel was sent adrift bounding over the sea against the enemy at the command of Bacchos. The errant bonfire floated round of itself by wayward turns from ship to ship, and setting alight here and there the long line of far-scattered vessels. The Nereid unveiled seeing the glare of the fire-shot and sea dived into the depths, and fled from liquid fire through burning water. Then the Indian host left the sea and retreated to the land, and Phaethon laughed, because Ares in the sea fight had fled again before the fire of Hephaestus, as once before he fled from his chains. And Diriades when he saw the flame, fast as the wind fled to the land, wagging his knees too quick to catch, as he tried to escape the watery assault of sea-fighting Dionysus. Book 40. The fortieth has the Indian chief wounded, and how Dionysus visited Tyre, the native place of Cadmus. Yet he escaped not all seeing justice, nor the inflexible threads of fate herself the inexorable spinner. No, Pallas Athena beheld him in flight, for she sat on a headland high over the sea, and watched the Indians contending in their battle on the sea. Down from the height she leapt, and put on the shape of a man, the form of Marius, and, all to please Dionysus, she checked Diriades, cajoling the Indian chieftain with mind-stealing whispers. As if anxious about the conflict, she poured out words of affright in reproachful tones. You flee, Diriades. Whom have you left in charge of the sea fight? How can you show yourself to the people? Or how will you look in the face of dauntless Orsibo, if she hears that Diriades is in flight and will not stand before women? Have respect for man-breaking Sherobi, let her not see you shrinking from fight with Lyaeos unarmed, why, she held a furious spear, she heaved up an oxhide and fought the Basarids following her husband. Give place, please, to Marius, you have left the field, and if you please, I will be champion myself and destroy that weakling Bacchos. I call you good father no more, you, a runaway, let your girl Shero be find another husband, for I am ashamed, I will leave your city and migrate to the Median country, I will go to Scythia, that I may not be called your good son. But you will say my wife is well armed, she understands warfare. There are Amazons about Caucasus, and many women are there far better champions than Sherobi. There I will carry off a strong one for my bed, captive of my spear, to wed me without bride price, if I like. For I will never receive into my bridey chamber your daughter, whose father is a fugitive from the battle. With this reproach she persuaded proud Diriades, and gave him courage again, that he might be struck down by the man destroying Thyasus of warring Bromius. He knew not that it was deceitful Athena before him, he heard the reproachful voice of the pretended Marius, and bold again, spoke comforting words with shamed lips. Spare your words. Why do you reproach me, fearless Marius? No soldier is this, no soldier, who is always changing shape. Indeed I am at a loss who it is I am fighting and whom I strike. Eager to shoot Dionysus with a feathered arrow, or to cut through his neck with a sword, 
or desiring to cast a spear and pierce his belly, instead of Lyaos I find a speckled panther charging upon me. A lion is fighting and I hasten to shear his neck, and I see a bold horrible serpent instead of a lion, I attack, and instead of a serpent I behold a bear's back, I cast my furious spear at the curving neck, but in vain I hurl the long shaft, for instead of a bear appears a flame flickering up into the air uninjured. I see a boar rushing and I hear a bull's bellow, instead of the boar I see a bull lowering his head sideways and stabbing our elephants with flashing horns. I swing my sword against all sorts of beasts, and cannot overcome that one beast. I behold a tree and take aim, but it is off and I see a spout of water curving into the path of the sky. Therefore I tremble at the bewitched miracles of his art, and shrink from the changeable warfare of Dionysus. But I will confront Bromius again, until I lay bare the cunning enchantments of Dionysus the botcher of guile. He spoke, and a second time armed himself, wild as before, again the uproar of battle rose on the plain, thereafter the sea fight he met Dionysus in arms. He had forgotten the former victory of Bromius, when his neck was entangled in leafy bonds and he offered his prayers of many supplications to Bacchus, who saw it all. Again he was a soldier fighting against the gods, doubtful only whether to kill or make Bromius a slave. Thrice he cast a spear, and missed, striking nothing but air, but when the fourth time in his arrogance Deriades rushed upon Wineface Bacchus, and cast his spear through the air at a mark which could not be hit, he called his goodson to help him, and Marius was no longer to be seen, but Athena had changed her deceptive shape and stood beside the vine god. Deriades saw her, and his knees trembled with overwhelming fear, he understood that the human shape which bore the likeness of Marius was all a deception, and recognized the deluding trick of wise Athena. But Dionysus was glad when he saw Athena, and knew in his heart that she had been helping him in disguise. Then the grippy deity was maddened with anger. He rose lofty and huge, like the rock of Parnassos, and pursued swift-running Deriades, he raced off light and quick as the hurrying winds, but when they reached the place where ancient Hidaspus rolled his war-breeding water in wild bubbling waves, he stood immense on the river bank as having now an ally, his father roaring loud, to shoot with his waters against Dionysus in battle, there the vine deity cast his flesh-cutting Thyasus and just grazed the skin of Deriades. Struck with the man destroying Ivy Bunch he slipped head first into his father's flood, and bridged all that water himself with his long frame. Now the long Indian war was ended, the gods returned again to Olympus with Zeus the lord of all, the Bacchants cheered in triumph around Dionysus the invincible, crying euoi for the conflict, and many thronged round Deriades piercing him everywhere with their spears. Orsibo wailed on the battlements with a loud lamentable dirge, sorrowing for her husband who lay so newly slain, she scratched her cheeks with her fingernails in sorrow, and heedlessly tore out bunches of her curling hair, and poured smoking ashes on her head. Sherobi lamented for her dead father, and scored her black arms, rent her white robe and bared all her breast, Protona and Shod tore her cheeks and smeared her face all over with dirty dust, weeping for both husband and father, with twofold agony, and cried in tones of sorrow. Husband, how young you have lost your life! You have left me a widow in the house ere I have borne a child, no baby son I have to console me. I never saw my husband come home a second time after victory, but he slew himself with his own steel, and gave his name to the stream, and died among strangers, that I should have to call the watery Orontes my husband, childless, self-slain, never returned. I wail for both Deriades and Orontes, both perished by one watery fate, Deriades the death of many men was buried in the wave, the flood swallowed Orontes. But I am not like my mother, for Orsibo sang her hymn over her daughter's weddings accomplished, she saw the marriage of Protona, she received Orontes as good son, she joined Sherobi to an unconquered husband, whom Bacchus trembled at great as he is, Sherobi has her dear husband alive, no Thyasus, no flood has brought him down, but I it seems doubly suffer, my husband gone and my father perished. Cease to comfort your child, my nurse, all in vain. Let me have my husband, and I will not bewail my father, show me a child to console me for my husband's loss. Who will take me and bring me to the broad stream of Hidaspus, 
that I may kiss the wave of that honey-dropping river. Who will take me and bring me to the sacred vale of Daphne, that I may embrace Orontes even in the waters? Oh that I too could be a lovely stream! Oh that I might also become a fountain there, watered by my own tears, a watery bride where my husband dead rolls his beautiful waters. Then I shall be like Kemetho, who in olden days was enamoured of a lovely river and still has the joy of holding Sidno's her husband in her arms, as I hear is a favourite story among those Cilician men. So says Murius my good brother. But I am not like runaway Periboya, I will not pass charming Orontes whom I love, I will not draw back my winding water and avoid a watery spouse. If it was not ordained that I should die near his neighbour Daphne, may Hidaspus my father's father drown me in his waves and save me from sleeping in the arms of a horned satyr, and seeing Phrygian revels, rattling their cymbals in my hands, joining their sportive rites, that I may not see Maonia and Tomolus, the house of Lyaeos or the all-burdensome yoke of slavery, that men may not say, the daughter of Deriades the spearbold king, taken captive after the war, is now a servant to Dionysus. When she had finished the women groaned piteously with her, those who had lost a son or a brother, whose fathers were dead or husband untimely taken, with the down on his chin. And Sherobi tore the hair from her head and scored her cheeks, she was tormented by double sorrow, and she groaned not so much for her father as she was indignant against her husband, for she had heard the enamoured passion of her husband, and the delusive guile of chaste Chalcomedia. She rent her dress and spoke. By sparing his spear Marius killed my father, and no one avenged his death. For desire of that hateful Chalcomede he did not rout the women on the field, nay, he still shows favour to the Bassarids. Tell me, fates, what jealousy destroyed the Indian city? What jealousy came down suddenly upon both daughters of Deriades? Dying on the battlefield, Orontes made his wife Protona widow to mourn uncared for, Cherobi still living was repudiated by her husband. And I have more cruel things to suffer than my sister. Protona had a husband who defended her that nursed him, Cherobi had a husband, who destroyed his country, a useless warrior, the lackey of Cyprogenia, a strong man unstable, a partisan of Lyaeos. Even my marriage was my enemy, for the Indian city was sacked because my Marius fell in love. I was robbed of my father for my husband's sake, I so proud once, and daughter of a king, I once the mistress of the Indians, I too shall be one of the servants, perhaps I shall be so unhappy as to give the title of mistress to Chalcomedia the serf. Traitor Marius, today India is your home, tomorrow unbidden you will go to the Lydian land, a menial of Dionysus because of Chalcomede's beauty. Husband Marius, make no secret of your union with Chalcomede, for you fear no longer the threatening tongue of Deriades. Be gone. The serpent calls you back, the one that chased you away with hisses from the wedding which you failed to force. Thus lamented the wife with heavy tears, and Protona wailed a second time. Their mother rested an arm on each and dolorously cried. The hopes of our country have perished. No longer I see Deriades my husband, no longer Orontes my son. Deriades is dead, the city of the Indians is plundered. The unbreakable citadel of my country has fallen, would that I myself may be taken by Bacchus and slain with my dead husband. May he seize and cast me into the swift-flowing Hydaspus, for I refuse the earth. Let my good father's water receive me, may I see Deriades even in the waters, may I not see Protona following Dionysus perforce, may I never hear another piteous groan from Cherobi while she is dragged to a captive wedlock, may I not see another husband after Deriades, my man. May I dwell with the Naiads, since sea blue hair received Leucothea also living and she is called one of the Nereids, and may I appear another watery Eno, no longer white, but black-footed. Such were the lamentations of the long-robed women, standing in a row upon the loud echoing battlements. But the Bacoi rattled their cymbals, having now made an end of warring, and they cried with one voice, We have won great glory. We have slain the Indian chieftain. And Dionysus laughed aloud, trembling with the joy of victory. Now resting from his labours and the bloody contest, he first gave their due to the crowd of unburied dead. 
He built round the pyre one vast tomb for all alike with a wide bosom, a hundred feet long. Round about the bodies the melodious Migdonian syrinx sounded their dirge, and the Phrygian pipers wove their manly tune with mournful lips, while the bacchant women danced and Gani to trolled his dainty song with you and voice. The double Birekunchan pipes in the mouth of Cleochos drooned a gruesome Libyan lament, one which long ago both Steno and Euryale with one many-throated voice sounded hissing and weeping over Medusa newly gashed, while their snakes gave out voice from two hundred heads, and from the lamentations of their curling and hissing hairs they uttered the many-headed dirge of Medusa. Now resting from his labors, he cleansed his body with water, and assigned a governor for the Indians, choosing the god-fearing Modaios, they now pacified touched one table with banqueting Bakoi over a common bowl, and drank the yellow water from the wine-breeding river. There was dancing without end. Many a basserid skipped about, tapping the floor with wild slipper, many a satyr stormed the resounding ground with heavy foot, and reveled with side trippings of his tumbling feet as he rested an arm on the neck of some maddened bacchant. The foot soldiers of Bromius danced round with their ox hides and mimicked the pattern of the shield bearing corybants, wildly circling in the quick dance under arms. The horsemen in their glancing helmets also stood up for the dance, acclaiming the all vanquishing victory of Dionysus. Not a soul was silent, the Ewan tones went up to the seven zone sky with shouts of triumph from every tongue. But when the revels of the carefree feast were over, and Dionysus had gathered all the spoil after his Indian war, he remembered the land of his ancient home, now he had swept away the foundations of that seven years' conflict. The whole wealth of the enemy was given to the army as their plunder. One got an Indian jasper, one the jewel of Phoebus's patent sapphire and the smooth green emerald, another hurried under the lofty peaks of broad-based Imaios the straight-legged elephants which he had captured by his spear. Here was one by the deep caverned mountain of Hemodos driving to exile a team of Indian lions, in triumph, there was another pulling a panther to the Migdonian shore with a chain fast about its neck. A satyr rushed along with a striped tiger before him, which he flogged in his wild way with a handful of tippling leaves. Another returned with a gift for his cybelide bride, the fragrant plants of sea-grown reeds and the shining stone which is the glory of the Erythrian brine. Many a black-skin bride was dragged out of her chamber by the hair, her neck bound fast under the yoke of slavery, spoil of war along with her newly wedded husband. The bacchant woman god possessed returned to the hills of Tomolus with hands full of streaming riches, chanting Euoi for the return of Dionysus. So Dionysus distributed the spoils of battle among his followers, after the Indian war, and sent returning home the whole host who had shared his labors. The people made haste to go, laden with shining treasures of the eastern sea and birds of many strange forms. Their return was a triumphal march with universal acclaim to Dionysus the Invincible, all reveled, for they left behind them all memory of that toilsome war, to blow away with the north wind, and each came returning home at last with his thank offerings for victory. Asterius alone did not now return to his own country, instead, he settled near the foot on Washen Bears, about the river Phocis in a cold land by the Massagetic Gulf, where he dwelt under the snow-burdened feet of his father's father, Taurus the Bull, translated to the stars. He avoided the Crossian city and the sons of his family, hating Pasiphae and his own father Minos, and preferring Scythia to his own country. But Bacchus, followed only by his satyrs and the Indian slain Bacchant women, after a war in the Caucasus beside the Amazonian river, visited Arabia the second time, where he stayed and taught the Arabian people who knew not Bacchus to uplift the mystic fennel, and crowned the Nisian hills with the vine clusters of his fruitful plant. Leaving the long stretch of Arabia with its deep shadowy forests he measured the Assyrian road on foot, and had a mind to see the Tyrian land, Cadmus's country, for thither he turned his tracks, and with stuffs in thousands before his eyes he admired the many-colored patterns of Assyrian art, as he stared at the woven work of the Babylonian Arian, he examined cloth dyed with the Tyrian shell, shooting out sea sparklings of purple, on that shore once a dog busy by the sea, gobbling the wonderful lurking fish with joyous jaws, stained his white jowl with the blood of the shell, and reddened his lips with running fire, which once alone made scarlet the sea-dyed robes of kings. He was delighted to see that city, 
which earth shaker surrounded with a liquid girdle of sea, not wholly, but it got the shape which the moon weaves in the sky when she is almost full, falling short of fullness by one point. And when he saw the mainland joined to the brine, he felt a double wonder, since Tyre lies in the brine, having her own share in the land but joined with the sea which has joined one girdle with the three sides together. Unshakable, it is like a swimming girl, who gives to the sea head and breast and neck, stretching her arms between under the two waters, and her body whitened with foam from the sea beside her, while she rests both feet on Mother Earth. And Earth Shaker holding the city in a firm bond floats all about like a watery bridegroom, as if embracing the neck of his bride in a splashing arm. Still more Bacchus admired the city of Tyre, where alone the herdsman's way was near the fisherman, and he kept company with his piping along the shore, and goat herd with Fisher again when he drew his net, and the glebe was cleft by the plough while opposite the oars were cutting the waters. Shepherds near the seaside woods gossiped in company, with boatmen, Fisher with woodmen, and in one place was the loud noise of the sea, the lowing of cattle, the whispering of leaves, rigging and trees, navigation and forest, water, ships, and lugger, plough tail, sheep, reeds, and sickle, boats, lines, sails, and corslet. As he surveyed all this, he thus expressed his wonder. How's this, how do I see an island on the mainland? If I may say so, never have I beheld such beauty. Lofty trees rustle beside the waves, the Nereid speaks on the deep and the Hamadryad hears hard by. A delicate breeze of the south breathes from Lebanon upon Tyrian seas and seaside ploughland, pouring a breath of wind which fosters the corn and speeds the ships at once, cools the husbandman and draws the seamen to his voyage. Here Harvest Home Deo brings the sickle of the land close to the trident of the deep, and speaks to the monarch of the wet, who drives his car unwetted upon the soundless calm, while she asks him to guide her rival car on the same course, and herself whips the bounteous backs of her aerial dragons. O oh world-famous city, image of the earth, picture of the sky. You have a belt of sea grown into one with your three sides. So he spoke, and wandered through the city casting his eyes about. He gazed at the streets paved with mosaic of stones and shining metals, he saw the house of Aginor his ancestor, he saw the courtyards and the women's apartments of Cadmus, he entered the ill-guarded maiden chamber of Europe, the bride stolen long ago, and thought of his own horn Zeus. Still more he wondered at those primeval fountains, where a stream comes pouring out through the bosom of the earth, and after one hour plenty of water bubbles up again with flood self-produced. He saw the creative stream of a Barbary, he saw the lovely fountain named after Caliroe, he saw the bridal water of Drosera herself spouting daintily out. But when he had noted all this and gratified his curiosity, he went reveling to the temple of the star-clad and there called loudly upon the leader of the stars in mystic words. Star-clad Heracles, Lord of Fire, Prince of the Universe. O Helios, long-shadowed shepherd of human life, coursing round the whole sky with shining disc and wheeling the twelve-month leiched gang the son of time. Circle after circle thou drivest, and from thy car is shaped the running life space for youth and age. Nurse of wise birth, thou bringest forth the threefold image of the motherless moon, while dewy Selene milks her imitative light from thy fruitful beam, while she fills in her curving bull's horn. All shining eye of the heavens, thou bringest in thy four-horse chariot winter following autumn, and changest spring to summer. Night pursued by thy shooting torch moves and gives place, when the first morning glimpse comes of thy straight-necked steeds drawing the silver yoke under thy lashes, when thy light shines, the varied heavenly meadow no longer shines brighter dotted with patterns of bright stars. From thy bath in the waters of the eastern ocean thou shakest off the creative moisture from thy cool hair, bringing the fruitful rain, and discharging the early wet of the heavenly dew upon the prolific earth. With thy disc thou givest increase to the growth of harvest, irrigating the bounteous corn in the life-nourishing furrows. Balos on the Euphrates, called Ammon in Libya, thou art Apis by the Nile, Arabian Kronos, Assyrian Zeus. On thy fragrant altar, that thousand-year-old wise bird the phoenix lays sweet-smelling woods with his curved claw, bringing the end of one life and the beginning of another, for there he is born again, 
self-begotten, the image of equal time renewed, he sheds old age in the fire, and from the fire takes in exchange youthful bloom. Be thou called Sorapis, the cloudless Zeus of Egypt, be thou Kronos, or Phaethon of many names, or Mithras the son of Babylon, in Hellas Delphic Apollo, be thou Gamos, whom love begat in shadowy dreams, fulfilling the deceptive desire of a mock union, when from sleeping Zeus, after he had sprinkled the damp seed over the earth with the self-wedding point of the sword, the heights brought forth by reason of the heavenly drops, be thou pain-quelling Payone, or patterned heaven, be thou called the star-clad. Since by night starry mantles illuminate the sky, O oh hear my voice graciously with friendly ears. Such was the hymn of Dionysus. Suddenly in form divine the star-clad flashed upon him in that dedicated temple. The fiery eyes of his countenance shot forth a rosy light, and the shining god, clad in a patterned robe like the sky, and image of the universe, with yellow cheek sparkling and a starry beard, held out a hand to Lyaeus, and entertained him with good cheer at a friendly table. He enjoyed a feast without meat carving, and touched nectar and ambrosia, why not indeed, if he did drink sweet nectar, after the immortal milk of Hera. Then he spoke to the star-clad in words full of curiosity. Inform me, Astrochiton, what god built this city in the form of a continent, and the image of an island? What heavenly hand designed it? Who lifted these rocks and rooted them in the sea? Who made all these works of art? Whence came the name of the fountains? Who mingled island with mainland and bound them together with mother sea? He spoke, and Heracles satisfied him with friendly words. Hear the story, Bacchus, I will tell you all. People dwelt here once whom time, bred along with them, saw the only agemates of the eternal universe, holy offspring of the virgin earth, whose bodies came forth of themselves from the unploughed unsown mud. These by indigenous art built upon foundations of rock a city unshakable on ground also of rock. Once on their watery beds among the fountains, while the fiery sun was beating the earth with steam, they were resting together and plucking at the Lethean wing of mind rejoicing sleep. Now I cherished a passion of love for that city, so I took the shadowed form of a human face, and stayed my step overhanging the head of these earthborn folk, and spoke to them my oracle in words of inspiration. Shake off idle sleep, sons of the soil. Make me a new kind of vehicle to travel on the brine. Clear me this ridge of pine woods with your sharp axes and make me a clever work. Set a long row of thick-set standing ribs and rivet planks to them, then join them firmly together with a well-fitting bond, the chariot of the sea, the first craft that ever sailed, which can heave you over the deep. But first let it have a long curved beam running from end to end to support the whole, and fasten the planks to the ribs fitted about it like a close wall of wood. Let there be a tall spar upright in the middle held fast with stays. Fasten a wide linen cloth to the middle of the pole with twisted ropes on each side. Keep the sail extended by these ropes, and let it belly out to the wind of heaven, pregnant by the breeze which carries the ship along. Where the new fitted timbers gape, plug them with thin pegs. Cover the sides with hurdles of wickerwork to keep them together, lest the water leak through unnoticed by a hole in the hollow vessel. Have a tiller as guide for your craft, to steer a course and drive you on the watery path with many a turn, twist it about everywhere as your mind draws you, and cleave the back of the sea in your wooden hull, until you come to the fated place, where driven wandering over the brine are two floating rocks, which nature has named the ambrosial rocks. On one of them grows a spire of olive, their age mate, self-rooted and joined to the rock, in the very midst of the water-faring stone. On the top of the foliage you will see an eagle perched, and a well-made bowl. From the flaming tree fire self-made spits out wonderful sparks, and the glow devours the olive tree all round but consumes it not. A snake writhes round the tree with its high-lifted leaves, increasing the wonder both for eyes and for ears. For the serpent does not creep silently to the eagle flying on high, and throw itself at him from one side with a threatening sweep to envelop him, nor spits deadly poison from his teeth and swallows the bird in his jaws, the eagle himself does not seize in his talons that crawler with many curling coils and carry him off high through the air, nor will he wound him with sharp-toothed beak, 
The flame does not spread over the branches of the tall trunk and devour the olive tree, which cannot be destroyed, nor withers the scales of the twining snake, so close a neighbor, nor does the leaping flame catch even the bird's interlaced feathers. No, the fire keeps to the middle of the tree and sends out a friendly glow, the bowl remains aloft, immovable though the clusters are shaken in the wind, and does not slip and fall. You must catch this wise bird, the high-flying eagle agemate of the olive, and sacrifice him to see blue hair. Pour out his blood on the sea-wandering cliffs to Zeus and the blessed. Then the rock wanders no longer driven over the waters, but it is fixed upon immovable foundations and unites itself bound to the free rock. Found upon both rocks a builded city, with keys on two seas, on both sides. Such was my prophetic message. The earthborn awaking was stirred, and the divine message of the unerring dreams still rang in the ears of each. I showed yet another marvel after the winged dreams to these troubled ones, indulging my mood of founding cities, myself destined to be city holder, out of the sea popped a nautilus fish, perfect image of what I meant and shaped like a ship, sailing on its voyage self-taught. Thus observing this creature so like a ship of the sea, they learnt without trouble how to make a voyage, they built a craft like to a fish of the deep and imitated its navigation of the sea. Then came a voyage, with four stones of an equal weight they trusted their balanced navigation to the sea, imitating the steady flight of the crane, for she carries a ballast stone in her mouth to help her course, lest the wind should beat her light wings aside as she flies. They went on until they saw that place, where the rocks were driven by the gales to navigate by themselves. There they stayed their craft beside the Seagate Isle, and climbed the cliffs where the tree of Athena stood. When they tried to catch the eagle which was at home on the olive tree, he flew down willingly and awaited his fate. The earthborn took their wing prey inspired, and drawing the head backwards they stretched out the neck free and bare, they sacrificed with the knife that self-surrendered eagle to Zeus and the lord of the waters. As the sage bird was sacrificed, the blood of prophecy gushed from the throat newly cut, and with those divine drops rooted the seafaring rocks at the bottom near to Tyre on the sea, and upon those unassailable rocks the earthborn built up their deep-breasted nurse. There, Lord Dionysus, I have told you of the soil-bred race of the earthborn, self-born, Olympian, that you might know how the Tyrian breed of your ancestors, sprang out of the earth. Now I will speak of the fountains. In the olden days they were chaste maidens primeval, but hot Eros was angered against their maiden girdles, and drawing a shaft of love he spoke thus to the marriage-hating nymphs, Nyadabababari, so fond of your maidenhood, you too receive this shaft, which nature has felt. Here I will build Kaliroi's bridey chamber, here I will sing Drosera's wedding hymn, but you will say, mine is a watery race, I came self-born from the streams and my nurse was a fountain, yes, Clymene was a naiad, and the offspring of Oceanos, but she yielded to wedlock, she also was a bride, when she saw sea blue hair the mighty lackey of Eros, and shaken with the passion of Cyprus. Primeval Oceanos, who commands all rivers and waters, knows love for Tethys and a watery wedding. Make the best of it, and endure as Tethys did. Another sprung from the sea so great and not from a little fountain, Galatia, has desire for melodious Polyphemos, the deep sea maiden has a husband from the land, she migrates from sea to land, enchanted by the lute. Fountains also have known my shafts. I need not teach you of love in the waters, you have heard of the watery passion of Syracuse and Arethusa, that love-stricken fountain, you have heard of Alpheos, who in a watery bower embraces the indwelling nymph with watery hands. You, the offspring of a fountain, why are you pleased with the archeress? Artemis did not come from the water like Aphrodite. Tell that to Caliroe, do not hide it from Drosera herself. You ought rather to please Cyprus, because she herself bent her neck to Eros even though she is nurse of the loves. Accept the stings of desire, and I will call you by birth one water walking, by love sister of Aphrodite. So he spoke, and from his back went bow let fly three shots. Then in that watery bower he joined in love sons of the soil to the naiads, and sowed the divine race of your family. So much Heracles leader of heaven said to Bacchus in pleasant gossip. He was delighted at heart by the tale, 
and offered to Heracles a mixing bowl of gold bright and shining, which the art of heaven had made, Heracles clad Dionysus in a starry robe. Then Bacchus left the star-clad god, city holder of Tyre, and went on to another district of Assyria. Book 41. The 41st tells how Aphrodite bore Armimony a second Cyprus to the son of Mira. Already he had planted in the earth the clustering vintage of his glorious fruit under the beetling crags of Lebanon, and intoxicated all the wine-bearing bottoms of the land. He saw the wedding chamber of Paphia, there with new-grown shoots of the garden vine he roofed a deep-shaded grove, then presented the viney gift to Adonis and Cythaea. There was also a troop of graces, and from the luxuriant coppice high leapt the ivy in his girdle of cultivated vine, and climbed aloft embracing the cypress. Come now, ye muses of Lebanon on the neighboring land of Baroe, that handmaiden of law. Recite the lay of Armimone, the war between cronides of the deep and well-besung Lyaos, the war of waters and the strife of the vine. There is a city Baroe, the keel of human life, harbor of the loves, firm based on the sea, with fine islands and fine verdure, with a ridge of isthmus narrow and long, where the rising neck between two seas is beaten by the waves of both. On one side it spreads under the deep wooded ridge of Assyrian Lebanon in the blazing east, and there comes for its people a life-saving breeze, whistling loud and shaking the cypress trees with fragrant winds. There the ancient shepherd shared his domain and made his music along with the fishermen, there was the dwelling of the farmers, where often near the woodland, Deo sickle in hand met Pan playing on his pipes, and the husbandman bending his neck over the plough pole, and showering the corn behind him into the new-cut furrows with back-turned wrist, the bowed ploughman gripping his yoke of bulls, had converse with his neighbour the shepherd along the foothills of the woodland pasture. The other part by the seas the city possesses, where she offers her breast to Poseidon, and her watery husband embraces the girl's pregnant neck with wet arm, putting moist kisses on the bride's lips, his bedfellow in her well-accustomed bosom accepts Poseidon's familiar bride gifts from his hand out of the deep, the sea-bred flocks of the waters, the fishes of many colours for her banqueting table, which dance on the table of Nerus in the brine, in the region of the bear, where the northerly coast receives the deep waves into its long channel. About the southern neck of this delightful country sandy roads lead to the southern hills and the Sidonian land, where are all manner of trees and vines thick with foliage in the gardens, and a highway stretches that no traveller can miss, overshadowed with long leafy branches. The sea bending its course beats on the shore about the dark-faced west, while the bite of Libya is fanned by the dewy whistle of Zephyrus as he rides with shrill-sounding heel over the western channels, where is a flowery land, where nurseries bloom hard by the sea, and the fragrant forest pervaded by humming wind sings from its leafy trees. Here dwelt a people age mates with the dawn, whom nature by her own breeding, in some unwedded way, begat without bridal, without wedding, fatherless, motherless, unborn, when the atoms were mingled in fourfold combination, and the seedless ooze shaped a clever offspring by commingling water with fiery heat and air, and quickened the teeming mud with the breath of life. To these nature gave perfect shape, for they had not the form of primeval sea crops, who crawled and scratched the earth with snaky feet that spat poison as he moved, dragon below, but above from loins to head he seemed a man half made, strange in shape and of twee form flesh, they had not the savage form of Erechtheus, whom Hephaestus begat on a furrow of earth with fertilizing dew, but now first appeared the golden crop of men brought forth in the image of the gods, with the roots of their stock in the earth. And these dwelt in the city of Baroe, that primordial seat which Cronus himself builded, at the time when invited by clever Rhea, he set that jagged supper before his voracious throat, and having the heavy weight of that stone within him to play the deliverer's part, he shot out the whole generation of his tormented children. Gaping wide, he sucked up the storming flood of a whole river, and swallowed it in his bubbling chest to ease his pangs, then threw off the burden of his belly, so one after another his pregnant throat pushed up and disgorged his twice-born sons, through the delivering channel of his gullet. Zeus was then a child, still a baby methinks, not yet the lightning flashed and cleft the hot clouds with many a dancing leap, not yet bolts of Zeus were shot to help in the titans' war, not yet the rainy sound of thunderclaps roared heavily with bang and boom through colliding clouds, but before that, the city of Baroe was there, 
which time with her first appearing saw when born together with her age-mate Earth. Tarso's the delight of mankind was not then, Thebes was not then, nor then was Sardis where the bank of Pactolos sparkles with opulent ooze disgorged, Sardis age-mate of Helios. The race of men was not then, nor any Achaean city, nor yet Arcadia itself which came before the moon. Baroe alone grew up, older than Phaethon, from whom Selene got her light, even before all the earth, milking out from Helios the shine of his new-made brightness upon her all-mothering breast and the later perfected light of unresting Selene Baroe first shook away the cone of darkling mist, and threw off the gloomy veil of chaos. Before Cyprus and the Isthmian city of Corinth, she first received Cyprus within her welcoming portal, newly born from the brine, when the water impregnated from the furrow of Oanos was delivered of deep sea Aphrodite, when without marriage, the sea ploughed the flood with male fertility, and it of itself shaped the foam into a daughter, and nature was the midwife, coming up with the goddess there was that embroidered strap which ran round her loins like a belt, set about the queen's body in a girdle of itself. Then the goddess, moving through the water along the quiet shore, ran out, not to Paphos, not to Byblos, set no foot on land by the dry beach of Collius, even passed by Cathera's city itself with quicker circuit, by, she rubbed her skin with bunches of seaweed and made it purpler still, paddling with her hands she cleft the birth waters of the waveless deep, and swam, resting her bosom upon the sea she struck up the silent brine, marking it with her feet, and kept her body afloat, and as she cut through the calm, pushed the water behind her with successive thrusts of her feet, and emerged at Baroe. Those footsteps of the goddess coming out from the sea are all lies of the people of Cyprus. Baroe first received Cyprus, and above the neighboring roads, the meadows of themselves put out plants of grass and flowers on all sides in the sandy bay the beach became ruddy with clumps of roses, the foamy stone teemed with sweet-smelling wine and brought forth purple fruit on its rocky bosom, a shadowing shower of dew with the liquor of the winepress. A white rill bubbled with milky juice, the fragrant breeze wafted upwards the curling vapors of scent, self-spread, and intoxicated the paths of the air. There, as soon as she was seen on the brows of the neighboring harborage, she brought forth mild Eros, first seed and beginning of generation, quickening guide of the system of the universe, and the quick leg boy, kicking manfully with his lively legs, hastened the hard labor of that body without a nurse, and beat on the closed womb of his unwedded mother, then a hot one even before birth, he shook his light wings and with a tumbling push opened the gates of birth. Thus quickly Eros leapt into his mother's gleaming arms, and pounced at once upon her firm breasts, spreading himself over that nursing bosom. Untaught he yearned for his food, he bit with his gums the end of the teat never milked before, and greedily drank all the milk of those breasts, swollen with the pressure of the life-giving drops. O Baroe, root of life, nurse of cities, the boast of princes, the first city scene, twin sister of time, coeval with the universe, seat of Hermes, land of justice, city of laws, bar of merry heart, house of Paphia, hall of the loves, delectable ground of Bacchus, home of the archeress, jewel of the Nereids, house of Zeus, court of Ares or Comenos of the Graces, star of the Lebanon country, years mate of Tethys, running side by side with Oceanos who begat thee in his bed of many fountains when joined in watery union with Tethys, Baroe the same they named Armimone when her mother brought her forth on her bed in the deep waters. But there is a younger legend, that her mother was Scythea herself, the pilot of human life, who bore her all white to Assyrian Adonis. Now she had completed the nine circles of Selene's course carrying her burden, but Hermes was there in time on speedy foot, holding a Latin tablet which was herald of the future. He came to help the labor of Baroe, and Themis was her Ilithia, she made a way through the narrow opening of the swollen womb for the child, and unfolded the wrapping, and lightened the sharp, hang of the ripening birth, with Solon's laws in hand. Cyprus under the oppression of her travail leaned back heavily against the ministering goddess, and in her throes brought forth the wise child upon the Attic book, as the Laconian women bring forth their sons upon the round leather shield. She brought forth her newborn child from her motherly womb with Hermes the judge to help as man midwife. So she brought the baby into the light. The girl was bathed by the four winds, 
which ride through all cities to fill the whole earth with the precepts of Baroe. Oceanos, first messenger of the laws for the newborn child, sent his flood for the childbed round the loins of the world, pouring his girdle of water in an ever-flowing belt. Time, his coeval, with his aged hands, swaddled about the newborn girl's body the robes of justice, prophet of things to come, because he would put off the burden of age, like a snake throwing off the rope-like slough of his feeble old scales, and grow young again bathed in the waves of law. The four seasons, struck up a tune together, when Aphrodite brought forth her wonderful daughter. The beasts were wild with joy when they learnt of the Paphian's child safely born. The lion in playful sport pressed his mouth gently on the bull's neck, and uttered a friendly growl with pouting lips. The horse rattled off, scraping the ground with thuds of galloping feet, as he beat out a birthday tune. The spotted panther leaping on high with bounding feet capered towards the hare. The wolf let out a triumphal howl from a merry throat and kissed the sheep with jaws that tore not. The hound left his chase of the deer in the thickets, now that he felt a passion strange and sweet, and danced in tripping rivalry with the sportive boar. The bear lifted her forefeet and threw them round the heifer's neck, embracing her with a bond that did no hurt. The calf bending again and again in sport her rounded head, skipped up and licked the lioness's body, while her young lips made a half-completed moo. The serpent touched the friendly tusks of the elephant, and the trees uttered a voice. With calm face ever smiling Aphrodite rang out her unfailing laugh, when she saw the birthday games of the happy beasts. She turned her round eyes delighted in all directions, only the boars she would not watch in their pleasures, for being a prophet she knew, that in the shape of a wild boar, Ares with jagged tusk and spitting deadly poison was destined to weave fate for Adonis in jealous madness. Virgin Astraea, nurse of the whole universe, cherisher of the golden age, received Baroe from her mother into the embrace of her arms, laughing, still a babe, and fed her with wise breast as she babbled words of law. With her virgin milk, she let streams of statutes gush into the baby's lips, and dropped into the girl's mouth the sweet produce of the atty bee, she pressed the bee's riddled travail of many cells, and mixed the voiceful comb in a sapient cup. If the girl thirsting asked for a drink, she gave the speaking Pythian water kept for Apollo, or the stream of Ilissos, which is inspired by the Attic muse when the Pierian breezes of Phoebus beat on the bank. She took the golden corn stalk from the stars, and entwined it in a cluster to put round the girl's neck like a necklace. The dancing maidens of Orcomenos, handmaids of the Paphian, drew from the horse hoof fountain of imagination, dear to the nine muses, delicate water to wash her. Baroe grew up, and coursed with the archeress, carrying the nets of her hunter sire. She had the very likeness of her Paphian mother, and her shining feet. When Thetis came up out of the sea to skip with snowy dancing foot, she saw another silver foot Thetis, and hid in shame, fearing the raillery of Cassiopeia once again. Zeus perceiving another unwedded maiden of Assyria, was fluttered again and wished to change his form, certainly he would have carried the burden of love in bull's form again, skimming away with his legs in the water, paddling along, bearing the woman unwetted on his back, had he not been held back by the memory of that Sidonian bull-horned wedding, and had not the bull of Olympus, Europa's bridegroom, bellowed from out the stars with jealous throat. To think that he might set up there a new star of seafaring amours and make the image of a rival bull in the sky. So he left Baroe, who was destined for a watery bridal, as his brother's bedfellow, for he wished not to quarrel with Earth Shaker about a mortal wife. Such was Baroe, flower of the graces. If ever the girl uttered her voice trickling sweeter than honey and the honeycomb, winning persuasion sat ever upon her lips and enchanted the clever wits of men whom nothing else could charm. Her laughing eyes outshone all the company of her young Assyrian agemates as they shot their shafts of love, with brighter graces, like the moon at the full when showering her cloudless rays and hiding the stars. Her white robes falling down to the girl's feet showed the blush of her rosy limbs. There is no wonder in that, even if she had such fairness beyond her young year's mates, since bright over her countenance, sparkled the beauties of both her parents. Then Cyprus saw her, pregnant with prophetic intelligence she sent her imagination wandering swiftly round, 
and driving her mind to wander about the whole earth surveyed the foundations of the brilliant cities of ancient days. She saw how Makini girt about with a garland of walls by the Cyclopean masons took the name of Twinkle I Makini, how Thebes beside the southern Nile took the name of primeval Thebe, and she decided to design a city named after Baroe, being possessed with a passion to make her city as good as theirs. She observed there the long column of Solon's laws, that safeguard against wrong, and turned aside her eye to the broad streets of Athens, and envied her sister the just judge. With hurrying shoe, she whizzed along the vault of heaven to the hall of all Mother Harmonia, where that nymph dwelt in a house, self-built, shaped like the great universe with its four quarters joined in one. Four portals were about that stronghold standing proof against the four winds. Handmaids protected this dwelling on all sides, a round image of the universe, the doors were allotted, Antolia was the maid who attended the east wind's gate, at the west wind's was Desis the nurse of Selene, Mesembrius held the bolt of the fiery south, Arctos the bear was the servant who opened the gate of the north, thick with clouds and sprinkled with hail. To that place went Charis, fellow voyager with the foam born, and running ahead she knocked at the eastern gate of Euros. As the rap came on the saffron portal of sunrise, a stenomia and attendant ran up from within, and when she saw Cyprus standing in front of the gatehouse of the dwelling, she went with returning feet to inform her mistress beforehand. She was then busy at Athena's loom, weaving a patterned cloth with her shuttle. In the robe she was weaving, she worked first earth as the navel in the midst, round it she balled the sky dotted with the shape of stars, and fitted the sea closely to the embracing earth, she embroidered also the rivers in a green picture, shaped each with a human face and bull's horns, and at the outer fringe of the well-spun robe she made ocean run all round the world in a loop. The maid came up to the woman's loom, and announced that Aphrodite stood before the gatehouse. When the goddess heard, she dropped the threads of the robe and threw down the divine shuttle from her hands busy at the loom. Quickly she wrapped a snow white the names mean rising, setting, she of midday. Robe about her body, and brighter than the gold took her place on her usual seat to await Cythea. As soon as Aphrodite appeared in the distance, she leapt from her throne to show due respect. Your enemy in her long robe led the Paphian to a seat near her mistress, Harmonia the nurse of the world saw the looks and dejected bearing of Cyprus that showed her distress, and comforted her in friendly tones. Cythea, root of life, seed sower of being, midwife of nature, hope of the whole universe, at the bidding of your will the unbending fates do spin their complicated threads. Tell me your trouble. Dot she replied. Reveal to your questioner, and tell me, as nourisher of life, nurse of immortals, as coeval with the universe your age mate, which of the cities has the organ of sovereign voice, which has reserved for it the unshaken reins of trouble-solving law. I joined Zeus in wedlock with Hera his sister, after he had felt the pangs of long-lasting desire and desired her for three hundred years, in gratitude he bowed his wise head, and promised as a worthy reward for the marriage that he would commit the precepts of justice to one of the cities allotted to me. I wish to learn whether the gift is reserved for land of Cyprus or Paphos or Corinth, or Sparta whence Lycurgos came, or the nobleman's country of my own daughter Baroe. Have a care then for justice, and grant harmony to the world, you who are Harmonia the saviour of life. For I was sent here in haste by the virgin of the stars herself, the nurse of law-abiding men, and what is more, law-loving Hermes has passed on this honour to me, that I alone by enforcing the laws of marriage may preserve the men whom I have sown. To these words of hers the goddess replied with an encouraging speech. Be of good cheer, fear not, mother of the loves. For I have oracles of history on seven tablets, and the tablets bear the names of the seven planets. The first has the name of Revolving Selene, the second is called of Hermes, a shining tablet of gold, upon which are wrought all the secrets of law, the third has your name, a rosy tablet, for it has the shape of your star in the east, the fourth is of Helios, central navel of the seven traveling planets, the fifth is called Ares, red and fiery, the sixth is called Phaethon, the planet of Cronides, the seventh shows the name of high-moving Kronos. Upon these, ancient Ophion has engraved in red letters all the divers oracles of fate for the universe. 
But since you ask me about the directing laws, this prerogative I keep for the eldest of cities. Whether then Arcadia is first or Hera's city, whether Sardis be the oldest, or even Tarsos celebrated in song be the first city, or some other, I have not been told. The tablet of Kronos will teach you all this, which first arose, which was coeval with dawn. She spoke, and led the way to the glorious oracles of the wall, until she saw the place where Ophian's art had engraved in ruddy vermilion on the tablet of Kronos the oracle to be fulfilled in time about Baroe's country. Baroe came the first, coeval with the universe her age mate, bearing the name of the nymph later born, which the colonizing sons of the Orsonians, the consular lights of Rome, shall call Baitos, since here fell a neighbor to Lebanon. Such was the word of prophecy that she learnt. But when the deity had scanned the prophetic beginning of the seventh tablet, she looked at the second, where on the neighboring wall many strange signs were engraved with varied art in oracular speech, how first shepherd Pan will invent the syrinx, Heliconian Hermes the harp, tender Hyagnus the music of the double pipes with their clever holes, Orpheus the streams of mystic song with divine voice, Apollo's Lino's eloquent speech, how Arcas the traveler will find out the measures of the twelve months and the sun's circuit which is the mother of the years brought forth by his four-horse team, how wise Endymion with changing bends of his fingers will calculate the three varying phases of Selene, how Cadmus will combine consonant with vowel and teach the secrets of correct speech, how Solon will invent inviolable laws, and Cecrops the union of two yoked together under the sacred yoke of marriage made lawful with the Attic torch. Now the Paphian, after all these manifold wonders of the muse, scanned the various deeds of the scattered cities, and on the written tablet which lay in the midst on the circuit of the universe, she found these words of wisdom inscribed in many lines of Grecian verse. When Augustus shall hold the scepter of the world, Orsonian Zeus will give to divine Rome the lordship, and to Baroe he will grant the reins of law, when armed in her fleet of shielded ships she shall pacify the strife of battle stirring Cleopatra. For before that, City-sacking violence will never cease to shake city-saving peace, until Boitos the nurse of quiet life does justice on land and sea, fortifying the cities with the unshakable wall of law, one city for all cities of the world. Then the goddess, having learnt all the oracles of Ophion, returned to her own house. She placed her own gold-wrought throne beside the place where her son sat, and throwing an arm round his waist, with quiet countenance opened her glad arms to receive the boy and held the dear burden on her knees, she kissed both his lips and eyes, touched his mind bewitching bow and fingered the quiver, and spoke in feigned anger these cunning words. You hope of all life. You cajoler of the foam born. Cronion is a cruel tyrant to my children alone. After nine full months of hard travail I brought forth Harmonia, suffering the bitter pangs of painful childbirth, and now she suffers all sorts of grief and tribulation. But Leto has borne Artemis Ilithia, the lady of travail, the ally of womankind. You Amimone's brother, son of the same mother, need not to be told how I got my blood from brine and ether, but I would perform a worthy deed, and being born of heaven, I will plant heaven on earth beside the sea my mother. Come then, for your sister's beauty draw your bow and bewitch the gods, or say, Shoot one shaft and hit with the same shot Poseidon and vine god Laeos, blessed ones both. I will give you a gift for your long shot which will be a proper wage worthy of your feet, I will give you the marriage harp of gold, which Phoebus gave to Harmonia at the door of the bridal chamber, I will place it in your hands in memory of a city to be, that you may be not only an archer, but a harpist, just like Apollo. Book 42. The forty-second web I have woven, where I celebrate a delightful love of Bacchus and the desire of Earth Shaker. He obeyed her request, treading on time's heels hot love swiftly sped, plying his feet into the wind, high in the clouds scoring the air with winged step, and carried his flaming bow, the quiver too, filled with gentle fire, hung down over his shoulder. As when a star stretches straight with a long trail of sparks, a swift traveler through the unclouded sky, bringing a portent for a war host or some sailor man, and streaks the back of the upper air with a wake of fire, so went furious Eros in a swift rush, and his wings beat the air with a sharp whirring sound that whistled down from the sky. Then near the Assyrian rock he united two fiery arrows on one string, 
to bring two woos into like desire for the love of a maid, rivals for one bride, the vine god and the ruler of the sea. Meanwhile one came from the deep waters of the sea neighboring roadstead, and one left the land of Tyre, and among the mountains of Lebanon the two met in one place. Marin loosed the panther sweating from the yoke of his awful car, and brushed off the dust and swilled the beasts with water of the fountain, cooling their hot scarred necks. Then Eros came quickly up to the maiden hard by, and struck both divinities with two arrows. He maddened Dionysus to offer his treasures to the bride, life's merry heart and the ruddy vintage of the grape, he goaded to love the lord of the trident, that he might bring the sea neighboring maid a double love gift, seafaring battle on the water and varied dishes for the table. He set Bacchus more in a flame, since wine excites the mind for desire, and wine finds unbridled youth much more obedient to the rain when it is charmed with the prick of unreason, so he shot Bacchus and drove the whole shaft into his heart, and Bacchus burnt, as much as he was charmed by the trickling honey of persuasion. Thus he maddened them both, and in the counterfeit shape of a bird circling his tracks in the airy road as swift as the rapid winds, he rose with paddling feet, and cried these taunting words, If Dionysus confounds men with wine, I excite Bacchus with fire. The vine god turned his eye to look, and scanned the tender body of the long-haired maiden, full of admiration the conduit of desire, his eye led the way and ferried the newborn love. Dionysus wandered in that heart-rejoicing wood, secretly fixing his careful gaze on Baroe, and followed the girl's path a little behind. He could not have enough of his gazing, for the more he beheld the maid standing there, the more he wanted to watch. He called to Helios, reminding the chief of stars of his love for Clemeni, and prayed him to hold back his car and check the stalled horses with the heavenly bit, that he might prolong the sweet light, that he might go slow to his setting and with sparing whip increase the day to shine again. Pressing measured step by step in Baroe's tracks the god passed round her as if noticing nothing, while earth shaker stole from Lebanon with lingering feet, and departed with steps slow to obey, turning again and again, his mind shifting like the sea and rippling with billows of ever-murmuring care. Unsated, in the delicious forests of Lebanon, Dionysus was left alone beside the lonely girl. Dionysus was left alone. Tell me, or I had nymphs. What could he wish for more lovely than to see the maiden's flesh, alone, and free from lovesick earth's shaker? He kissed with a million kisses the place where she set her foot, creeping up secretly, and kissed the dust where the maiden had trod making it bright with her shoes of roses. Bacchus watched the girl's sweet neck, her ankles as she walked, beauty which nature had given her, the beauty which nature had made, for no ruddy ornament for the skin had Baroi smeared on her round rosy face, no meretricious rouge put a false blush on her cheeks. She consulted no shining mirror of bronze with its reflection a witness of her looks, she laughed at no lifeless form of a mimic face to estimate her beauty, she was not forever arranging the curls over her brows, and setting in place some stray wandering lock of hair by her eyebrows with cunning touch. But the natural beauties of a face confound the desperate lover with far sharper sting, and the untidy tresses of an unbedizened head are all the more dainty, when they stray unbraided down the sides of a snow-white face. Sometimes a thirst when beaten by the heat of the fiery dog of heaven, the girl sought out a neighboring spring with parched lips, the girl bent down her curving neck and stooped her head, dipping a hand again and again and scooping the water of her own country to her mouth, until she had enough and left the rills. When she was gone, Dionysus would bend his knee to the lovely spring, and hollow his palms in mimicry of the beloved girl then he drank water sweeter than self-poured nectar. And the unshod deep bosom nymph of the spring, seeing him struck by the sting of desire, would say, Cold water to drink, Dionysus, is of no use to you, for all the stream of Oceanos cannot quench the thirst of love. Ask your own father. Europa's bridegroom traversed that wide gulf and yet did not quench the fire of longing, but he suffered still more on the waters. Witness wandering Alpheos, whom you see the servant of water faring love, in that trailing water through water in all those floods he escaped not hot love, though he was a watery traveller. So said the unveiled Naiad, and laughed at Lyaeos, diving into her spring, which had one colour with her body. And the god grudging at Poseidon ruler of the waves felt fear and jealousy, since the maiden drank water and not wine. 
he uttered his voice to the unhearing air, as if the girl were there to hear and obey. Maiden, accept the nectar, leave this water that maidens love. Avoid the water of the spring, lest sea blue hair steal your maidenhood in the water, for a mad lover and a crafty one he is. You know the love of Thessalian Tyro and her wedding in the waters, then you too take care of the crafty flood, lest the deceiver loose your girdle just as the wedding thief Enipeus did. Oh that I also might become a flood, like earth shaker, and murmuring might embrace my own Tyro of Lebanon, thirsty and careless beside the love-stricken spring. So the god spoke, and changing his form for another he plunged into the shady thicket where the maiden was, Uyo's wholly like a hunter, in a new and unknown aspect he joined the soft-haired unyoked maid, like a youth, molding a false image of modesty with steady looks on his face. Now he surveyed the peak of a lonely rock, now he spied into the long branching trees on the uplands, turning an eager eye on a pine or again inspecting a fir tree, or an elm, but with cautious countenance and stolen glances he watched the girl so close to him, lest she should turn and run away, for beauty and the eyes of a girl of his own age have little consolation to a lad who gazes at her for the loves which the Cyprian sends. He came near to Baroe, and would have spoken a word, but fear held him fast. God of jubilation, where is your man-slaying Thyasus? Where your frightful horns? Where the green snaky ropes of earth fed serpents in your hair? Where is your heavy booming bellow? See a great miracle, Bacchus trembling before a maid, Bacchus before whom the tribes of the giants trembled. Love's fear has conquered the destroyer of giants. He mowed down all that war-mad nation of the Indians, and he fears one weak lovely girl, fears a tender woman. On the mountains he quieted the terrifying roar of lions with his beast ruling fennel, and he trembled before a woman's threat. A word strayed into his trembling mouth, to the tip of his tongue close behind the lips, it came from his heart and crept back to his heart again, but the bittersweet fear held it in shamefast silence, and drew back the voice, as it tried to issue into the light. Too late he spoke, and hardly then, when he burst the chain of shame from his lips and undid the procrastinating silence, and asked Leroy in a voice of pretense, Artemis, where are your arrows? Who has stolen your quiver? Where did you leave the tunic you wear, just covering the knees? Where are those boots quicker than the whirling wind? Where is your company in attendance? Where are your nets? Where your fleet hounds? You are not making ready for chase of the pricket, for you do not wish to hunt where Cyprus is sleeping beside Adonis. So he spoke, feigning astonishment, and the maiden smiled in her heart, she lifted a proud neck in unsuspicious pleasure, rejoicing in her youthful freshness, because she, a mortal woman, was likened to a goddess in beauty, and did not see the trick of mind confusing Dionysus. But Bacchus was yet more affected, because the girl in her childish simplicity knew not desire, he wished she might learn his own overpowering passion, since when the girl knows, there is always hope for the lad that love will come at last, but when women do not notice, man's desire is only a fruitless anxiety. Thus day after day, midday and afternoon, morning and evening, the god lingered in the pinewood, waiting for the girl and ever willing to wait, for men can have enough of all things, of sweet sleep and melodious song, and when one turns in the moving dance, but only the man mad for love never has enough of his longing, Homer's book did not tell the truth. Dionysus suffered and moaned in silence, struck with the divine whip, stewing the hidden wound of love in his restless heart. As an ox goes scampering over the flats past the well-no swarm of hill-ranging bulls, driven from the herd when a gadfly has pierced his hide with sharp sting under the leafy trees unnoticed, how small the sting that strikes, how vast the bulk of the rooted beast. He lifts the tail straight over his back and lashes back, bends and scratches his chine on the rocks, and darts a sharp horn, at his side striking only the unwounded elastic air, so Dionysus, crowned so often with victory, was pricked by little love and his all-bewitching sting. At length, seeking a sweet medicine for love, he disclosed to bushy-breasted Pan in words full of passion the unsleeping constraint of his desire, and craved advice to defend him against love. Horned Pan laughed aloud, when he heard the fire-breathing torments of Bacchus, but, a luckless lover himself, heartbroken he pitied one unhappy in love, 
and gave him love advice, it was a small alleviation of his own love to see another burnt with a spark from the same quiver. We are companions in suffering, friend Bacos, and I pity your feelings. How comes it that bold love has conquered you too? If I dare to say so, Eros has emptied his quiver on me and Dionysus. But I will tell you the multifarious ways of deception in love. Every woman has greater desire than the man, but shame fast she hides the sting of love, though mad for love herself, and she suffers much more, since the sparks of love become hotter when women conceal in their bosoms the piercing arrow of love. Indeed, when they tell each other of the force of desire, their gossip is meant to soothe the pain and deceive their voluptuous longings. And you, Bacchus, must wear a deceptive blush of pretended shame to carry your love along. You must keep an unsmiling countenance as if through modesty, and stand beside Baroi as if by mere chance. Hold your nets in hand, and look at the rosy girl with pretended amazement, praising her beauty, say that not Hera has the like, call the graces less fair, find fault with the good looks of both Artemis and Athena, tell Baroi she is more brilliant than Aphrodite. Then the girl when she hears your feigned fault-finding, stands there more delighted with your praise, more than mountains of gold she would hear about her rosy comeliness, how her beauty surpasses all the friends of her youth. Charm the maiden to love with a meaning silence. Let your eyelids move, send wink and beck towards her. Open your hand and slap your brow without mercy, and show your feigned amazement by prudent silence. You will say, fear restrains you in the presence of a modest maid, tell me, what will a lonely girl do to you? She shakes no spear, she draws no shaft with that rosy hand, the girl's weapons are those eyes which shoot love, her batteries are those rose-red girlish cheeks. For love gifts to be treasures for your bride, do not display the Indian jewel, or pearls, as is the way of mad lovers, for to get love, your own handsome shape is enough, to touch your beautiful body is what women want, not gold. I need no other testimony, what gifts, did Selene take from soft-haired Endymion? What love gift did Adonis produce for Cyprus? Orion gave no silver to Dawn, Cephalos provided no delectable wealth, but the only one it seems who did offer handsome gifts was Hephaestus, being lame, to make up for his unattractive looks, and then he failed to persuade Athena, his birth-delivering acts did not help him, but he missed the goddess he wanted. But there is a stronger charm for wedded union, which I will teach you if you like? Twang the lyre which was dedicated to your Rhea, the delicate treasure of Cyprus beside the wine cup. Pour out the varied sounds together, voice and striker. Sing first, Daphne, sing the erratic course of Echo, and the answering note of the goddess who never fails to speak, for these two despised the desire of gods. Yes, and sing also of pities who hated marriage, who fled fast as the wind over the mountains to escape the unlawful wooing of Pan, and her fate, how she disappeared into the soil herself, put the blame on the earth. Then she may perhaps lament the sorrows and the fate of the wailing nymph, but you must let your heart rejoice in silence, as you see the honey-sweet tears of the sorrowing maid. No laugh was ever like that, since women become more desirable with that ruddy flush when they mourn. Sing Selene madly in love with Endymion, sing the wedding of graceful Adonis, sing Aphrodite herself wandering dusty and unshod, and tracking her bridegroom over the hills. Baroe will not run away from you when she hears the honey-hearted love stories of her home. There you have all I can tell you, Bacchus, for your unhappy love. Now you tell me something to charm my echo. Having said his say, he dismissed the son of Thyone comforted. Then Dionysus put on a serious look, the trickster, and questioned the maiden about her father Adonis, as a friend of his, as a fellow hunter among the hills. She stood still, he brought a longing hand near her breast, and stroked her belt as if not thinking what he did, but touching her breast, the lovesick god's right hand grew numb. Once in her childlike way, the girl asked the son of Zeus beside her who he was and who was his father. With much ado he found an excuse, when he saw before the portals of Aphrodite the vineyard and the bounteous harvest of the land, the dewy meadow and all the trees, and in the cunning of his mind, he made as if he were a farm laborer and spoke of wedding in words that meant more than they said. 
I am a countryman of your Lebanon. If it is your pleasure, I will water your land, I will grow your corn. I understand the course of the four seasons. When I see the limit of autumn is here, I will call aloud, Scorpion is rising with his bounteous plenty, he is the herald of a fruitful furrow, let us yoke oxen to the plough. The pliads are setting, when shall we sow the fields? The furrows are teeming, when the dew falls on land parched by Phaethon. And in the showers of winter when I see Arcturus close to the Arcadian wane, I will exclaim, at last thirsty earth is wedded with the showers of Zeus. As the spring rises up, I will cry out in the morning, your flowers are blooming, when shall I pluck lilies and roses? Just look how the iris has run over the neighboring myrtle, how Narcissus laughs as he leaps on an emony. And when I see the grapes of summer before me I will cry, the vine is in her prime, ripening without the sickle, maiden, your sister has come, when shall we gather the grapes? Your wheat ear is grown big and wants the harvest, I will reap the crop of corn ears, and I will celebrate harvest home for your mother the cypress, born instead of Deo. Accept me as your laborer to help on your fertile lands. Take me as planter for your foam born, that I may plant that life-bringing tree, that I may detect the half-ripe berry of the tame vine and feel the new growing bud. I know how apples ripen, I know how to plant the wide-spreading elm too, leaning against the cypress. I can join the male palm happily with the female, and make pretty saffron, if you like, grow beside bindweed. Don't offer me gold for my keep, I have no need of wealth, my wages will be two apples and one bunch of grapes of one vintage. All this he said in vain, the girl answered nothing, for she understood nothing of the mad lover's long speech. But Erephiot's thought of trick after trick. He took the hunting net from Baroe's hands and pretended to admire the clever work, shaking it round and round for some time and asking the girl many questions, what God made this gear, what heavenly art. Who made it? Indeed I cannot believe that Hephaestus mad with jealousy made hunting gear for Adonis. So he tried to bewilder the wits of the girl who would not be so charmed. Once it happened that he lay sound asleep on a bed of anemone leaves, and he saw the girl in a dream decked out in bridal array. For what a man does in the day, the image of that he sees in the night, the herdsman sleeping takes his horned cattle to pasture, the huntsman sees nets in the vision of a dream, men who work on the land plough the fields in sleep and sow the furrow with corn, a man parched at midday and possessed with fiery thirst is driven by deceiving sleep to a river, to a channel of water. So Dionysus also beheld the likeness of his troubles, and let his mind go flying in mimic dreams until he was joined to her in a wedding of shadow. He awoke, and found no maiden, and wished once again to slumber, he carried away the empty largesse of that short embrace, as he slept on the leaves of the anemone which perishes so soon. He reproached the dumb leaves there spread, and sorrowfully prayed to sleep and love and Aphrodite of the evening, all at once, to let him see the same vision of a dream once more, longing for the deceptive phantom of an embrace. Bacchus often slept near the myrtle and never dreamt of marriage. But sweet pain he did feel, and limb relaxing Dionysus found his own limbs relaxed by love stricken cares. In company with Baroe's father, the son of Mira, he showed his hunting skill. He cast his thyasus, and wrapped himself in the dappled skins of the new slain fawns, ever with his eye secretly on Baroe, as he stood, the maiden covered her bright cheeks with her robe, to escape the wandering eye of Dionysus. She made him burn all the more, since the servants of love watch shamefast women more closely, and desire more strongly the covered countenance. Once he caught sight of the unyoked girl of Adonis alone, and came near, and changed his human form and stood as a god before her. He told her his name and family, the slaughter of the Indians, how he found out for man the vine dance and the sweet juice of wine to drink, then in loving passion he mingled audacity with a boldness far from modesty, and his flattering voice uttered this ingratiating speech. Maiden, for your love I have even renounced my home in heaven. The caves of your fathers are better than Olympus. I love your country more than the sky, I desire not the scepter of my father's use as much as Baroe for my wife. Your beauty is above ambrosia, indeed, heavenly nectar breathes fragrant from your dress. Maiden, 
When I hear that your mother is Cyprus, my only wonder is that her Cestus has left you uncharmed? How is it you alone have love for a brother, and yet know not the sting of love? But you will say bright eyes had nothing to do with marriage, Athena was born without wedlock and knows nothing of wedlock. Yes, but your mother was neither bright eyes nor Artemis. Well, girl, you have the blood of Cyprus, then why do you flee from the secrets of Cyprus? Do not shame your mother's race. If you really have in you the blood of Assyrian Adonis the Charming, learn the tender rules of your sire whose blessing is upon marriage, obey the Cestus girdle born with the Paphian, save yourself from the dangerous wrath of the bridal loves. Harsh are the loves when there's need, when they exact from women the penalty for love unfulfilled. For you know how Syrinx disregarded fiery Cathera, and what price she paid for her too great pride and love for virginity, how she turned into a plant with reedy growth substituted for her own, when she had fled from Pan's love, and how she still sings Pan's desire. And how the daughter of Laden, that celebrated river, hated the works of marriage and the nymph became a tree with inspired whispers, she escaped the bed of Phoebus but she crowned his hair with prophetic clusters. You too should beware of a god's horrid anger, lest hot love should afflict you in heavy wrath. Spare not your girdle, but at it end backos both as comrade and bedfellow. I myself will carry the nets of your father Adonis, I will lay the bed of my sister Aphrodite. What worthy gifts will earth shaker bring? Will he choose his salt water for a bride gift, and lay sealskins breathing the filthy stink of the deep, as Poseidon's coverlets from the sea? Do not accept his sealskins. I will provide you with bacchants to wait upon your bridey chamber, and satyrs for your chamberlains. Accept from me as bride gift my grape vintage too. If you want a wild spear also as daughter of Adonis, you have my thiasis for a lance, away with the trident's tooth. Flee, my dear, from the ugly noise of the never-silent sea, flee the madness of Poseidon's dangerous love. See blue hair lay beside another armimony, but after the bed the wife became a spring of that name. He slept with Scylla, and made her a cliff in the water. He pursued Astery, and she became a desert island, you boy the maiden he rooted in the sea. This creature woos Armimony just to turn her two into stone after the bed, this creature offers as gift for his wedding a drop of water, or seaweed from the brine, or a deep sea conch. And I, distressed for your beauty as I stand here, what have I for you, what gifts shall I offer? The daughter of golden Aphrodite needs no gold. Shall I bring you heaps of treasure from Alibi? Silver arm cares not for silver. Shall I bring you gleaming gifts from brilliant Eridanos? Your beauty, your blushing whiteness, puts to shame all the wealth of the Heliades, the neck of Baroe is like the gleams of dawn, it shines like amber, outshines. A sparkling jewel, your fair shape makes precious marble cheap. I would not bring you the lampstone blazing like a lamp, for light comes from your eyes. I would not give you roses, shooting up from the flower cups of a rosy cluster, for roses are in your cheeks. Such was his address, and the girl pressed the fingers of her two hands into her ears to keep the words away from her hearing, lest she might hear again another speech concerned with love, and she hated the works of marriage. So she made trouble upon trouble for love's stricken liaos. What is more shameless than love, or when women avoid men who yearn with the heart-eating maddening urge of desire, and only make them more passionate by their modesty? The love within them is doubled when a maiden flees from a man. So he was flogged by the maddening cestus of desire, and he kept away from the girl, but full of bittersweet pangs, he sent his mind to wander a-hunting with the girl with ungirt tunic. Then out from the sea came Poseidon, moving his wet footsteps in search of the girl over the thirsty hills, a foreign land to him, and sprinkling the unwatered earth with watery foot, and as he hasted along the fertile slope of the woodland, the topmost peaks of the mountains shook under the movement. He espied Baroe, and from head to foot he scanned her divine young freshness while she stood. Clear through the filmy robe he noted the shape of the girl with steady eyes, as if in a mirror, Glancing from side to side he saw the shining skin of her breasts as if naked, and cursed the jealous bodice wrapped about in many folds which hid the bosom, he ran his love maddened around and round over her face, 
he gazed never satisfied on her whole body. Then mad with passion earth shaker lord of the brine appealed in his trouble to Sithea of the brine, and tried with flattering words to make friends with the maiden standing beside the country flock. One woman outshines all the lovely women of Hellas. Paphos is celebrated no longer, nor Lesbos, Cyprus no longer has a name as mother of beauty, no longer will I sing Naxos which the singers call Isle of Fair Maids, yes, even Lacedaemon is worsted for children and childbirth. No more Paphos, no more Lesbos, the land of the rising sun, Armimone's nurse, has plundered all the glory of Orcomenos, for one single grace of her own. For Baroe has appeared of fourth grace, younger than the three. Maiden, leave the land. That is just, for your mother grew not from the land, she is Aphrodite daughter of the brine. Here is my infinite sea for your bride gift, larger than earth. Hasten to challenge the consort of Zeus, that men may say that the lady of Cronides and the wife of earth shake her hold universal rule, since Hera has the scepter of snowy Olympus, Baroe has gotten the empire of the sea. I will not provide you with mad-eyed basarids, I will give you no dancing satyr and no salinos, but I will make Proteus chamberlain of your marriage consummating bed, and Glaucos shall be your underling, take Nerus too, and Melicertes if you like, and I will call murmuring Oceanos your servant, broad Oceanos girdling the rim of the eternal world. I give you as a bridal gift all the rivers together for your attendants. If you are pleased to have waiting maids also, I will bring you the daughters of Nerus, and let Eno the nurse of Dionysus be your chambermaid, whether she likes it or not. Thus he pleaded, but the maiden was angry and would not listen, so he left her, pouring out his last words into the air. Happy son of Mira, you have got a fine daughter, and now a double honor is yours alone, you alone are named father of Baroe and bridegroom of the foam-born. Thus earth shaker was flogged by the blows of the cestus, but he offered many gifts to Adonis and Sithea, bride gifts for the love of their daughter. Dionysus burning with the same shaft brought his treasures, all the shining gold that the mines near the Ganges had brought forth in their throes of labor, earnestly but in vain he made his petition to Aphrodite of the sea. Now Paphia was anxious, for she feared both woos of her much-wooed girl. When she saw equal desire and ardor of love in both, she announced that the rivals must fight for the bride, a war for a wedding, a battle for love. Cyprus arrayed her daughter in all woman's finery, and placed her upon the fortress of her country, a maiden to be fought for as the dainty prize of contest. Then she addressed both gods in the same words. I could wish had I two daughters, to wed one as is justly due to earth's shaker, and one to Lyaeos, but since my child was not twins, and the undefiled laws of marriage do not allow us to join one girl to a pair of husbands together change and change about, let battle be chamberlain for one single bride, for without hard labor there is no marriage with Baroe. Then if you would wed the maid, first fight it out together, let the winner lead away Baroe without bride price. Both must agree to an oath, since I fear for the girl's neighboring city where I am known as city holder, that because of Baroe's beauty I may lose Baroe's home. Make treaty before the marriage, that see God earth shaker if he lose the victory shall not in his grief lay waste the land with his trident's tooth, and that Dionysus shall not be angry about Armimone's wedding, and destroy the vineyards of the city. And you must be friends after the battle, both be rivals in single-hearted affection, and in one contract of goodwill adorn, the city of the bride with still more brilliant beauty. The wooers agreed to this proposal. Both took a binding oath, by Cronides and Earth, by Sky and the floods of Styx, and the fates formally witnessed the bargain. Then strife grew greater to escort the loves, and turmoil also, persuasion the handmaid of marriage, armed them both. From heaven came all the dwellers on Olympus, with Zeus, and stayed to watch the combat upon the rocks of Lebanon. Then appeared a great portent for love-stricken Dionysus. A storm-swift falcon was in chase of a feeding pigeon, he drooped his breeze-impregnated wings, when suddenly an osprey caught up the pigeon from the ground and flew to the deep, holding the bird high in gentle talons. When Dionysus beheld this, he cast away hope of victory, nevertheless he entered the fray. Father Cronion was pleased with the contest of these two, 
as he watched from on high the match between his brother and his son with smiling eye. Book 43. Look again at the 43rd, in which I sing a war of the waters and a battle of the vine. So battle-stirring Ares, who leads the channel for love, shouted the war cry to prepare for the bridal combat. Enyo laid the foundations of the war for a wedding, and lusty Hymenaios was he that kindled the quarrel for Earth Shaker and Dionysus, he danced into the battle, holding the bronze pike of a Miclean Aphrodite, while he droomed a tune of war on a Phrygian hoboy. For king of satyrs and ruler of the sea, a maiden was the prize. She stood silent, but reluctant to have a foreign wedding with a wooer from the sea, she feared the watery bower of love in the deep waves, and preferred Bacchus, she was like Deonera, who once in that noisy strife for a bride preferred Heracles, and stood there fearing the wedding with a fickle bullhorn river. Heaven unclouded by its own spinning whirl trumpeted a call to war, and sea blue hair armed himself with his Assyrian trident, shaking his maritime pike and pouring a hideous din from a mad throat. Dionysus threatening the sea danced into the fray with vine leaves and Thyasus, seated in the chariot of his mother mountain ranging rear, and round the rim of the Migdonian car was a vine self-grown, which covered the whole body of Bacchus, and girdled its overshadowing clusters under entwined ivy. A lion shaking his neck entwined under the yoke strap scratched the earth's surface with sharp claw, as he let out a harsh roar from snarling lips. An elephant slowly advanced to a spring hard by, striking straight into the ground his firm unbending leg, lapped the rainwater with parched lips and dried up the stream, and as the waters became bare earth, he drove elsewhere the nymph of the spring thirsty and uncovered. Meanwhile, the lord of the waters prepared for conflict. There was confusion among the Nereids, the deities of the waters came from the stretches of the sea to form array. Poseidon's house, the water of the sea, was flogged with long bunches of leaves, the caverns of the mountains were shaken by the trident, and the vines of Lebanon were rooted up. With wild leaps the Thyades threw themselves upon a herd of black cattle of Poseidons, feeding near the sea. One with a touch cut through the back of a glaring bull, another sheared off from its forehead the two stiff projecting horns, one pierced the belly with destroying Thyasus, another slit the whole side of the creature, hey dead the bull sank down and rolled helpless on his back on the ground, as he rolled in the dust with these fresh wounds, one pulled off his hind legs, one tugged at the forefeet, and threw up the two hooves tumbling over and over straight up in the air. Then Dionysus mustered his captains, and made five divisions for the watery conflict. The first line was led by him of the vine, Cilician Oinius, son of Averoithalion, whom he begat near the Tauros of Phyllis, in the open air. The second was led by black hair Helicown, a blonde man with rosy cheeks, and long curls of hair hanging down over his neck. Oinopian led the third, Staphylos stood before the fourth, two sons of a tippling sire, Oinomaus, Melantheus was captain of the fifth, an Indian chief and the son of Oinon the ivy nymph, his mother had wrapped her boy in leafy tips of the sweet-smelling vine for swaddlings, and bathed her son in the winepress teeming with strong drink. Such was the host armed with missiles of ivy which followed Bacchus the vinegod, and when he had armed them, Bacchus called to the host in stirring tones. Fight, Bassarids. When Lyaeos is under arms, let my pipes of horn strike up a warlike tune, answering the booming sound of the conch, let the cymbals of bronze beat a loud noise with double clashings. Let Marin dancing in battle shoot Glaucos with man-breaking Thyasus. Go, tie up the hair of Proteus with ivy, something new for him. Let him leave the Egyptian water of the Farian Sea, and change his sealskins for a speckled fawnskin, and bow his bold neck to me. Let Melicertes fight against drunken Salinos if he can. Teach old forces to leave the seaweedy deeps and dwell in Tomolus holding a Thyasus, and let the old man become a vine grower on land. Let the satyr stand fast and brandish his fennel, and with his countrymen's hands transport thirsty Nerus out of the sea, in wreath Polemon's hair with bonds of vine from newly planted gardens, and bring that charioteer of the sea from the depths of the Isthmian brine to be a servant for Mother Rhea, and to guide her lions with his whip, for I will no longer leave my cousin in the deep, I will behold the host of the spear-conquered sea decked out in the fawn skin. Give symbols to the inexperienced Nereid nymphs, mingle hydriads with bacchants, 
spare only the hospitable house of goddess Thetis, although she is one of the seabrood. Fit the unshod feet of Leucothea in buskins, let Doris appear on dry land and lift my mystic torch along with the reveling Bacontes, let Panopea shake off the seaweed of the deep and wreathe her locks in clustering vipers, let Idathea unwilling receive the rattling tambourine. What harm is there that Galatea should be servant to Dionysus, when she has a passion like his own mad love, that her hands may make a woven robe as a gift for the wedding pomp of Armimone the Queen of Lebanon? No, leave alone the family of Nerus, for I want no handmaids from the sea, or Baroe might be jealous. Let Pan my old mountain ranger, proud with the long branching points on his forehead, press Poseidon with unarmed hand and butt him with sharp horn, strike him full in the chest with those curving prongs, or with a rocky stone, let him break with his hooves the ring of Triton's backbone where his two natures join. Let Glaucos the attendant of brinesoken earth shake be servant to Bacchus, and lift in his hands the rattling symbols of Rhea which hang by a strap beside his neck. Not for Baroe alone I fight, but for the native city of my bride. Earth shaker must not strike it, but it must stand unshaken, although it lies in the sea and he is lord of the sea, he must not destroy it with his trident because I will face him in arms, it is as much one as the other, if the sea is its neighbor, it has ten thousand plants of mine, a sign of my victory, for close to the shore, are my vineyards. But as for palace of old, so for the appeal of Bacchus, may a new sea crops come as umpire, that the vine may be celebrated as city sustainer, like the olive. Then I will make the city of another shape, I will not leave it near the sea, but I will cut off rugged hills with my fennel and dam up the deep brine beside Burritos, making the water dry land and stony with rocks, and the rough road is smoothed by the sharp thiasus. Come, fight again, the Malones, confident in your constant victory, my fawnskin is red with the newly shed blood of slain giants, the very east still trembles before me, Indian Ares bows his neck to the ground, old Hidaspus shivers, and sheds tears of supplication, tears like his own flood. When I have won my bride of Lebanon after the battle in the sea, I grant one boon to earth shaker the lover. If he will, he may sing a song at my wedding, only let him not look askance at my Baroe. So spoke Dionysus, and sea blue hair replied in threatening tones and mocked at him. I am ashamed to confront you, Dionysus, because you want to fight the swinger of the trident, when you fled from Lycurgos's Polax. Look here, Thetis. Here is a fine return for life and safety that your fugitive Dionysus gives to the hospitable sea. I am not surprised, torchbearer, fire killed your mother when you were born, so you act like the fire. Up, my dear Tritons, help, tie up the Bacontes and make them seafarers. May the symbols that mountain harbored Salinos holds be swallowed up in the sea, may the wave drag him along, may the satyr float on the swelling flood and his ewan pipe toss on the rolling water, may Bassarids lay the bed for me instead of Lyaeos in my watery hall, nay, I want no satyrs, I drag no maenads to the deep, Nereids are better. But let the Mimalones quench their thirst in the sea and drown there, instead of flowing draughts of wine let them drink my salt water. Let many a Bassarid driven by the wet pike of Proteus drift and toss aimlessly on the sea, tripping the dance of death for Lyaeos. Drag down companies of Ethiopians and ranks of Indians as spoil for the Nereids, bring the daughters of nymph Cassiopeia, that tongue of evil, as slaves for Doris in tardy expiation. Let Oceanus banish Viney Sirios from Olympus, the leader of that unresting dance in the winepress, and bathe in his resistless flood the fiery star of Myra. And you, Lydian Bacchus, leave your miserable Thyasus and seek you another weapon, put off your speckled fawn skins, the scanty covering of your limbs. If in that marriage the wing flame of Zeus was your midwife, now fight with fire, O oh fireborn. Now battle with the thunderbolt of your father against the helmsman of the trident, hurl the lightning and wield your father's aegis. No champion Deriades faces you now, this is no contest with Lycurgos, no little Arabian fight, but your adversary is the sea so mighty. Heaven still trembles at my spear of the deep, heaven knows what a battle with the sea is like. Champion Phaethon too in his celestial course felt the point of my trident, when the deep waged formidable war in that starry battle for Corinth. 
the sea rose to the sky, the thirsty Wayne bathed in the ocean, Myra's dog found salt water at hand to bathe in and cooled his hot chin, the deep bottom of the waters was uplifted in towering waves, the dolphin of the sea met the dolphin of the sky amid the lashing surges. As he spoke, he shook with his trident the secret places of the sea, roaring surf and swelling flood flogged the sky with booming torrents of water. The army of the brine took up their wet shields. Under the water beside the brine-soaked manger of Cronion, Melikertes shook the spear of the deep, and yoked the Isthmian team, he slung to the side of the seaborn car the spear of the seafaring king, and scored the back of the water with its triple prong, he yoked the Isthmian team, and the roar of Indian lions resounded along with the neighing of the horses. He drove his watery course, as the car sped, the hoof unwetted, unmoistened, scored only the surface. The broad-bearded triton sounded his note for the mad battle, he has limbs of two kinds a human shape and a different body, green, from loins to head, half of him, but hanging from his trailing wet loins a curving fishtail, forked. So Glaucos yoked beside their manger in the sea the team that travels in the swift gale, and as they galloped along dry foot he touched up the necks of the horses with dripping whip, and chased the satyrs. In the loud sea tumult horned pan, lightly treading upon the untrodden waters and splashing up the brine with his goats who's himself unwetted, skipped about quickly beating the sea with his crook and whistling the tune of war on his pipes, then hearing on the waves the shadow of a counterfeit sound carried by the wind, he ran all over the sea with his hill-ranging feet seeking the other sounds, and so the sea echo produced by his pipes in the wind was hunted itself. Someone else tore up a firm-based island cliff and threw it at the Hydriads, the rock missed the Nereids and shook the hall of Polemon among the seaweed. Proteus left the flood of the Isthmian Sea of Polini, and armed him in a cuirass of the brine, the seal skin. Round him in a ring rushed the swarthy Indians at the summons of Bacchos, and crowds of the woolly-headed men embraced the shepherd of the seals in his various forms. For in their grasp the old man Proteus took on changing shapes, weaving his limbs into many mimic images. He spotted his body into a dappled back panther. He made his limbs a tree, and stood straight up on the earth a self-grown spire, shaking his leaves and whistling a counterfeit whisper to the north wind. He scored his back well with painted scales and crawled as a serpent, he rose in coils squeezing his belly, and with a dancing throb of his curling tail's tip he twirled about, lifted his head and spat hissing from gaping throat and grinning jaws a shooting shower of poison. So from one shadowy shape to another in changing form he bristled as a lion, charged as a boar, flowed as water, the Indian company clutched the wet flood in threatening grasp, but found the pretended water slipping through their hands. So the crafty old man changed into many and varied shapes, as many as the varied shapes of Periclimenos, whom Heracles slew when between two fingers he crushed the counterfeit shape of a bastard bee. Flocks of sea monsters ringed round the old man on his expedition to dry land, water splashed with a heavy roar from the open mouths of the sand-loving seals. Ancient Nerus armed himself with a watery spear, and led his regiment of daughters into the Ewan struggle. With sea-traversing trident he leapt at the elephants, terrible to behold, many a neighboring cliff along the shore toppled sideways under the sea-pike of Nerus. The tribes of Nereids sounded for their sire the cry of battle triumph, unshod, half hidden in the brine, the company rushed raging to combat over the sea. Restless Eno speeding unarmed into strife with the satyrs, fell again into her old madness spitting white foam from her maddened lips. Terrible Panopea also shot through the quiet water flogging the greeny back of a sea lioness. Galatia too the sea nymph lifting the club of her lovesick Polyphemos attacked a wild bacchant. Ego rode unshaken, unwetted, over the water mounted on the back of a seabred pilot fish. As a driver in the circus rounding the post with skill, turns about the near horse to hug the post and lets the off horse follow along on a slackened rein, goading him on and yelling horse lashing threats, he stoops and crouches, resting his knees on the rail, and leans to the side, as he drives a willing horse with the sparing hand of a master, and a little touch of the whip, as he turns his face casting an eye behind while he watches the car of the driver behind. So then the Nereids drove their fishes like swift moving horses about the watery goal of their contest.
Another opposite handling her reins on a dolphin's back peeped out over the water, and moved on her seaborne course as she rode down the quiet sea on the fish in a wild race over the waters, then the mad dolphin traveling in the sea half visible cut through his fellow dolphins. The rivers came roaring into the battle with Dionysus, encouraging their lord, and Oceanos gave a watery bellow from his overflowing throat while Poseidon's trumpet sounded to tell of the coming strife, the deeps rounded into a swell rallying to the trident. Myrtoan hurried up to Icarian, Sardinian came near Hesperian, Iberian with swelling waves rolled along to Celtic, Bosporan ever still mingled his curving stream with both his familiar seas, the deeps of the Ionian Sea rolling with the storm wind beat together upon the streams of Aegean, and the wild Adriatic brine rose high as the clouds and in towering waves beat on the feet of the raging Sicilian. Libyan Narus caught up his conch under the water by Seates, and boomed on his sea trumpet. Then one rising from the surge and stepping on land rested his left foot on a rock, and with right broke off the top of the cliff with earth-shaking tread and hurled it at a maenad's inviolate head and Melicertis lunging at Dionysus with his trident of the sea went madly along in leaps like his mother's. Companies of Bassarids marched to battle. One shaking the untidy clusters of her tresses to and fro, armed herself with raging madness for battle with the waters, driven wildly along with restless dancing feet. One whose home was in the Samothracian cavern of the Carberoi, skipped about the peaks of Lebanon crooning the barbarous notes of Corybantian tune. Another from Tomolus on a lioness newly whelped, having wreathed snakes in her own manly hair, a Myonian mimalan unveiled, bellowed and set her foot on the lofty slope, with foam on her lips like the sea foam. Salinoi sputtering drops of Cilician wine dew equipped themselves as riders of Migdonian lions, and danced with a din against the crowd from the sea, brandishing in their hands their viny war pole, as they stretched their hands over the lion's necks and plucked at the mane and boldly checked their furious mounts by this bristly bridle. A Salinos tore off a roof from a rocky hole and attacked Polemon, and drove Eno wandering through the water with his ivy spear. One fought with another, a Bacchant did not shrink but cast a Thyasus hurtling against the trident, she, a Bacchant and a woman, Nerus defending the sea came on land to fight with foaming arms against a rock-loving pan, a mountain back and chased the god of Pellini with blood dripping ivy, but did not shake him. Glaucos assailed Dionysus, but Maron shot his thyasus at him and shook him off. A cloud high elephant with earth shaking motions of his limbs stamped about his stiff legs with massive unbending knee, and attacked an earth bedding seal with his long snout. Satyrs also bustled about in dancing tumult, trusting to the horns on their bull heads while the straight tail draggled from their loins for a change as they hurried. Hosts of Salinoi rushed along, and one of them with his two legs straddling across the back of a ball, squeezed out a tune on his two pipes tied together. A Migdonian back and rattled her pair of cymbals, with hair fluttering in the brisk winds, she flogged the bowed neck of a wild bear against a monster of the deep, and the wild panther of the mountains was driven by a thyasus goad. One Bassarid possessed with mind-robbing throes of madness skipped over the sea with unwetted feet, as if she were dancing upon Poseidon's head, she stamped on the waves, threatened the silent sea, flogged the deaf water with her thyasus, that Bassarid who never sank, from her hair blazed fire self-kindled over her neck and burnt it not, a wonder to behold. Samothy sorrowful on the beach beside the sea, watching the turmoil of sea battling Dionysus, uttered the dire trouble of her heart in terrified words. O Lord Zeus! If thou hast gratitude for Thetis and the ready hands of Briarius, if thou hast not forgot again the protector of thy laws, save us from Bacchus in his madness. Let me never see Glaucos dead and Nerus a slave. Let not Thetis in floods of tears be servant to Lyaeos, let me not see her a slave to Bromius, leaving the deep, to look on the Lydian land, lamenting in one agony Achilles, Peleus, Pyrrhus, grandson, husband, and son. Pity the groans of Leucothea, whose husband took their son and slew him, the heartless father butchered his son with the blade of his murderous knife. She spoke her prayer, and Zeus on high heard her in heaven. He granted the hand of Baroe to earth shaker, and pacified the rival's quarrel. For from heaven to check the bride battle yet undecided came threatening thunderbolts round about Dionysus. The vine god wounded by the arrow of love still craved the maiden, 
but Zeus the father on high stayed him by playing a tune on his trumpet of thunder, and the sound from his father held back the desire for strife. With lingering feet he departed, with heavy pace, turning back for a last gloomy look at the girl, jealous, with shamed ears, he heard the bridal songs of Armimoni in the sea. The syrinx sounding from the brine proclaimed that the rites were already half done. Narusa's Armimoni's chamberlain showed the bridal bed, shaking the wedding torches, the fire which no water can quench. Phorsis sang a song, with equal spirit Glaucos danced and Melikertis romped about. And Galatia twangled a marriage dance and restlessly twirled in capering step, and she sang the marriage verses, for she had learnt well how to sing, being taught by Polyphemos with a shepherd's syrinx. After celebrating Baroe's wedding in the sea, her bridegroom Earth Shaker was a friend to her native place. He gave her countrymen victory in war on the sea as a precious treasure in return for his bride. It was a wealthy wedding. Arabian Nerus brought to the bridey chamber in the deeper worthy gift of love, a clever work of Hephaestus, Olympian ornaments, for the bride, necklace and earrings and armlets he brought and offered, all that the Lemnian craftsmen had made for the Nereids with inimitable workmanship in the waves, there in the midst of the brine he shook his fiery anvil and tongs under water, blowing the enclosed breath of the bellows with mimic winds. And when the furnace was kindled the fire roared in the deep unquenched. Nerus then brought these gifts in great variety. But Persian Euphrates gave the girl the web spinner's embroidered wares, Iberian Rhine brought gold, old Pactolos came bringing the like offerings from his opulent mines, with cautious hands, for he feared the Lydian master, Bacchus his king, and he feared Rhea his neighbor, the city holder of his country Mygdonia. Eridanos brought shining gifts, amber from the Heliad trees that trickle riches, and from the silver rock, all the metals of Strymon and all that Gudes has were brought as a marriage gift to Armimoni by sea blue hair. And so the dances were over, and Earth Shaker was happy in the bridey chamber beneath the waters, but Lyaeos never smiled, and his brother Eros came to console him in his jealous mood. Dionysus, why do you still bear a grudge against the cestus that makes marriages? Baroe was no proper bride for Bacchus, but this marriage of the sea was quite fitting, because I joined the daughter of Aphrodite of the sea to a husband whose path is in the sea. I have kept a daintier one for your bridey chamber, Ariadne, of the family of Minos and your kin. Leave Armimoni to the sea, a nobody, one of the family of the sea herself. You must leave the mountains of Lebanon and the waters of Adonis and go to Phrygia, the land of lovely girls, there awaits you a bride without salt water, or of Titan stocks Thrace the friend of brides will receive you, with a wreath of victory ready and a bride's bower, thither Pellini also the Shakespeare summons you, beside whose chamber I will crown you with a wedding wreath for your prowess, when you have won Aphrodite's delectable wrestling match. So while Eros spoke to his love-mad brother Bacchus, then he flapped his whizzing fiery wings, and up the sham bird flew in the skies travelling until he came to the house of Zeus. And from the Assyrian gulf Dionysus went daintily clad into the Lydian land along the plain of Pactolos, where the dark water is reddened by the gold gleaming mud of wealthy lime, he entered Maonia, and stood before Rhea his mother, offering royal gifts from the Indian sea. Then leaving the stream of this river of deep riches, and the Phrygian plain, and the nation of soft living men, he planted his vine on the northerly plain, and passed from the towns of Asia to the cities of Europe. Book 44. The forty-fourth web I have woven, where you may see maddened women, and the heavy threat of Pentheus. Already he had passed the Dorlantian tribe of Illyrian soil, and the plain of Haemonia, and the Pelian peak, and was nearing Hellas, there he established dances on the Onian plain. The shepherd hearing the tune of the drooling pipes formed congregations for Pan at Tanagra. A fountain bubbled on the spot where the horse's wet hoofs scratched the surface of the ground and made a hollow for the water which took its name from him. Arsipos danced breathing fiery streams, as he swept his floods along and twirled his waters. Dursi danced, spouting her whirling waters along with her father Ismenos. At times a hamadryad shot out of her clustering foliage and half showed herself high in a tree, and praised the name of Dionysus cluster laden, and the unshod nymph of the spring sang in tune with her. The noise of the raw cowhide resounded over the mountains, 
and reached the ears of irreconcilable Pentheus. The impious king was angry with wine god Bacchus, and he armed a hostile host, calling to the people to bar the portals of the seven-way city. One by one they were shut, but the locks of the gates suddenly opened of themselves, in vain the servants resisted the winds of heaven and set the long bars at each gate. There no gate warden could check a bacchant if he saw her, but shielded spearmen trembled before old Salenoi unarmed, disregarding often the threats of their clamoring king, they danced with single-throated acclaim, with their well-made oxides they danced the round in shield-shaking leaps, the very picture of the noisy corribants. Terrible bears growled madly in the hills, the panther gnashed her teeth and leapt high in the air, the lion in playful sport gave a gentle roar to his comrade lioness. Already the palace of Pentheus began of itself to tremble and quake, and started from its immovable foundations all about, the gatehouse quivered and sprang up with earth-shaking throbs, foretelling the trouble to come. The stone altar of Onkay and Athena tottered of itself, that which Cadmus had built, when with slow convincing movement the heifer's hoof sank, to bid him build a wall and found a city, over the divine image of the city-holding goddess, God sent sweat beaded in drops of itself, bringing fear to the people, from head to foot the statue of Ares ran with gore, telling of things to come. The inhabitants also were shaken. The mother of boastful Pentheus quivered with fear, mad with anxiety, remembering that bloody dream of old with its prophecy of bitterness, how once, after Pentheus had seized his father's sovereignty, Agave slumbering on her bed had been terrified all night in her sleep, when the unreal phantom of a dream had leapt through the gate of horn which never deceives, and whispered in her sleepy ear. For she thought she saw Pentheus a dainty dancer on the road, his manly form dressed up in a woman's robe, throwing to the ground the purple robe of kings, bearing the scepter no longer but holding a thiasus. Again, Cadmian Agave thought she saw him perched high up in a shady tree, round the lofty trunk where sat bold Pentheus was a circle of wild beasts, furiously pushing to root up the tree with the dangerous teeth of their hard jaws. The tree shook, and Pentheus came tumbling over and over of himself, and when he dumped down, mad she bears tore him, a wild lioness leapt in his face and tore out an arm from the joint, then the mad raging monster set one paw on the throat of Pentheus cut in two, and tore through his gullet with her sharp claws, and lifted the bloody head in her ferocious paw piteously lacerated, and showed it to Cadmus, who saw it all, swinging it about as she spoke in human voice these wicked words. I am your daughter, the slayer of wild beasts. I am the mother of Pentheus, happiest of men, your Agave, the loving mother. See what a beast I have killed. Accept this head, the first fruits of my valor, after victorious slaughter of the lion. Such a beast Eno my sister never slew, or Tonoe never slew. Hang up before your hall this keepsake from Agave your doughty daughter. Such was the horrible vision that pale Agave saw. Then after she had shaken off sleep's wing, trembling with terror, in the morning she called in the seer, Cariclo's son, and revealed to him her dream, the bloody prophecy of things to come. Teresias the diviner bade her sacrifice a male bull to help against the bloody dream, at the altar where men call upon Zeus the protector, beside the trunk of a tall pine tree where sit hair and spreads his lofty head, he told her to offer a female sheep to the hammer dryad nymphs in the thicket. He knew the beast as human, he knew Agave hunting the fruit of her own womb, the struggle that killed her son, the head of Pentheus, but he concealed in wordless silence the deceptive vision of victory in the dream, that he might not provoke the heavy wrath of Pentheus his king. Agave the tender mother obeyed the wise old man, and went to the lofty hill together with Cadmus while Pentheus followed. At the horns of the altar Cadmus a Generides made one common sacrifice to Zeus and the Hadriads, female and male together, sheep and horned bull, where stood the grove of Zeus full of mountain trees, he lit the fire on the altar to do pleasure to the gods, and did sacrifice to both. When the flame was kindled, the rich savour was spread abroad with the smoke in fragrant rings. When the bull was slaughtered, a jet of bloody dew spouted straight up of itself and stained the hands of Agave with red blood. A serpent crept with its coils, surrounding the throat of Cadmus like a garland, twining and trailing a crooked swollen collar about it in a lacing circle but doing no harm, the gentle creature crept round his head like a trailing chaplet, and his tongue licked his chin all over dribbling the friendly poison from open mouth, 
quite harmless, a female snake girdled the temples of Harmonia like a wreath of clusters in her yellow hair. Then Cronion turned the bodies of both snakes into stone, because Harmonia and Cadmus were destined to change their appearance and to assume the form of stone snakes, at the mouth of the snake-breeding Illyrian Gulf. Then Agave returned home with her son and her father, having a new fear besides the fear of the dream. Such was the vision which Agave had seen, and remembering this ominous dream the fond mother was shaken with fear. Already rumor was flying about the seven-gated city proclaiming the rites of dance-weaving Dionysus. No one there was throughout the city who would not dance. The streets were garlanded with spring leafage by the country people. The chamber of Semele, still breathing sparks of the marriage thunders, was shaded by self-growing bunches of green leaves, which intoxicated the place with sweet odors. King Pentheus swelled with arrogance and jealousy to see the terrible wonders of Bacchus in so many shapes. Then Pentheus uttered proud boasts and empty threats to his servants in these insulting words. Bring here my Lydian slave, that womanish vagabond, to serve the table of Pentheus at his dinner, let him fill his wine beaker with some other drink, milk or some sweet liquor, I will flog my mother's sister Autonoe with retributive strokes of my hands, and we will crop the uncropped locks of Dionysus. Throw to the winds his tinkling cymbals, and the Birecuntian din and you and tambourines of Rhea. Drag hither the mad Bassarids, drag the Bacchants hither, the handmaids who attend on Bromius, hurl them into the watery beds of Ismenos here in Thebes, mingle the Naiads with the Onian river nymphs their mates, let old Sithairn receive Hadriads to join his own Hadriads instead of Lyaeos. Bring fire, men, for by the law of vengeance I will throw Bacchus into the fire, if he came out of the fire, Zeus tamed Semele, I will destroy Dionysus. If he would like to try my thunder also, he shall learn what fire I have from earth. For my fire has hotter sparks to match the heavenly fire. Today I will make the viney one a scorchy one. If he lift his thiasus and give battle, he shall learn what kind of a spear I have from earth. I will destroy him without a wound in foot or flank, breast or belly. I will not cut off the two crooked horns from his bull-horned head with a pole-axe, I will not cut through his neck, I will pierce the fork of his thigh with a blow from a spear of bronze, because of his lies about the thigh of great Zeus, and heaven as his home. Instead of the palace of Zeus, instead of his gatehouse, I will send him down to Hades, or make him roll himself helpless into the waves of his menos to hide, we can do without the sea. I will not receive a mortal man as a bastard god. If I dare say it, I will deny my own breeding, like Dionysus. I have not in me the blood of mortal Cadmus, but my father is the chief of stars, Helios begat me, not Achaean, Selene brought me forth, not Agave, I am the offspring of Cronides and a citizen of heaven the sky with its wandering stars is my home, so forgive me, Thebes. Pallas is my concubine, immortal Hebe my consort. Queen Hera gave me the breast after Ares, divine Leto brought me forth after Phoebus. I will woo Artemis, who wants me, she does not run from me as she did from Phoebus, the wooer of her maidenhood, because she feared blame for wedding with a brother. And if the heavenly flame did not burn your semele, Cadmus did burn his house for his daughter's shame, and gave the name of lightning to the earthly fire he kindled, called the flame of torches the spark of the thunderbolt. When the king had spoken, his men of war mustered in arms to fight the empty winds, there was an infinite host in the pinewood, seeking the tracks of Lyaeos ever unseen. But while Pentheus was giving his commands to the people, Dionysus waited for darksome night, and appealed in these words to the circling moon in heaven. O daughter of Helios, moon of many turnings, nurse of all. O Selene, driver of the silver car. If thou art Hecate of many names, if in the night thou dost shake thy mystic torch in brand-carrying hand, come night wanderer, nurse of puppies because the nightly sound of the hurrying dogs is thy delight with their mournful whimpering. If thou art stag-hunter Artemis, if on the hills thou dost eagerly hunt with fawn-killing Dionysus, be thy brother's helper now. For I have in me the blood of ancient Cadmus, and I am being chased out of Thebes, out of my mother Semele's home. A mortal man, a creature quickly perishing, an enemy of God, persecutes me. 
as a being of the night, help Dionysus of the night, when they pursue me. If thou art Persephone, whipperin of the dead, and yours are the ghosts which are subservient to the throne of Tartaros, let me see Pentheus a dead man, and let Hermes thy musterer of ghosts lull to sleep the tears of Dionysus in his grief. With the Tartarian whip of thy Tisiphone, or furious Megara, stop the foolish threats of Pentheus, this son of earth, since implacable Hera has armed a late-born titan against Lyaeos. I pray thee, master this impious creature, to honor the Dionysus who revived the name of primeval Zagreus. Lord Zeus, do thou also look upon the threat of this madman. Hear me, father and mother. Lyaeos is contemned, let thy marriage lightning be the avenger of Semele. To this appeal bull-face Mena answered on high. Night illuminating Dionysus, friend of plants comrade of Mena, look to your grapes, my concern is the mystic rites of Bacchus, for the earth ripens the offspring of your plants when it receives the dewy sparkles of unresting Selene. Then do you, dancing Bacchus, stretch out your thiasus and look to your offspring, and you need not fear a race of puny men, whose mind is light, whose threats the whips of the Furies repress perforce. With you I will attack your enemies. Equally with Bacchus, I rule distracted madness. I am the Bacchic Mena, not alone because in heaven I turn the months, but because I command madness and excite lunacy. I will not leave unpunished earthly violence against you. For already Lycurgos who threatened Dionysus, so quick of knee once, who sharply harried the Maenads, is a blind vagabond who needs a guide. Already over the stretches of Erythrian reedbeds a crowd of Indians lie dead here and there, dumb witnesses to your valour, and foolish Dariades has been swallowed up in the unwilling stream of his father Hidaspus, pierced with an ivy spear, yes, he fled and fell into the sad stream of his despondent father. The Tyrsenians learnt your strength, when the standing mast of their ship was changed, and turned into a vine stock of itself, the sail spread into a shady canopy of leaves of garden vine and rich bunches of grapes, the forestays whistled with clumps of serpents hissing poison, your enemies threw off their human shape and intelligent mind and changed their looks to senseless dolphins wallowing in the sea, still they make revel for Dionysus even in the surge, skipping like tumblers in the calm water. Indian Orontes also is dead, struck by your sharp Thyasus, and drowned in the Assyrian floods, still fearing the name of Bacchus even under the waters. Such was the answer of the golden rain deity to Bromius. But while Bacchus yet conversed with circling Mena, even then Persephone was arming her furies for the pleasure of Dionysus Zagreus, and in wrath helping Dionysus his later born brother. Then at the grim nod of underworld Zeus, the furies assailed the palace of Pentheus. One leapt out of the gloomy pit swinging her Tartarian whip of vipers, she drew a stream from Cositos and water from Styx, and drenched Agave's rooms with the infernal drops as if with a prophecy of tears and groanings for Thebes, and the deity brought the Datic knife from Attica, which long before murdered Itilos, when his mother Procne with heart like a lioness, helped by murderous Philomele, cut with steel the throat of the beloved child of her womb, and served up his own son for cannibal Terius to eat. This knife, the channel of bloodshed, the fury held, and scratching up the dust with her pernicious fingernails she buried the attic blade among the hill-grown roots of a tall fir, among the maenads, where Pentheus was to die headless. She brought the blood of Gorgon Medusa, scraped off into a shell fresh when she was newly slain, and smeared the tree with the crimson Libyan drops. This is what the mad fury did in the mountains. Now with darkling steps night illuminating Dionysus entered the palace of Cadmus, wearing the head of a bull, cracking Pan's cronian whip of madness, and put madness into the unbridled wife of Aristos. He called Otonoe and cried in wild tones. Otonoe, happier far than Semele, for by your son's late marriage you can rival Olympus itself. You have seized the honours of the skies, now Artemis has got Actaeon for her dainty leman, and Selene Endymion. Actaeon never died, he never took the shape of a wild creature, he had no antlered horn, of a dappled deer, no bastard shape, no false body, he saw no hounds hunting and killing him. No, these were all herdsmen's lies, empty-minded fables of malicious tongues about your son's fate, because they hated the bridegroom of an unwedded goddess. I know where this invention came from, 
women are jealous about marriage and love in others. Come, leap up with stormy shoe. Make haste, speed into the mountains. There you shall see Actaeon beside Lyaeos on the hunt, with Artemis not far off, woven nets in his hands and hunting boots on his feet, fingering his quiver. Happier far than Semele, or Tonoe. For a goddess came to you for marriage, the goddess became your goddaughter, the archeress herself. More blessed than that mother Eno proud of her son, for your son got the bed of a goddess, which proud Otos never got. Bold Orion was never bridegroom of the archeress. Your Cadmus is young again with joy for your son's bride, and holds revel beside their bridal bed in the mountains, with his snowy hair fluttering in the airy breeze. Wake up, and make one in the marriage company, happy mother. This is a proper love, for holy Artemis has a brother's son for bridegroom, not a stranger husband. And when the goddess who hated marriage brings forth a child, you shall dandle the son of the chaste archeress in your cherishing arms and make Agave jealous at the sight. Why should not the huntress be pleased to bear a son in her bridal chamber, a hunter himself and a marksman, like Actaeon, or Cyrene who loved the mountains, and let him ride behind his mother's team of swift deer. Book 45. See also the 45th, where Pentheus binds the bull instead of strong horn Lyaeos. When Bromius had spoken, the nymph rushed from the house possessed by joyous madness, that she might see Actaeon as bridegroom seated beside the archeress, along with her as she hastened swift as the wind sped Agave to the mountain, with staggering steps, unveiled, frenzied, the sting of the Cronian whip flogging her wits, while she poured out these heedless words from her maddened lips. I rebel against that ridiculous Pentheus, to teach him what a bold Amazon, is Agave the daughter of Cadmus. I too am chockful of valor. If I like, I will tame all Pentheus even with my bare hands, and I will destroy his well-armed host with no weapon in my hand. I have a Thyasus, Ashplant I want not, no spear I shake, with viny lance I strike the spear-shaking man. I wear no corslet, but I will tame the man who wears the best. Shaking my cymbals and my tambour which I beat on both sides I magnify the son of Zeus, I honor not Pentheus. Give me the Lydian drums, why do ye delay, ye hours of festival? I will come to the hills, where maenads, where women of like years, join the hunt of hunting Lyaeos. O Dionysus, I am jealous of Cyrene Lion Slayer. Spare me Bromius, O thou rebel against heaven, spare him, O Pentheus. I will come at speed into the hills, that I too may sing Uios and twirl a dancing foot. No longer I refuse the rites of great god Bacchus, no longer I hate the Basarids dance, but I too stand in awe of Dionysus, offspring of the bed incorruptible, bathed by thunderbolts from Zeus on high. Swift will my shoes go, as I carry nets beside the archeress, no longer the skeins of Athena. So crying she flew away, a new skipping the melon, practicing the ewan leap of the winepress, calling you oi tobaccos and lording Thyone, I, and she called to Semele, wife of Zeus the highest, and loudly sang the brightness of those bridal lightnings. Then there was great dancing on the hills. The rocks resounded all about, a thousand new noises rolled round the land of seven gate Thebes, the one concordant chorus of the singers filled Sithern with heavy echoing din, the dewy salt sea roared, one could see trees making merry, and hear voices from the rocks. Many a maiden ran out of her room to foot it in the dance, when the pipe of horn tootled through its drilled holes, and the double blows on the raw hide made the girls go mad, and drove them from their well-built halls to be bacchants in the wilderness of the lofty mountains. Many a maiden driven crazy shook her hair loose and rushed with stormy shoe from her chamber, leaving loom comb and Athena with her craft, cast away the veil unheeded from her hair, mingled with bassarids, and lo! Ionian turned bacchant. Tiresias built an altar to protecting Dionysus and sacrificed there, that he might prevent the defiance of Pentheus and avert the wrath of Lyaeos yet unappeased, but his prayers were in vain, since the thread of fate was there. The wise seer called Semele's father also, that they might share the dance of Dionysus. With heavy feet ancient Cadmus danced, crowning his snowy hair with Onian ivy, and Tiresias his old comrade wheeled a sluggish foot, beating a Phrygian revel step for Mygdonian Dionysus, 
So he joined the eager efforts of Cadmus hastening to the dance, and supported his old arm on a pious fennel stalk. Pentheus the hothead, saw old Tiresias and Cadmus there together, and looking askance at them cried out. Why this madness, Cadmus? What god do you honor with this revel? Tear the ivy from your hair, Cadmus, it defiles it. And drop that fennel of Dionysus, the deluder of men's wits. Take up the bronze of Athena one sire, which makes men sane. Foolish Tiresias to wear that garland. Throw these leaves to the winds, that false chaplet on your hair. Take up rather the Ismenian laurel of your own Phoebus, instead of Athiasus. I respect your old age, I honor the hoary locks that witness to the years of your life, as old as theirs. But if this old age and this your hair did not save you, I had twisted galling bonds about your hands and sealed you up in a gloomy cell. I understand what is in your mind. You have a grudge against Pentheus, and you make a man into a bastard god by lying oracles, that Lydian impostor has bribed you by promising plenty of gold from the famous Golden River. But you will say, Bacchus has invented the wine fruit, yes, and what wine always does is to drag drunken men into lust, what vine does is to excite an unstable man's mind to murder. But he wears the shape and garments of Zeus his father, golden robes are what Lord Zeus wears, not fawn skins, when he thunders in the heights among the blessed, when Ares fights with men, he carries a spear of bronze, not a thiasus of vine leaves in his hand, Apollo is not horned with bull's horns. Was it a river that wedded Semele? Did the bride bear a horned bastard to her bull-horned husband? But you will say, Bright Eyes Pallas Athena marches to battle with men, holding the spear and shield that were born with her. Then you should hold the aegis of your father Cronides. When Pentheus ended, the vice seer replied, Why do you persecute Dionysus, begotten by Zeus the Lord on high? whom Cronides brought forth from a pregnant thigh, whom Rhea mother of the gods nursed with her cherishing milk, who half complete, with a whiff of his mother still about him, was bathed by lightnings which burnt him not. This is the only rival to Demeter mother of harvest, with his fruit of grapes against the corn. Nay, beware of the wrath of Bromius. About impiety, I will tell you, if you wish, my son, a Sicilian story. Sons of the Tiersenians once were sailing on or possibly his hair, one way of dressing the hair was called the horn. The sea, wandering mariners, murderers of the stranger, pirates of the rich, stealing from every side the flocks of sheep near the coast. Many an old sailor man from the ships which they captured here and there was rolled half dead to his fate in the waters, many a stout shepherd fighting for his herd dyed his grey hairs in his red blood. If any merchant then sailed the seas, if any Phoenician with sea purple stuffs from Sidonian parts for sale, the Tyssenian pirate caught him suddenly out at sea, and set upon his vessels laden with riches, and so many a man lost infinite cargo without a penny paid, and the Phoenician was carried to Sicilian Arethusa in chains, far from home, his fortune stolen and gone. But Dionysus disguised himself in a deceptive shape, and outwitted the Tyssenians. He put on a false appearance, like a lovely boy with smooth chin, wearing a gold necklace upon his neck, about his temples was a chaplet shining with self-sped gleams of a light unquenchable, broad green emeralds and the Indian stone, a scintillation of the bright sea. His body was clad in robes, streaked with dye from the Tyrian shell more brilliant than the circling dawn, when she has just been marked with lines. He stood on the brow of the shore, as if he wished to embark in their ship. They leapt ashore and captured the radiant son of Thyone in his guile, they stripped him of his possessions, and tied Dionysus's hands fast with ropes running behind his back. Suddenly the lad grew tall with wonderful beauty, as a man with horned head rising up to Olympus, touching the canopy of aerial clouds, and with booming throat roared as loud as an army of nine thousand men. The long horses became trailing snakes, changed into live serpents twisting their bodies about, the stay ropes hissed, up into the air a horned viper ran along the mast to the yard in trailing coils, near the sky, the mast was a tall cypress with a shade of green leaves, ivy sprang up from the mast box and ran into the sky wrapping its tendrils about the cypress of itself, the back stem popped out of the sea round the steering oars all heavy with bunches of grapes.
over the laden poop, poured a fountain of wine bubbling the sweet drink of Dionysus. All along the decks wild beasts were springing up over the prow, bulls were bellowing, a lion's throat let out a fearsome roar. The Tyrsenians shrieked and rushed wildly about goaded with fear. Plants were sprouting in the sea, the rolling waves of the waters put out flowers, the rose grew there, and reddened the rounded foaming swell upon it as if it were a garden, lilies gleamed in the surge. As they beheld these counterfeit meadows their eyes were bewitched. The place seemed to be a hill thick with trees, and a woodland pasturage, companies of countrymen and shepherds with their sheep, they thought they saw a tuneful herdsman playing a tune on his shepherd's pipes, they thought they heard the melody from the loud pipes holes, and saw land while still sailing upon the boundless sea, then deluded by their madness they leapt into the deep and danced in the quiet water, now dolphins of the sea, for the shape of the men was changed into the shape of fish. So you also, my son, should beware of the resourceful anger of Lyaos. But you will say, I have mighty strength, I have in my nature the blood of the terrible giants that sprang of themselves from the sown teeth. Then avoid the divine hand of Dionysus giant slayer, who once beside the base of Tyrsenian Peleros smashed Alpus, the son of earth who fought against gods, battering with rocks and throwing hills. No wayfarer then climbed the height of that rock, for fear of the raging giant and his row of mouths, and if one in ignorance travelled on that forbidden road whipping a bold horse, the son of earth spied him, pulled him over the rock with a tangle of many hands, entombed man and colt in his gullet. Often some old shepherd leading his sheep to pasture along the wooded hillside at midday was gobbled up. In those days Melodius Pan never sat beside herds of goats or sheep goats playing his tune on the assembled reeds, no imitating echo returned the sounds of his pipes, but prattler as she was, silence sealed those lips which were wont to sound with the pipe of Pan never silent, because the giant then oppressed all. No cowherd then came, no band of woodmen cutting timbers for a ship troubled the nymphs of the trees, their age mates, no clever shipwright clamped together a barge, the wood riveted car that travels the roads of the sea, until Bacchus on his travels passed by that peak, shaking his ewe and Thyasus. As Lyaeus passed, the huge sun of earth high as the clouds attacked him. A rock was the shield the Alps in some way, the syllable Alpus found in other place names. Upon his shoulders, a hilltop was his missile, he leapt on Bacchus, with a tall tree which he found near for a pike, some pine or plane tree to cast at Dionysus. A pine was his club, and he pulled up an olive spire from the roots to whirl for a quick sword. But when he had stripped the whole mountain for his long shots, and the ridge was bare of all the thick shady trees, then Bacchus Thyasus Wild sped his own shot whizzing as usual to the mark, and hit this towering Alpus full in the wide throat, right through the gullet went the sharp point of the greeny spear. Then the giant pierced with the sharp little Thyasus rolled over half dead and fell in the neighboring sea, filling the whole deep hollowed abyss of the bay. He lifted the waters and deluged Typhaon's rock, flooding the hot surface of his brother's bed and cooling his scorched body with a torrent of water. Nay, my son, be careful, that you too may not see what the sons of Tyrsenia saw, what the bold son of earth saw. He spoke, but could not convince, and so with undaunted shoe he hurried to the high mountains with Cadmus, that he might share the dance. But Pentheus in flashing helm, shield on arm, cried to his armed warriors. My servants, make haste through the city and the depth of the woods, bring me here in heavy chains that weakling vagabond, that flogged by the repeated lashes of Pentheus he may cease to bewitch women with his drugged potion, and bend the knee instead. Bring back also out of the hills my fond mother Agave now gone mad, separate her from the sleepless wandering dance, drag her by the hair now snoodless in her frenzy. At this command, Pentheus's men with swift foot ran to the rugged ridge of leafy woodland seeking the tracks of hill-ranging Dionysus. With difficulty the soldiers found the Thyasus maddened god near a lonely rock, they rushed upon him and wound straps about Bromius's hands, binding him fast, that is how they meant to imprison invincible Dionysus. But he disappeared, gone in a flash, untraceable, on his winged shoes. The men stood silent, speechless, cowed by divine compulsion, shrinking before the wrath of Lyaeus unseen, terrified. 
and Bacchus in the likeness of a soldier with shield in hand, seized a wild bull by the horn, making as if he were one of the servants of Pentheus, crying out upon this false-horned Dionysus. He put on a look of rage and came near to mad Pentheus where he sat, and mocked at the proud boasts of the frenzied king as he spoke unsmiling these deceitful threatening words. This is the man, your majesty, who has sent your agave mad. This is the man who covets the royal throne of Pentheus. Take this horned vagabond Bacchus full of tricks, bind in galling fetters the pretender to your throne, and beware of the bull's horns of Dionysus's head, or he may catch you and pierce you with the long point of his horn. When Bromius had finished, God-defiant Pentheus uttered reckless words, his mind being possessed by the delirium of Bromius. Bind him, bind him, the robber of my throne. This is the enemy of my scepter, this is he that comes coveting the royal seat of Semele and her father. A fine thing for me to share my honor with Dionysus, the son of an illicit bed, a bull in human form, with a shape of borrowed glory upon his ox-horned face, whom Semele perhaps mothered for a bull, like another Pasiphae, mated with a grazing-horned bedfellow. He spoke, and bound fast the legs of the wild bull in galling shackles. Taking him for Lyaos he led him shackled near the horse's manger, thinking his captive Semele's bold son and no bull. He tied together with ropes the hands of all the ranks of Bassarids, sealed them up in a mouldy dungeon, a vaulted cavern, a house of joyless constraint, whence none could escape, dark as the Sumerians, far from the light of day, these followers of Bromius in the revels, their arms were bound in a clasp of galling straps, chains of bronze were sealed on their legs. But when the time came for the quick turning dance, then danced the maenads. The bacchants like a storm shook loose the wrappings of their straps unbroken and circled quickly in tripping step, rattling a free ewan noise with rhythmic claps, while the turning of their feet broke the thick heavy fetters of bronze round their legs. A heaven-sent radiance filled the dark dungeon of the Bassarids, diffused over the gloomy roof, the doors of the darksome den opened of themselves, the jailers were stupefied at the cries and the ferocious foaming teeth of the Bassarids, and their leaping feet, and fled in terror. So they escaped and turned their way back to the forest in the lonely hills. One slew a herd of bulls with skin-piercing thiasus, and soiled her hands in the gore, tearing the rough bull's hide with her fingernails. Another cut to pieces a flock of sheep with bloody twigs, not tearing their soft wool, another killed goats, and all were dyed with bloody streams of gore from the slaughtered herd. Another snatched from the father a three-year child, and set it upon her shoulder untrembling, unshaken, unbound, balancing the boy in the wind's charge, there he sat laughing, never falling in the dust. The boy asked the bacchant for milk, thinking it was his mother, and poured her breast, and milky drops ran of themselves to the breasts of the unwedded maiden, she opened her hairy wrap for the hungry boy, and offered a newly flowing teat to his childish lips, so a virgin stilled the boy with an unfamiliar drink. Many forced away newborn cubs from a shaggy-chested lioness and nursed them. Another struck the thirsty soil with the point of a thiasus, the top of the hill split at once, and the hard rock poured out purple wine of itself, or with a tap on the rock fountains of milk ran out of themselves in white streams. Another threw a snake at an oak, the snake coiled round the tree, and turned into moving ivy running round girdling the trunk, just as snakes run their coils round and round. A satyr rushed along carrying a snarling beast, a dangerous tiger which sat on his back, which for all its wild nature did not touch the bearer. One old salinos dragged a boar by the snout and threw the tusked swine up in the air for fun. Another with stormy leaps of his feet in a moment mounted upon a camel's neck, and one jumped on a bull and rode on his back. So much for the mountains, but in music builded Thebes, Bacchus manifested many wonders to all the people. The women danced wildly with staggering feet. With foaming lips. All Thebes was shaken, and sparks of fire shot up from the streets, all the foundations quaked, the immovable gates of the mansions bellowed as if they had throats like a bull, even the unshaken building rumbled in confusion, as if giving voice with a stone trumpet of its own. Yet Dionysus did not abate his wrath. He sent his divine voice into the sky as far as the seven orbits of the stars, bellowing with his own throat like a mad bull. 
He pursued frenzied Pentheus with his witnesses, the fires, and filled the whole house with the blaze. Tongues of fire danced gleaming over the walls right and left with showers of burning sparks, over the king's brilliant robes and the sea-purple stuff about his chest ran spirals of fire which did not burn his garments. Separate streaks of fire went in hot leaps from foot to middle back, across his loins to the top of his backbone and round his neck ran the traveling flashes, often the divine light spat sparks that did not burn on the splendid bed of the earthborn king, the fire dancing about at random. Pentheus seeing this fire moving about of itself roared aloud and called his slaves to help, to bring saving water to drench the place with protective torrents and quench the burning flames. And the rounded cisterns were emptied, bared of water, the fountain of the river great as it was, dried up when those thousands of vessels were dipped in the water. Their trouble was useless, the water did no good, wet floods poured on the fire only made its flames grow hotter still, there was a sound as of the echoing bellow of many bulls under that roof, and the palace of Pentheus resounded with internal thunders. Book 46. See also the 46th, where you will find the head of Pentheus and Agave murdering her son. As soon as Pentheus, that audacious king, understood that the fetters of iron had dropped of themselves from the prisoner's hands, and the Maenads were rushing abroad to the mountain forest, as soon as he knew the crafty plan of unseen Dionysus, restless at once he swelled with violent wrath. Then he saw him returned there, with wreaths of the usual ivy about his head, and the long locks of hair flowing in unkempt trails over his shoulders, and blustered out these wild words from his frenzied throat. I like you for sending that swindler Tiresias to me. Your seer cannot deceive my mind. Tell all that to someone else. How could goddess Rhea refuse her breast to Zeus her own son, and yet nurse the son of Thyone? Ask the cave in the rock of Dicta with its flashing helmets, ask the Corybants too, where little Zeus used to play, when he sucked the nourishing pap of Gota Maltia and grew strong in spirit, but never drank Rhea's milk. You also have a touch of your deceitful mother. Semele was a liar, and Cronides burnt her with his thunders, take care that Cronides does not crush you like your mother. I too have no share of barbaric race in me. I am sprung from primeval Ismenos, not from watery Hydaspus, I know nothing of Dariades, my name is not Lycurgos. Now leave the streams of Dirce and take your satyrs and mad Bacchants with you, use your Thyasus, if you like, to kill another and a younger Orontes among the Assyrians. You are no Olympian offspring of Cronion, for the lightnings cry aloud the shame of your perishing mother, the thunders are witnesses of her illicit bed. Zeus of the rains burnt not Danae after the bed, he carried Europa, the sister of my Cadmus, and kept her unshaken, he did not drown her in the sea. I know that fire from heaven consumed the babe unborn along with the burning mother, and released the bastard fruit of this scorching delivery half-formed, if it did not destroy the babe, because you are innocent of your mother's furtive love of an earthly bedfellow. I believe it as you declare, and unwillingly I will call you son of heavenly Zeus and one not burnt up by the thunder. Now tell me in your turn, and bear true witness, when did their father Zeus ever produce Ares or Apollo from his thigh? If you have in you the blood of Zeus, migrate to the vault of Olympus and live in heaven, leave to Pentheus his native Thebes. You should find another tale to fit the case, something plausible, and mix with your cunning imposture persuasion to enchant the mind, that Cronides brought you forth from his prolific brow as usual. Perhaps it would not be quite so incredible a story that he produced Bacchus too like Pallas from that unwedded brow. I would wish if you had been of the Olympian breed, yes if only Cronian lord on high had got you, that I might hunt the offspring of Zeus and conquer Dionysus, I, called the son of Achaean. At these words the god was indignant, and replied, concealing the weight of a fatal threat deep in his heart. I admire the Celtic land with its barbarous law, where the Rhine tests the pure birth of a young baby, he is judge of a doubtful birth, and knows how to detect the bastard offspring of unknown blood. But my appeal is not to the insignificant stream of that river called Rhine, but I have heralds more trustworthy than rivers, in the thunderbolts. Seek no better testimony than the lightning, Pentheus? The Gaul believes the water, do you believe the testifying fire? I need not the earthly palace of Pentheus, 
The home of Dionysus is his father's heaven. If there were a choice between earth and starry Olympus, tell me I ask, which could you call better yourself, Seven's own heaven or the land of seven gate Thebes? I need not the earthly palace of Pentheus. Only respect the honey dripping bloom of my fruit, do not despise the drink of Dionysus and his vine. War not against Bromius the slayer of Indians, but only one woman, fight if you can only with one man breaking backant. Perhaps the prophetic fates named you well, to foreshow your death. No wonder that Pentheus having the earthborn breed of his ancestor sprung from the soil, should suffer the direful fate of the giants. No wonder that Bacchus too, having the Olympian breed of his race, should play the part of Zeus his giant slaying father. Ask Tiresias who it is you are defying, ask Pytho who it is that slept with Semele, who it is begat Thione's child. And if you are willing to learn the mysteries of dance delighting Bacchus, put off your royal robes, Pentheus, condescend to wear the garments of a woman and become the woman Agave, and let not the women escape you when you hunt them. Or if your hand draws the bow to slay wild beasts, Cadmus will praise you when you join your mother in the hunt. Alone, rival Bacchus, and if it be lawful, the archeress, that I may call you a new Actane lion's lair. Put off these arms. My women slay steel-armed warriors with their bare hands, if they conquer with unarmed female onset you clad in armor, which of your people would praise a man outworn in a battle with women? The Basarid fears no feathered shaft, she flees no spear. No, be crafty and secret, disguise your aspect that none may know, and you shall see all the mysteries of dance reaving Dionysus. Thus he persuaded Pentheus, since he lashed the man's mind, and shook him, in the clutches of throbbing madness and distraction. Menno also helped Bromius, attacking Pentheus with her divine scourge, the frenzied reckless fury of distracting Selene joining in displayed many a phantom shape to madden Pentheus, and made the dread son of Achaean forget his earlier intent, while she deafened his confused ears with the bray of her divine avenging trumpet, and she terrified the man. Pentheus entered the house goaded to madness with a desire to see the secrets of Bacchus's congregation. He opened the scented coffers, where lay the women's garments dyed in purple of the Sidonian Sea. He donned the embroidered robe of Agave, bound Autonoe's veil over his locks, laced his royal breast in a rounded handwork, passed his feet into women's shoes, he took a thiasis in hand, and as he walked after the Bacchant's embroidered smock trailed behind his hunting heel. With mimicking feet Pentheus twirled in the dance, full of sweet madness, he rattled the ground with sidelong boot, darting one foot away from another. Unmanning his two hands he shook them in alternate beats, like a dancing woman at play, as drumming a double tune on the two plates of the cymbals, he loosed his long hair to float on the breezes of heaven and struck up a ewan melody of Lydia. You might fairly say you saw a wild back and woman madly rollicking. Yes, and he saw two sons and two cities of Thebes, he thought he could hold a gatehouse of seven gate Thebes, hoisting it upon his untiring shoulders. Round him the people assembled in a ring, climbing one on a round tump of earth, one conspicuous high on a rock, while a third rested an arm over the shoulder of a neighbor and raised his foot on tiptoe above the ground, here one made for some lump sticking out of the earth, another was on a projecting bastion, another watched with slanting eye from the towering ramparts, another hugging a round pillar swarmed up with the flat of his feet, and watched Pentheus waving his thiasis and fluttering his veil, and leaping in the throes of madness. Already he had gone round the walls of Thebes while the portals of the seven gates opened on self-moving pivots, already he had passed the soft waters of dragon-feeding Dursi before the city, with his hair blowing on the wind, and beating mad feet in the circling dance he followed his course behind the vine god. But when he came to the place where the trees were, and the dances and rites of the congregation of Bromius, where also was the hunting of their prickets by the unshod Basarids, then vine god Bacchus was glad, and espied in the mountain forest an ancient fir tree tall as the neighboring rock, which cast a shade with its bushy leaves over the cloud-high hills. With unflinching hand he seized the top of the tree, and dragged it down, down to the ground. Pentheus lay along the ground, and Bacchus let go. The soaring spire, Pentheus clung to the tree that carried him on high, grasped the branches with his hands as they were borne aloft, 
and whirling his legs about this way and that way restlessly, moved lightly like a dancer. Then came the dancing hours for the Basarids. They called to one another and tucked up their robes and threw on the fawn skins. Hill ranging Agave shouted aloud with foam on her lips. Autonoe, let us make haste to the dance of Lyaos, where the hill ranging voice of the familiar pipe is heard, that I may recite the song that Euios loves, that I may learn who first will lead the dance for Dionysus, who will beat whom in doing worship to Lyaos. You're late, you slack dancer, Eno has got there before us. She is no longer an exile in the sea, but here she too comes running from the brine with Melicertes the seafarer, she has come to defend hunted Dionysus, lest impious Pentheus overwhelm Lyaos. Mystics, to the mountains, Ismenian Bacchants, here. Let us celebrate our rites, and match the Lydian Basarids with rival dances, that someone may say, Maynad Agave has beaten Migdonian Mimalan. As the words were spoken, she saw sitting high in a tree, like a savage lion, the mother saw her impious son. She pointed him out to the frenzied Bacchants gathering there, and in the voice of a maniac called her own human son a wild beast. The women thronged round him girdle-wise as he sat amid the leaves, they embraced the trunk with a ring of skillful hands and tried to throw down the tree with Pentheus in it, but Agave threw her two arms about the trunk, and with earth-shaking heave pulled the tree up from its base, roots and all. The tree fell to the ground, and Sithern was bare. Pentheus the audacious king shot through the air of himself with a dancing leap, rolling and tumbling like a diver. At that moment the madness left him which Dionysus had sent to confuse his mind, and he recovered his senses again. He saw fate near him on the earth, and cried in lamentable tones, Cover me, hammer-dried nymphs! Let not Agave my loving mother destroy her son with her own hands. O oh, my mother, cruel mother, cease from this heartless frenzy! How can you call me your son a wild beast? Where is my shaggy chest? Where is my roaring voice? Do you not know me any longer whom you nursed, do not you see any longer? Who has robbed you of sense and sight? Farewell, Sithern, farewell these mountains and trees. Be happy, Thebes, be happy you too, Agave my dear mother and my murderer. See this chin with its young beard, see the shape of a man, I am no lion, no wild beast is what you see. Spare the fruit of your womb, pitiless one, spare your breasts. Pentheus is before you, your nursling. Silence, my voice, keep your tail to yourself, Agave will not hear. But if you kill me to please Dionysus, let no other destroy your son, unhappy one, let not your son be destroyed by the alien hands of Basarids. Such was his prayer, and Agave heard him not, but the terrible women attacked him with one accord, as he rolled in the dust, one pulled on his legs, one seized his right arm and wrenched it out at the joint, Botonoe dragged opposite at the left, his deluded mother set her foot on his chest, and cut through that daring neck as he lay with sharp thyasus, then ran nimble knee with frenzied joy in his murder, and displayed the bloody head to unwelcoming Cadmus. Triumphant in the capture of a lion, as she thought, she cried out these words of madness. Blessed Cadmus, more blessed now I call you. For in the mountains Artemis has seen Agave triumphant with no weapon in her hands, and even if she is queen of the hunt, she must hide her jealousy of your lion-slaying daughter. The dryads also wondered at my work. And the father of our Harmonia, armed with his familiar lance, brazen Ares, wondered full of pride at your child without a spear, casting a thyasus and destroying lions. Pray call the king on your throne, Cadmus, call Pentheus here, that with envious eyes he may see the beast slaying sweat of a weak woman. This way, my men, hang up this head as a votive offering of my victory on the gatehouse of Cadmus. Sister Eno never killed a beast like this. Look here, Autonoe, and bow your neck to Agave. For you have never won glory like mine, the still famous victory of lion-slaying Cyrene, mother of your Aristos and your own godmother, has been put to shame by mine. While she spoke, she lifted her dear burden, but Cadmus hearing the distracted boasts of his exulting daughter, answered in mourning voice and mingled his tears with his words. Ah, 
What a beast you have brought down, Agave my child, one with human reason. What a beast you have brought down, one which your own womb brought forth. What a beast you have brought down, one that Achaean begat. Look upon your lion, one that Cadmus lifted upon his nursing arm when he was still a little tot, held in his joyful arms. Look upon your lion, one that your mother Harmonia often caught up and held to your suckling breast. You search for your son to see your work, how can I call Pentheus, when you hold him in your hands? How can I call your son, whom you have killed in ignorance? Look at your beast, and you will recognize your son. O oh Dionysus! A fine return you bring to Cadmus who reared you. Fine bridal gifts Cronion gave me with Harmonia. They are worthy of Ares and heavenly Aphrodite. Eno is in the sea, Semele was burnt by Cronion, Ortonoe mourns her horned son, and Agave, what misery for Agave. She has killed her only son, her own son untimely, and my Polydorus wanders in sorrow, a banished man. Alone I am left, in a living death. Who will be my refuge, now Pentheus is dead and Polydorus gone? What foreign city will receive me? Curse you, Citern. You have slain those two who should cherish Cadmus in old age, Pentheus is with you, dead, Actaean is buried in your soil. When Cadmus had ended, ancient Citern groaned from his springs and poured forth tears in fountains, the trees lamented, the naiad nymphs chanted dirges. Dionysus was abashed before the hoary head of Cadmus and his lamentations, mingling a tear with a smile on that untroubled countenance, he gave reason back to Agave and made her sane once more, that she might mourn for Pentheus. The mother, herself again with eyes that she could trust, stood a while rigid and voiceless. Then seeing the head of Pentheus dead she threw herself down, and rolled in helpless misery on the ground smearing the dust on her hair. She tore the shaggy skins from her breast and threw down the goblets of Bromius's company, scoring her chest and the cleft between her bare breasts with red scratches. She kissed her son's eyes and his pallid cheeks, and the charming locks of his blood-stained hair, then with bitter lamentation she spoke. Cruel Dionysus, insatiable persecutor of your family, give me back my former madness, for a worse madness possesses me now in my sanity. Give me back that delirium, that I may call my son a wild beast once more. I thought I had struck a beast, I hold a head newly cut from the neck, but no lion's head, it is Pentheus. Autonomy is happy for all her heavy tears, for she mourned Actaean dead, and the mother slew not her son. I alone have become a child murderer. Eno slew not Melicertes or Lurchos, Eno my banished sister, but the father destroyed the son he had begotten. How unhappy I am! Zeus slept with Semele only that I might mourn Pentheus, Zeus the father childed Dionysus from his own thigh, only to destroy the whole family of Cadmus. May Dionysus forgive me, he has destroyed the whole race of Cadmus. Now may even Apollo strike his harp again as before, as at the marriage feast where the gods were guests, as by Harmonia's bed, as in the bridey chamber of my father Cadmus, let him twangle one dirge for Autonomy and Agave both, and chant loudly of Actaean and Pentheus so quickly to perish. What medicine is there for my sorrow, O oh my dearest boy? I have never lifted the marriage torch at your wedding, I have never heard the bridal hymn for your wedded love. What son of yours can I see to comfort me? Would that some other, some bacchant, had destroyed you, not all wretched Agave? Blame not your frenzied mother, ill-fated Pentheus, blame Bacchus rather, Agave is innocent. My hands, dear lad, are dripping with the dew from your shorn neck, the blood from your head has incarnadined all the robe of the mother who shed it. Yes, I beseech you, give me the cup of Bromius, for instead of wine I will pour the blood of my Pentheus as a libation to Dionysus. For you, untimely dead, I will build amid my tears a tomb with my own hands. I will lay in the earth your headless body, and on your monument I will carve these words, Wayfarer, I am the body of Pentheus, the cherishing womb of Agave brought me forth, and the murdering hand of Agave slew her son. So spoke the maddened creature in words of sanity, and while she lamented, Ortonoe spoke with a sorrowful voice of consolation. I envy and desire your unhappiness, 
Agave, for you kiss the sweet face of Pentheus, his lips and his dear eyes and the hair of your son. Sister, I think you happy, even if you the mother slew your own son. But I had no actane to mourn, his body was changed, and I wept over a fawn, instead of my son's head I buried the long antlers of a changeling stag. It is a small consolation to you in your pain, that you have seen your dead son in no alien shape, no fawns fell, no unprofitable hoof, no horn you took up. I alone saw my son as a changing corpse, I lamented an image of alien shaped, dappled and voiceless, I am called mother of a stag and not a son. But I pray to thee, prudish daughter of Zeus, glorify thy Phoebus the begetter of Aristos my husband, and change my mortal shape to a deer, do grace to Apollo. Give unhappy Autonomy also as a prey to the same dogs as Actane, or to your own hounds, let sit here and see the mother torn by dogs even after the sun, but when I am changed to the same horn shape as thy dear, yoke me not, unhappy, to thy car nor flog me fiercely with thy whip. Farewell, tree of Pentheus, farewell pitiless Sithairn, farewell also ye fennels of mind deluding Dionysus. Happy be thou, faith and men's delight. Shine on the hills, show thy light both for Leto's daughter and Dionysus. And if thou knowest how to destroy men also with thy rays, strike with thy pure fire Autonoe and Agave. Be Pacific's avenger, to plague with a laugh Harmonia's mother Aphrodite. She spoke, and Agave child murderer sorrowed yet more. The loving mother entombed the dead son whom she had slain, pouring a fountain of tears over her face, and the people built a goodly sepulchre. So they mourned in dejection, Lord Bacchus saw and pitied, and checked the dirge of the lamenting women, when he had mingled a medicine with honey-sweet wine and passed it to each in turn as a drink to lull their troubles. He gave them the drink of forgetfulness, and when Cadmus lamented he soothed his sorrowful moans with healing words. He sent Autonoe and Agave to their beds, and showed them oracles of God to tell of coming hope. Over the Illyrian country to the land of the western sea he sped, and banished Harmonia with Cadmus her age-mate, both wanderers, for whom creeping time had in store a change into the shape of snaky stone. Then Bacchus with his pans and satyrs whipped up his lynxes, and went in gorgeous pomp to far-famed Athens. Book 47. Come to the forty-seventh, in which is Perseus, and the death of Icarius, and Ariadne in her rich robes. Already rumor was flitting up and down the city, announcing of herself that Dionysus of the Grapes had come to visit Attica, and prolific Athens broke out into wild, dancing for unresting Lyaeos. Loud was the sound of reveling, crowds of citizens with forests of fluttering hands decked out the streets in hangings of many colors, and vine leaves which Bacchus made to grow wreathed themselves all over Athens. The women hung mystic plates of iron over their breasts and bound them round their bodies. The maidens danced and crowned their brows with flowers of ivy braided in attic hair. Elysos rolled round the city living water to glorify Dionysus, the banks of Cephisos echoed the and tune to the universal dance. The plant shot up from the bosom of the earth, grapes self-grown with sweet fruit ripening reddened the olive groves of Marathon. Trees whispered, meadows put forth in season roses of two colors with opening petals, the hills gave birth to the lily self-grown. Athena's pipes answered the Phrygian pipes, the Acarnian reed pressed by the fingers played its double ditty. The native bacchant leaned her arm on the young Pactolian bride, and sounded a double harmony with deep note answering the Migdonian girl, or held up the dancing nightly flame of double torches, for Zagreus born long ago and Dionysus lately born. The melodious throated nightingale of Attica sang her varied notes in the chorus, remembering Itilos and Philomela busy at the loom and the chattering bird of Zephyrus twittered under the eaves, casting to the winds all memory of Terius. No one in the city did not dance. Then Bacchus glad went to the house of Icarius, who excelled the other countrymen in planting new sorts of trees. The old gardener danced on his clownish feet when he saw Dionysus as his visitor, and entertained the lord of noble garden vines at his frugal board. Erigone went to draw and mingle milk of the goats, but Bacchus checked her, and handed to the kindly old man skins full of cure trouble liquor. He took in his right hand and offered Icarius a cup of sweet fragrant wine, 
as he greeted him in friendly words. Accept this gift, sir, which Athens knows not. Sir, I deem you happy, for your fellow citizens will celebrate you, proclaiming aloud that Icarius has found fame to obscure Celios, and Erigone to outdo Metanira. I rival Demeter of the olden days, because Deo too brought a gift, the harvest corn, to another husbandman. Triptolemus discovered corn, you the wine-cheeked grape of my vintage. You alone rival Ganymedes in heaven, you more blessed than Triptolemus was before, for corn does not dissolve the sorrows that eat the heart, but the wine-bearing grape is the healer of human pain. Such were the words he spoke, as he offered a handsome cup full of mind-awakening wine to the hospitable old man. The old hard-working gardener drank, and drank again, with desire insatiable for the dewy trickling drops. His girl poured no more milk, but reached him cup after cup of wine until her father was drunken, and when at last he had taken enough of that table spread with cups, the gardener skipped about with changing step, staggering and rolling sideways, and struck up the ewan chant of Zagreus for Dionysus. Then the plant-loving god presented to the old countryman ewan shoots of vine in return for his hospitable table, and the Lord taught him the art of making them grow, by breaking and ditching and curving the shoots round into the soil. So the industrious old gardener passed on to other countrymen the gifts of Bromius with their vintage of grapes, and taught them how to plant and care for the viney growth of Dionysus, he poured into his rustic mixer streams of wine inexhaustible, and cheered the hearts of banqueters with cup after cup, releasing the fragrant liquid from his wine skins. Many a one would compliment Irigoni's father with grateful words as he drank the sweet liquor of mind-awakening wine. Tell us, Gaffer, how you found on earth the nectar of Olympus. This golden water never came from Cephisos, this honey-sweet treasure was not brought from the Naiads. For our fountains do not bubble up honey streams like this, the river Ilissos does not run in such a purple flood. This is no drink from the plant-loving bee, which quickest of all brings satiety to mortal man. This is another kind of water, sweeter than sweet honey, this is no national draught born from the Athenian olive. You have a drink richer than milk which ever keeps its taste, mingled with drops of honey posset. If the rosy arm seasons have learned to distill a drink for mortals from all the flower cups that grow in our gardens, I would call this a springtime beverage of Adonis or Scythaea, the sweet-smelling dew of roses a strange drink yours, which dissolves trouble. For it has scattered my cares wandering in the winds of heaven. Can it be that immortal Hebe has given you this gift from heaven? Can it be that Athena your city holder has provided this? Who has stolen the mixing bowl from the sky, from which Ganymedes mixes the liquor and ladles out a cup for Zeus and the immortals? O oh, more blessed than hospitable Celios, can it be you also have yourself entertained some gracious Olympian who dwells in the heavens? I believe some other god came in mirth to visit your roof, and gave this drink to our country in friendship for your hospitable table, as Deo gave us corn. Thus he spoke, admiring the delicious drink, and from his lips rang out a stream of rustic song in sweet madness. So the countryman quaffed cup after cup, and made a wild revel over the wine which dazed their wits. Their eyes rolled, their pale cheeks grew red, for they drank their liquor neat, their peasant breasts grew hot, their heads grew heavy with the drink, the veins were swollen upon their foreheads. The bosom of the earth shook before their eyes, the trees danced and the mountains skipped. Men fell on their backs rolling helplessly over the ground, full of the unfamiliar wine with its slippery drops. Then the company of countrymen driven by murderous infatuation charged upon poor Icarius in maniac fury, as if the wine were mixed with a deceiving drug, one holding an iron poleaxe, one with a shovel for a weapon in his hands, one holding the corn-reaping sickle, another raising an immense block of stone, while another, beside himself, brandished a cudgel in his hand, all striking the old man, one came near with a goad and pierced his body with its flesh-cutting spike. The unhappy old industrious gardener thus beaten with blows fell to the ground, then leaping upon the table upset the mixing bowl and rolled half dead in the flood of ruddy wine, his head sank under the shower of blows from the countryman, and drops of his red blood mingled with the red wine. Now next door to death he stammered out these words. The wine of my Bromius, the comfort of human care, 
that sweet one is pitiless against me alone. It has given a merry heart to all men, and it has brought fate to Icarius. The sweet one is no friend to Erigone, for Dionysus who mourns not has made my girl to mourn. Before he could finish his words, fate came first and stayed his voice, there he lay dead with eyes wide open, far from his modest daughter. His murderers heavy with wine slumbered careless on the bare ground like dead men. When they awoke, they mourned aloud for him they had unwittingly slain, and in their right mind now they carried his body on their shoulders up to a woody ridge, and washed his wounds in the abundant waters of a mountain brook. So they who had slain buried him they had slain in their senseless fury, the same murderous hands buried the body which they had lately torn. The soul of Icarius floated like smoke to the room of Erigone. It was a light phantom in mortal shape, the shadowy vision of a dream, like a man newly slain, the wretched ghost wore a tunic with marks that betrayed the unexplained murder, red with blood and dirty with dust, torn to rags by blows on blows of beating steel. The phantom stretched out its hands and came close to the girl, and pointed out the wounds on the newly mangled limbs for her to see. The maiden shrieked in this melancholy dream, when she saw so many wounds on that head, when the poor thing saw the blood which had lately poured from that red throat. And the shade of her father spoke these words to his sorrowing child. Wake, poor creature, go and seek your father. Wake, and search for my drunken murderers. I am your much afflicted father, whom the savage country folk have destroyed because of wine with cold steel. I call you happy, my child, your father was killed, but you heard not the smashing of my beaten head, you saw not the hoary hair stained with gore, the body new mangled panting on the ground, you saw not the clubs that killed your father. No, providence kept you far away from your father, and guarded your eyes that they might not see the death of a murdered sire. Look at my clothes, red with blood. For yesterday country people drunken with cup after cup of wine and dribbling the unfamiliar juice of bacos, thronged about me. As the steel tore me, I called on the shepherds, and they heard not my voice, only Echo heard the noise of me and followed with answering tones, and mourned your father with a copy of my lamentable words. Never now will you lift your crook in the midst of the woodlands and go to the meadows and flowery pasture along with a rustic husband, feeding your flock, never will you handle your hoe to work about the trees and bring water along the channels to make the garden grow. Yet be not too greedy with my honey dripping fruit, but weep for me your father low fallen in death. I shall see you living as an orphan and knowing nothing of marriage. So spoke the vision of the dream, and then flew away. But the girl awaking tore her rose-red cheeks, and morning scored her firm breasts with her fingernails, and tore long locks of hair from the roots, then seeing the cattle still standing by her on the rock, the sorrowful maiden cried in a voice of lamentation. Where is the body of Icarius? Tell me, beloved hills. Tell me my father's fate, ye bulls that knew him well. Who were the murderers of my father slain? Where has my darling father gone? Is he wandering over the countryside, staying with the countrymen and teaching a neighbor to plant the young shoots of his fair vintage, or is he the guest of some pastoral gardener and sharing his feast? Tell his mourning daughter, and I will endure till he come. If my father is still alive, I will live with my parent again and water the plants of his garden, but if my father is dead and plants trees no more, I will face death like his over his dead body. So she spoke, and ran with swift knee up into the mountain forest, seeking the tracks of her father newly slain. But to her questions no goat herd was bold to reply, no herdsman of cattle in the woodlands pitied the maiden or pointed to a faint trace of her father still unheard of, no ancient shepherd showed her the body of Icarius, but she wandered in vain. At last a gardener found her and told the sad news in a sorrowful voice, and showed the tomb to her father lately slain. When the maiden heard it, she was distracted but with sober madness, she plucked the hair from her head and laid it upon the beloved tomb, a maiden unveiled, unshod, drenching her clothes with self, shed showers of ever-flowing tears. Speechless for a time, Erigone kept her lips sealed with silence, the dog the companion of Erigone shared her feelings, he whimpered and howled by the side of his mourning mistress, sorrowing with her sorrow. Wildly she ran up to a tall tree, 
she tied upon it a rope with a noose fast about her neck and hung herself high in the air, twisting in self-sought agonies with her two twitching feet. So she died, and had a willing fate, her dog ran round and round the girl with sorrowful howls, a dumb animal dropping tears of sympathy from his eyes. The dog would not leave his mistress alone, unguarded, but there he stayed by the tree, and chased off the praying beasts, panther or lion. Then wayfarers passed, and he showed with mute gestures the unwedded maid hanging in the tree with a noose about her neck. Full of pity they came up to the tree on tiptoe, and took down dog knew what they did, and helped them, scratching and scattering the surface of the soil with sharp claws and grubbing with clever feet. So the wayfarers buried the body but lately dead, and they went away on their business quick foot with a weight of sorrow under their hearts one and all. But the dog remained near the tomb alone, for love of Irigoni, and there he died of his own free will. Father Zeus had pity, and he placed Irigoni in the company of the stars near the lion's back. The rustic made holes an ear of corn, for she did not wish to carry the red grapes which had been her father's death. And Zeus brought old Icarius into the star-spangled sky to move beside his daughter, and called him Boates, the plowman, shining bright, and touching the wane of the Arcadian bear. The dog he made also a fiery constellation chasing the hare, in that part where the starry image of seafaring Argo voyages round the circle of Olympus. Such is the fiction of the Achaean story, mingling as usual persuasion with falsehood, but the truth is, Zeus our lord on high joined the soul of Erigone with the star of the heavenly virgin holding an ear of corn, and near the heavenly dog he placed a dog like him in shape, Sirios of the autumn as they call him, and the soul of Icarius he combined with Boötes in the heavens. These are the gifts of Cronides to the vine lands of Attica, offering one honor to Pallas and Dionysus together. Now Bacchus left the honey-flowing streams of Elysos, and went in dainty revel to the vine-clad district of Naxos. About him bold Eros beat his wings, and Scythea led, before the coming of Lyaeos the bridegroom. For Theseus had just sailed away, and left without pity the banished maiden asleep on the shore, scattering his promises to the winds. When Dionysus beheld deserted Ariadne sleeping, he mingled love with wonder, and spoke out his admiration cautiously to the dance-weaving Bacchants. Vassarids, shake not your tambours, let there be no sound of pipes or feet. Let Cyprus rest, but she has not the cestus which marks the Cyprian. I believe it is the grace that wedded Hypnus, cunning creature. But since dawn is bright and morning seems near, awaken sleeping Pasithea. But who has given address to the naked grace in Naxos, who? Is it Hebe? But to whom has she left the goblet of the blessed? Can this be Selene, that bright driver of cattle, lying on the seashore? Then how can she be sleeping apart from her inseparable Endymion? Is it Silverfoot Thetis I see on the strand? No, it is not naked, that rosy form. If I may dare to say so, it is the archeress resting here in Naxos from her labors of the hunt, now she has wiped off in the sea the sweat of hunting and slaying. For hard work always brings sweet sleep. But who has seen Artemis in the woods in long robes? Stay, Bacchants, stand still, Maron, dance not this way, stop singing, dear Pan, that you may not disturb the morning sleep of Athena. No, with whom did Pallas leave her spear? And who bears the bronze helmet or aegis of Tritogenia? So cried Bacchus, sleep flew away the poor lovelorn girl scattered sleep, awoke and rose from the sand, and she saw no fleet, no husband, the deceiver. But the Sidonian maiden lamented with the kingfishers, and paced the heavy murmuring shore which was all that the loves had given her. She called on the young man's name, madly she sought his vessel along the seaside, scolded the envious sleep, reproached even more the Paphian's mother, the sea, she prayed to Boreas and adjured the wind, adjured Orethuia to bring back the boy to the land of Naxos and to let her see that sweet ship again. She besought hard-hearted Iolos yet more, he heard her prayer and obeyed, sending a contrary wind to blow, but Boreas Lovelorn himself cared nothing for the maid stricken with desire, yes, even the breezes themselves must have had a spite against the maiden when they carried the ship to the Athenian land. Eros himself admired the maiden, 
and thought he saw Aphrodite lamenting in Naxos where all is joy. She was even more resplendent in her grief, and pain was a grace to the sorrower. Compare the two, and Aphrodite gently smiling and laughing with love must give place to Ariadne in sorrow, the delectable eyes of Pitho or the graces or love himself must yield to the maiden's tears. At last in her tears she found voice to speak thus. Sweet sleep came to me, when sweet Theseus left me. Would that I had been still happy when he left me. But in my sleep I saw the land of Cecrops, in the palace of Theseus was a splendid wedding and dance with songs for Ariadne, and my happy hand was adorning the love's blooming altar with luxuriant spring flowers. And I wore a bridal wreath, Theseus was beside me in wedding garments, sacrificing to Aphrodite. Alas, what a sweet dream I saw! But now it is gone, and I am left here yet virgin. Forgive me, Pitho? All this bridal pomp the misty darkness marshalled for me, all this the envious dawn of day has torn from me, and awaking I found not my heart's desire. Are the very images of love and love returned jealous of me? For I saw a delightful vision of marriage accomplished in a deceitful dream, and lovely Theseus was gone. To me, even kind sleep is cruel. Tell me, you rocks, tell the unhappy lover, who stole the man of Athens. If it should be Boreas blowing, I appeal to Orathuia, but Orathuia hates me, because she also has the blood of Marathon, whence beloved Theseus came. If Zephyrus torments me, tell Iris the bride of Zephyrus and mother of desire, to behold Ariadne maltreated. If it is Notos, if bold Euros, I appeal to Eos and reproach the mother of the blustering winds, Lovelorn herself. Give me again, sleep, your empty boon, so pleasant, send me another delectable dream like that, so that I may know the sweet bed of love in a deceptive dream. Only linger upon my eyes, that I may know the unreal passion of married love in a dream. O Theseus my treacherous bridegroom, if the marauding winds have carried your course from Naxos to the Athenian land, tell me now I ask, and I will resort to Iolos at once reproaching the jealous and wicked winds. But if some cruel seaman without your knowledge left me outlawed in desert Naxos, and sail away, he sinned against Theseus and against Themis, against Ariadne. May that sailor never see a favourable wind, if he rides the raging storm, may Melicertes never look on him graciously or bring him a calm sea, but may Notos blow when he wants Boreas, may he see Euros when he needs Zephyrus, when the winds of springtime blow upon all mariners, may he alone meet with a wintry sea. That lawless sailor sinned, but I myself was blinded when I desired the countrymen of chaste Athena. Would that I had not desired him, love lorn. For Theseus is as savage as he is charming in love. This is not what he said to me while yet he handled my thread, this is not what he said at our labyrinth. Oh that the cruel bull had killed him. Hush, my voice, no more folly, do not kill the delightful boy. Alas, my love! Theseus has sailed alone to Athens his happy mother. I know why he left me, in love no doubt with one of the maidens who sailed with him, and now he holds wedding dance for the other at Marathon while I still walk in Naxos. My bridal bower was Naxos, O Theseus my treacherous bridegroom. I have lost both father and bridegroom, alas my love. I see not Minos, I behold not Theseus, I have left my own Knossos, but I have not seen your Athens, both father and fatherland are lost. O oh, unhappy me! Your gift for my love is the water of the brine. Who can be my refuge? What god will catch me up and convey to Marathon Ariadne, that she may claim her rights before Cyprus and Theseus? Who will take me and carry me over the flood? If only I could myself see another thread, to guide my way to. Such a thread I want for myself, to escape from the Aegean flood and cross to Marathon, that I may embrace you even if you hate Ariadne, that I may embrace you my perjured husband. Take me for your chambermaid, if you like, and I will lay your bed, and be your Ariadne, in Marathon, instead of Crete, like some captive girl. I will endure to serve your most happy bride, I will ply the rattling loom, and lift a pitcher on envious shoulders, an unfamiliar task, and bring handwash after supper for sweet Theseus, only let me see Theseus. My mother too once was the menial of a farmer, 
and bowed her neck for a herdsman, and prattled of love to a dumb bull in the pasture, and brought the bull a calf. She cared not to hear the herdsman make music on his pipe so much as to hear the bellowing bull. I will not touch the crook, I will not stand in the stall, but I will be ready beside my queen to hear the voice of Theseus, not the bellowing of a bull. I will sing a lovely song for your wedding, and hide my jealousy of your newly wedded bride. Stay your voyage by the sands of Naxos, sailor, stay your ship for me. What, are you angry too? So you too come from Marathon. If you are bound for your lovely land, where is the home of love, take this unhappy girl on board that I may behold the city of Cecrops. If you must leave me, pitiless, and go on your voyage, tell your Theseus of mourning Ariadne, how she reproaches the treacherous oath of love unfulfilled. I know why angry Eros has left unfulfilled Theseus the deceiver's promise. He swore his marriage oath not by Hera, whom they call the nuptial goddess, but by the immaculate Athena, the goddess who knows nothing of marriage. He swore by Pallas, and what has Pallas to do with Scythaea? Bacchus was enraptured to hear this lament. He noticed Scropia, and knew the name of Theseus and the deceitful voyage from Crete. Before the girl he appeared in his radiant godhead, Eros moved swiftly about, and with stinging Cestus he whipped the maiden into a nobler love, that he might lead Minos's daughter to join willingly with his brother Dionysus. Then Bacchus comforted Ariadne, lovelorn and lamenting, with these words in his mind charming voice. Maiden, why do you sorrow for the deceitful man of Athens? Let pass the memory of Theseus, you have Dionysus for your lover, a husband incorruptible for the husband of a day. If you are pleased with the mortal body of a youthful year's mate, Theseus can never challenge Dionysus in manhood or comeliness. But you will say, he shed the blood of the half bull man whose den was the earth dug labyrinth. But you know your thread was his saviour, for the man of Athens with his club would never have found victory in that contest without a rosy red girl to help him. I need not tell you of Eros and the Paphian, and Ariadne's distaff. You will not say that Athens is greater than heaven. Minos your father was not the equal of Zeus Almighty, Cossos is not like Olympus. Not for nothing did that fleet sail from my Naxos, but desire preserved you for a nobler bridal. Happy girl, that you leave the poor bed of Theseus to look on the couch of Dionysus the desirable. What could you pray for higher than that? You have both heaven for your home and Cronion for your good father. Cassiopeia will not be equal to you because of her daughter's Olympian glory, for Perseus has left her heavenly chains to Andromeda even in the stars, but for you I will make a starry crown, that you may be called the shining bedfellow of crown-loving Dionysus. So he comforted her, the girl throbbed with joy, and cast into the sea all her memories of Theseus when she received the promise of wedlock from her heavenly wooer. Then Eros decked out a bridal chamber for Bacchus, the wedding dance resounded, about the bridal bed all flowers grew, the dancers of Orchomenos surrounded Naxos with foliage of spring, the Hamadryad sang of the wedding, the Naiad nymph by the fountains unveiled unshod praised the union of Ariadne with the vine god, Ortigia cried aloud in triumph, and chanting a bridal hymn for Laios the brother of Phoebus city holder she skipped in the dance, that unshakable rock. Fiery Eros made a round flower garland with red roses and plaited a wreath colored like the stars, as prophet and herald of the heavenly crown, and round about the Naxian bride danced a swarm of the loves which attend on marriage. The golden father entering the chamber of wedded love sowed the seed of many children. Then rolling the long circle of hoary time, he remembered Rhea his prolific mother, and leaving faultless Naxos, still full of graces he visited all the towns of Hellas. He came near horse-breeding Argos, even though Hera ruled the Inachos. But the people would not receive him, they chased away the dance-weaving women and satyrs, they repudiated the Thyasus, lest Hera should be jealous and destroy her Pelasgian seat, if her heavy wrath should press hard on Laios, they checked the old Salinoi. Then Dionysus, angry, sent madness upon all the Inachian women. The women of Achaia loudly bellowed, they attacked those they met at the three ways, the poor creatures sharpened knives for their own newborn babies, one mother drew sword and slew her son, another destroyed her three-year-old child, 
one again hurled into the air her baby boy still searching for the welcome milk. Inachos was stained with the death of perishing newborn babes, a mother killed a son, never missed him at her nursing breast, never thought of the pangs of travail. Asterion, where the young men so often cut the flower of their bared brows as first fruits of growing age, now received the children themselves and no longer locks of hair. As Laeos came up, a man of the Pelastian country thus called out to one of the servants of the god. You there with the grapes, you hybrid. Argos has her Perseus, one worthy of Hera, and needs not Dionysus. I have another son of Zeus and I want no Bacchus. Dionysus treads the vintage with dancing feet, my countryman cuts the air with high traveling steps. Do not think ivy as good as the sickle, for Perseus with his sickle is better than Bacchus with his ivy, if Bacchus destroyed the Indian host, I will announce an equal prize for Perseus Gorgon's Slayer and Dionysus Indian Slayer. If Bacchus once in the western region of the rolling sea turned into stone a Tyrrhenian ship and fixed it in the sea, my Perseus turned into stone a whole huge monster of the deep. If your Dionysus saved Ariadne, sleeping on the sands beside an empty sea, Perseus on the wing loosed the chains of Andromeda, and offered the stone sea monster as a worthy bridal gift. Not for the Paphian's sake, not while she longed for Theseus did Perseus save Andromeda to be his bride, a chaste wedding was his. No fiery lightnings burnt Danae to ashes, like Semele, but the father of Perseus came to his wedding as a golden shower of love from heaven, not as a flaming bedfellow. I do not admire this hero at all. For what lusty spear of war does he hold? Stay, Perseus, do not fight a woman's ivy with your gorgon slayer sickle, do not defile your hand with a woman's buskins, do not shake the cap of Hades upon your brow against a wreath of vine leaves, but if you wish, arm Andromeda against unarmed Dionysus. Begone, Dionysus, I tell you, leave Argos and its horses and madden once more the women of seven gate Thebes. Find another Pentheus to kill, what has Perseus to do with Dionysus? Let be the swift stream of Inachos, and let the slow river of Onian Thebes receive you. I need not remind you of heavy Neasopos boiling still with the thunderbolt. So the man spoke, deriding Dionysus. Meanwhile Pelasgian Hera equipped her Argive army, she took the shape of the seer Melampus, and angrily called to Perseus Gorgon Slayer in martial words. Perseus Flash Helm, offspring of heavenly race. Lift your sickle, and let not weak women lay waste your Argos with an unwarlike Thyasus. Tremble not before only one snake wreathed in the hair, when your monster-slaying sickle reaped such a harvest as the vipers of Medusa. Attack the army of Bassarids, remember the brazen vault which was Danae's chamber, where rainy Zeus poured in her bosom a shower of bride-stealing gold, let not Danae after that bed, after the wedding of gold, bend a slavish knee to that nobody Dionysus. Show that you have in you the true blood of Cronion, show that you have the golden breed, proclaim the bed that received that snowstorm of heavenly riches. Make war on the satyrs too, turn towards battling Laeos the deadly eye of snake hair Medusa, and let me see a new Polydectes made stone after the hateful king of wave washed Seraphos. By your side is Argive Hera in arms, all vanquishing, the stepmother of Bromius. Defend Mikini lift your sickle to save our city, that I may behold Ariadne captive of your spear following Perseus. Kill the array of bull-horned satyrs, change with the gorgons I the human countenances of the Bassarids into like images self-made, with the beauty of the stone copies adorn your streets, and make statues like an artist for the Anakian marketplaces. Why do you tremble before Dionysus? no offspring of the bed of Zeus. Tell me, what could he do to you? When shall a footfarer on the ground catch a winged traveller of the air? So she encouraged him, and Perseus flew into the fray. The Pelasgian trumpet blared calling the people. They came, one lifting the spear of Spearman Lincius, one the spear of Pharonius more ancient still, one that of Pelasgos, one carried on his arm the oxide of Arbus, and the ashplant of Proetos, another bore the quiver of Acrisios, this bold man stood up to fight holding the sword of Danaus, which once he raised naked when he armed his daughters for those husband-murdering bridles, another again grasped the great axe which Inachos held to strike the bull's foreheads. 
when he stood as the inspired priest of Hera City Holder. The battle-stirring host behind their prancing teams ran with Perseus to the field, and he stood before them shouting the war cry with harsh voice, on foot himself, and shook back the rounded quiver over his shoulder, and fitted arrows to curving bow. Perseus of the sickle was champion of the Argives, he fitted his feet into the flying shoes, and he lifted up the head of Medusa which no eyes may see. But Iabacos marshaled his women with flowing locks, and satyrs with horns. Wild for battle he was when he saw the winged champion coursing through the air. The Thyasus was held up in his hand, and to defend his face he carried a diamond, the gem made stone in the showers of Zeus which protects against the stony glare of Medusa, that the baleful light of that destroying face may do him no harm. And flash helm Perseus when he saw the ranks of the Bassarids and the gear of Lyaeos, laughed terribly and cried, It's nice to see you there with that Thyasus, that green leaf shaft, marching against me armed with your wretched foliage, playing at war. If you have in you the blood of Zeus, show your breeding. If you have the water of golden Pactolo's river, I have a golden father, my father is Zeus of the rains. See the crimson foundations of my mother's chamber, still keeping relics of that snowstorm of wealth. Go, flee now from famous Argos, since these buildings belong to steadfast Hera, your mother's destroyer, lest she make you the madner mad, lest I see you once more driven with frenzy at last. He spoke, and advanced to the fight. All vanquishing Hera marshaled the battle, and scattered the Bacchants with Medusa's reaper, she dashed upon Bacchus like the lightning, a god sent leaping fire, and cast at Bromius her gleaming flashing lance. But Dionysus laughing replied in a wild voice, Not so much of a flash you make in that blade of yours, with no iron, you cannot scare me, though your point is on fire. Even the lightning of Zeus does not hurt me, for when I was half made and still a baby the thunders bathed me, pouring breath which burned not upon inviolate Dionysus. You too, Perseus of the sickle, proud as you are, make an end. This is no battle for a feeble gorgon, the prize is not a lone girl in heavy chains, Andromeda. Lyaeos is your enemy, the offspring of Zeus, to whom alone long ago Rhea offered the life-giving breast, for whom long ago the flame of marriage lightning was a gentle midwife, the admiration of East and of West, before whom the armies of India gave way, at whom Diriades trembled, and Orontes with his towering giant stature fell, to whom bold Alpus bent his knee, that son of earth with huge body rising near the clouds, to whom the Arabian nation kneels down. And the Sicilian mariner still sings the changing shape of sea-scouring Tyrrhenian pirates, when once I transformed their human bodies and now instead of men they are fishes dancing and leaping in the sea. You have heard the groaning of seven gate Thebes, I need not remind you of Pentheus in dire madness and Agave who slew her child, you need no tale or witness how your Argos has felt Lyaeos, and the wives of Achaia themselves are still mourning for their children. Very well, fight, my friend, and soon you shall praise Bacchus with his weapons of leafage, when you see the wings of your shoes yielding to my unconquerable buskins. Never shall you scatter my battling Bassarids, never will I cease casting my vine wand, until I show Argos your throat pierced by my spear of ivy and your sickle beaten by my leaves. Zeus my father will not save you, nor bright eyes my sister, nor your own Hera, however she hates the steadfast Dionysus, but I will kill you, and boastful Mekini shall see beheaded the man who beheaded Medusa. Or I will bind you in a chest with greater bonds, and throw you to float again on the sea you know so well, you may land again at Seraphos by and by if you like. If you are so proud of your golden birth, you may take the golden Aphrodite, that good-for-nothing, to help you. When he had ended, he went on fighting, the Bacchants fell to, the satyrs joined the battle. Over the head of Bromius Perseus flew in the air, flapping his light wings, but Iobacos lifted his body and rose wingless on high near to the heavens with larger limbs over flying Perseus, and brought his hand near the seven-ring sky, and touched Olympus, and crushed the clouds, Perseus quivered with fear as he saw the right hand of Dionysus out of reach and touching the sun, catching hold of the moon. So he left Dionysus and fought with the mad Bacchants. He shook in his hand the deadly face of Medusa, and turned armed Ariadne into stone. 
Bacchus was even more furious when he saw his bride all stone. He would have sacked Argos and raised Mycenae to the ground and mowed down the whole host of Danaeans, yes even wounded invulnerable Hera herself, who was fighting unrecognized in the false borrowed shape of a mortal, a seer, and swift you Perseus would have perished, fate or no fate, but Hermes appeared behind him with winged shoes and pulled him back by his golden hair, and calmed him with friendly words to avert the ruin. True-born offspring of Zeus, if bastard for jealous Hera. You know how I saved you from the fires that fell from heaven, and entrusted you to those nymphs, the daughters of River Lamos, when still a little child, how again I carried you in my arms to the house of Eno your fostering nurse. Then show gratitude, my brother, to your saviour the son of Maia, and still this feud of brothers, for both Perseus and Dionysus are offspring of one sire. Do not reproach the people of Argos, nor the sickle of Perseus, for he arms not willingly for this war. But Hera has armed him, and she is fighting openly in the shape of the seer Melampus. Retire and leave the strife, or Hera irreconcilable may overwhelm you again in her might. But you will urge the fate of your bride. She has died in battle, a glorious fate, and you ought to think Ariadne happy in her death, because she found one so great to slay her, one sprung from heaven and of no mortal stock, one who killed the sea monster and beheaded horse-breeding Medusa. The fates threads obey not persuasion. For Electra died, the bedfellow of heavenly Zeus, Europa herself disappeared after the Olympian bed, the sister of your Cadmus, she who was wedded to Zeus, your mother perished too, while she still carried you in her womb, Semele entered not the gates of Olympus before death, but after she had received her fate. And your bride even in death, shall enter the star's pangled sky, and she will be seen near Maya my mother among the seven travelling Pleiades. What could Ariadne wish more welcome than to live in the heavens and give light to the earth, after Crete? Come now, lay down your thiasis, let the winds blow battle away, and fix the self-made image of mortal Ariadne where the image of heavenly Hera stands. Do not sack the city where the stock of your parents remains, but still your thiasis, and respect the country of Cowhorn Io. You will praise the women of Achaia by and by, when they shall build an altar to bullface Hera and your charming bride. So he spoke, and leaving Argos the land of horses returned to the sky, after he had mingled a league of friendship between Perseus and Dionysus. Nor did Argive Hera remain long in that place, but putting off her pretended mortal body she took her divine form and returned to Olympus. Then old Melampus addressed the Icarian host, he the offspring of divine Pelasgian Lynceus founder of the race. Obey your seer, and shake your tambours in honor of wine-faced Bacchus, shake your bronze tambours and the Ewan symbols of Rhea, that he may not wipe out the whole Inachian race, that he may not destroy the young men after the little children, that he may not kill the wives after their offspring. Come, do sacrifice to Bacchus and Zeus, and please the god's heart, and dance before Perseus and Dionysus. They did as he bade them. The people gathered together, and struck up a song with nightly dances for Bacchus and performed the holy rites, in the pious dance the tambours rattled, the feet beat the ground, the torches blazed. All the people in company smeared their cheeks with white mystic chalk. Kettle drums rattled, the double tap sounded as the bronze was beaten. Altars were red with bulls, slaughtered in rows one after another, a multitude of sheep were killed. At the burning altar men made their peace with Bacchus, women won his grace. Women's voices resounded in the air echoing in turn the song of salvation, Inachian women and Maynad women cast their deluding fury to the winds. Book 48. In the 48th, seek the blood of the giants, and look out for Pelini, and the son of sleeping Aura. Now Bacchus quitted the horse-breeding soil of ancient Foronius, and mounted in his round car behind the team of panthers passed in revelry over the Thracian land. But Inachian Hera had not softened her rancorous rage for Argos maddened, she remembered the frenzy of the Achaean women, and prepared again to attack Bacchus. She addressed her deceitful prayers to all Mother Earth, crying out upon the doings of Zeus and the valor of Dionysus, who had destroyed that cloud of numberless earthborn Indians, and when the life-bringing mother heard that the son of Semele had wiped out the Indian nation with speedy fate, 
she groaned still more thinking of her children. Then she armed all round backos the mountain ranging tribes of giants, earth's own brood, and goaded her huge sons to battle. My sons, make your attack with high towering rocks against cluster garlanded Dionysus, catch this Indian slayer, this destroyer of my family, this son of Zeus, and let me not see him ruling with Zeus a bastard monarch of Olympus. Bind him, bind Bacchus fast, that he may attend in the chamber when I bestow Hebe on Porphyrian as a wife, and give Scythea to Cphineos, when I sing Bright Eyes the Bedfellow of Enceladus, and Artemis of Alcyonus. Bring Dionysus to me, that I may enrage Cronion when he sees Laeos a slave and the captive of my spear. Or wound him with cutting steel and kill him for me like Zagreus, that one may say, God or mortal, that earth in her anger has twice armed her slayers against the breed of Cronides, the older titans against the former Dionysus, the younger giants against Dionysus later born. With these words she excited all the host of the giants, and the battalions of the earthborn set forth to war, one bearing a bulwark of Nyssa, one who had sliced off with steel the flank of a cloud-high precipice, each with these rocks for missiles armed him against Dionysus, one hastened to the conflict bearing the rocky hill of some land with its base in the brine, another with a reef torn from a brine-girt isthmus. Pelorius took up Pelion with high-towering peak as a missile in his innumerable arms, and left the cave of Philera bare, as the rocky roof of his cave was pulled off, old Chiron quivered and shook, that figure of half a man growing into a comrade horse. But Bacchus held a bunch of giants bane vine, and ran at Alcyonus with the mountain upraised in his hands, he wielded no furious lance, no deadly sword, but he struck with his bunch of tendrils and shore off the multitudinous hands of the giants, the terrible swarms of ground-bred serpents were shorn off by those tippling leaves, the giants' heads with those viper tresses were cut off and the severed necks danced in the dust. Tribes innumerable were destroyed, from the slain giants ran ever-flowing rivers of blood, crimson torrents newly poured colored the ravines red. The swarms of earth-bred snakes ran wild with fear before the tresses of Dionysus viper enwreathed. Fire was also a weapon of Bacchus. He cast a torch in the air to destroy his adversaries, through the high paths ran the Bacchic flame leaping and curling over itself and shooting down corrosive sparks on the giant's limbs, and there was a serpent with a blaze in his threatening mouth, half burnt and whistling with a fire-scorched throat, spitting out smoke instead of a spurt of deadly poison. There was infinite tumult. Bacchus raised himself and lifted his fighting torch over the heads of his adversaries, and roasted the giant's bodies with a great conflagration, an image on earth of the thunderbolt cast by Zeus. The torches blazed, fire was rolling all over the head of Enceladus and making the air hot, but it did not vanquish him, Enceladus bent not his knee in the steam of the earthly fire, since he was reserved for a thunderbolt. Vast Alcyonus leapt upon Laeos armed with his Thracian crags, he lifted over Bacchus a cloud-high peak of wintry Hymos, useless against that mark, Dionysus the invulnerable. He threw the cliff, but when the rocks touched the fawn skin of Laeos, they could not tear it, and burst into splinters themselves. Typhius towering high had stripped the mountains of Imathia, a younger Typhius in all parts like the older, who once had lifted many a rugged strip of his mother earth, and cast the rocky missiles at Dionysus. Lord Bacchus pulled away the sword of one that was gasping on the ground and attacked the giant's heads, cutting the snaky crop of poison-spitting hair, even without weapon he destroyed the self-marshalled host, fighting furiously, and using the tree-climbing longleaf ivy to strike the giants. Indeed he would have slain all with his man-breaking Thyasus, if he had not retired of his own will out of the fray and left enemies alive for his father. Then he would quickly have gone to Phrygia with speeding foot, but another task held him back, that after so many had died he might kill one murderous creature, Polini's death-dealing father. He once had an unlawful passion for his daughter, he used, to thwart her marriage and hinder every match. Woos innumerable who would have wed her he killed, a great harvest of them, the places of wrestling were noisy with their murders and red with their blood, until Bacchus came as the champion of justice. There was Pelini, ever so near to wedlock, and her father full of unholy passion, Bacchus came near, and proposed to make the wicked match with his horrible daughter, offering all manner of gifts. To this request of Laeos, 
the dreadful man declared how wrestling must win the bride. He led him into the place of contest, so ill omened for strangers, where the audacious girl stood ready spear in hand bearing her bridal shield on her shoulders. Then Cyprus presided over the ring. In the midst was Eros naked, holding out tobaccos the bridal wreath. Wrestling was to win the bride, Pitho clad her delicate body in a silvery robe, foretelling victory for Laeos's wooing. The girl stripped the clothes off her muscular limbs, she laid down the fierce wedding spear. There stood the daughter of Sethan, daintier now, unshod, unveiled, unarmed, revealed a woman, but a red band girt the rounded curve of her firm breasts. Her body was uncovered, but for the long tresses of the abundant hair which flowed loose over the girl's neck. Her legs were visible, and the curve of her thighs uncovered with the part above the knee bare, but a white wrap fitted close over the thighs to cover her nakedness. Her skin had been well rubbed with fat oil, and her arms more than all, that she might slip out easily if her body were pressed in a grasp too strong to loosen. She came up to Laeos her eager woo with rough threatening words, and threw her two arms with a swing linking them round his neck, Bacchus just threw back his neck with the woman's fetters about it, and shook it loose again, throwing off the girl's tender fingers. Then he put his two arms round her waist like a girdle, and shook her from side to side by movements of his feet. He grasped a rosy palm, and felt comfort for his love as he squeezed the snow-white hand. He did not wish so much to give the maid a throw as to touch the soft flesh, entranced with his delightful task, he used all his guile, panting with laboring breath, as if he were a mortal, delaying victory on purpose. Lovely Polini tried a trick of the ring to lift the body of Laeos, but her woman's arms were not equal to raise that great weight, she tired, and let go the masculine limbs of Dionysus immovable. Then the god took a like hold of the lovely girl, and joining his two arms about his adversary lifted her as if she were his own wand, and threw her aslant round and over his shoulder, then with gentle hands swung off the sturdy girl and laid her at full length quiet on the ground. He let his eyes furtively wander, scanning the limbs of the girl covered with her glorious hair in the dust, the luxurious tresses of the untidy head dabbled in dirt. But the girl jumped up again from the dust and stood up steady on her feet once more. Then Dionysus with an agile movement mercilessly set his knee against Polini's belly, and holding her tried to roll her over on the ground with a sideways heave, changed his arms to a grasp round her waist, bent his head to one side and shifted his fingers behind to the middle of her back, and tried to hook ankle or shin, or to catch the knee. At last the god fell back of himself rolling on the ground and let a feeble hand conquer him, a charming physic it was for his love, when he lay beautiful in that happy dust on his back, bearing upon his own belly that lovely burden, he lay still, and did not throw off the girl, but held her fast with soul-consoling bonds of desire. She pulled herself from the manly hands of love-mad Dionysus, and lifted herself to her feet with a twist of her legs in a quick supple movement, but the god with a slight effort simply rolled over and laid the rosy girl flat on the ground. So there lay the girl on the ground stretching her arms abroad, and as she lay along the ground he joined his arms neatly in a clasp about her neck. Then with swift feet her father leapt between them. The girl wanted to try again, but he held her back, and put an end to this wedding contest for a bride by yielding love's victory to Dionysus, for fear he might kill her in that immovable grip. So after the victory in this contest, with the consent of Zeus, Eros crowned his brother with the cluster that heralds a wedding, for he had accomplished a delectable wedding bout. It was indeed a contest like that when Hippomenes once conquered flying Atalanta, by rolling golden marriage gifts in front of her feet. But when Bacchus had ended the wrestling match for his bride, still dripping with the sweat of his wedding contest he struck down Sethan with a stab of his sharp thyasus, Sethan the murderer of wooers, and as the father rolled in the dust he gave his daughter the thyasus that slew him, as a love gift. That was however the right to pursue in his own chariot and spear the suitor if he could catch him. In one version of the story of Polini, Parthenios Vi. 3 to 4, chariots are introduced also, though it is said that the competitors for her hand, cf note on 93, were to fight from them, not race in them, a very odd archaism, since fighting in, as opposed to from, chariots was already obsolete in the days of Homer. This suggests that here again a pursuit, 
not a race in the ordinary sense, may have been the original contest. Atalant also, in a version preserved by Haginus, Fab. 185. 2. C. Rose at Lock, did not race with her suitors, but ran after them, killing them if she caught them before they got to the goal. Now if we compare the curious ritual of Orcomenos, Plutarch, Quest, Grace. 38. In which the priest of Dionysus pursued with a sword certain women, and might kill any one of them he caught, it seems in no way impossible that all these stories, or some of them at least, represent a ritual flight and pursuit, a common enough ceremony in itself, with a real or pretended killing involved. That such a performance should be confused with a ritual combat, also a fairly common proceeding, is natural enough. A wedding of many songs, the bridey chamber was never silent, Salonoi chanted, Bacontes danced, drunken satyrs wove a hymn of love and sang the alliance which came of this victorious match. Companies of Nereids under the foothills of the neighboring Isthmus encircled Dionysus with wedding dances and warbled their lay, beside the Thracian sea danced old Nerus, who once had Bromius for a guest, Calatia tripped over the wedding sea and caroled Pellini joined with Dionysus, Thetis capered although she knew nothing of love, Melikertes crowned the Seagate wedding reef of the Isthmus chanting Uoi for Pellini's bridal. Many a hamadryad of Atos kindled a Thracian torch for the bridal in fiery Lemnos close by. And while the bride mourned her father, the Ewan bridegroom comforted her with lover's tender talk. Maiden, lament not for your father so wicked in his love. Maiden, lament not for one that wooed your maidenhood. What father ever begat and then married his own daughter? Leave your empty mourning, because now that Sethan your father is slain justice dances and laughs, and kindles a wedding torch with her virgin hands, she who knows not marriage still is singing your marriage, as she beholds a new Oinomaus dead. Oinomaus died indeed, but although her father had perished, Hippodamia took her joy with her husband newly wedded. Then you too must throw to the winds your regret for your father, and take your joy united with your vinegar lover, now that you have escaped a father's disgrace. I need not tell you of Sethan's hateful love and your marriage delayed, how he took in hand a murderous blade to kill your wooers, and let you grow old without a taste of Aphrodite, scattered your hopes of a husband and left your bed solitary. Look at the rotting relics of your pretender's bodies, whom the Paphian adorned and the furious avenger slew. See those heads hung before your doors like first fruits of harvest, still dripping with the gore of those inhospitable bridal feasts. You are no mortal daughter of Sethan. I believe a heavenly being begat you, your own Thracian Ares. I believe Sithaea brought you to birth, and you have marks of both parents imprinted, the temper of Ares and the radiance of Aphrodite. Or I believe your father was Lord Hermes of the Ring, when he entered the delicate bed of Pitho who brings marriage to pass, and he taught you the wrestling which leads the way to love. So he consoled her with words that healed her sorrow, and stilled the lovely tears of the mourning maiden. And he lingered for some time beside his wedded bride, taking his joy in the love of this new marriage. Then he left the halls of Pellini and Thracian Boreas, and went on to Rhea's house, where the divine court of the prolific Sibylle stood on Phrygian soil. There grew Aura the mountain maiden of Rindacos, and hunted over the foothills of rocky Dindemon. She was yet unacquainted with love, a comrade of the archeress. She kept aloof from the notions of unwarlike maids, like a younger Artemis, this daughter of Lantos, for the father of this storm-foot girl was ancient Lantos the Titan, who wedded Periboia, a daughter of Oceanos, a man-like maid she was, who knew nothing of Aphrodite. She grew up taller than her years mates, a lovely rosy-armed thing, ever a friend of the hills. Often in hunting she ran down the wild bear, and sent her swift lance shooting against the lioness, but she slew no prickets and shot no hares. No, she carried her tawny quiver to shoot downhill ranging tribes of ravening lions, with her shafts that were death to wild beasts. Her name was like her doings, or the wind maid could run most swiftly, keeping pace with the highland winds. One day, in the scorching season of thirsty heat the maiden was asleep, resting from her labors of hunting. Stretching her body on Sybil's grass, and leaning her head on a bush of chaste laurel, she slept at midday, 
and saw a vision in her dreams which foretold a delectable marriage to come, how the fiery god, wild Eros, fitted shaft to burning string and shot the hares in the forest, shot the wild beasts in a row with his tiny shafts, how Cypris came, laughing, wandering with the young son of Mira as he hunted, and Aura the maiden was there, carrying the quiver of huntsman Eros on the shoulder which was ere now used, to the bow of Artemis. But Eros went on killing the beasts, until he was weary of the bowstring and hitting the grim face of a panther or the snout of a bear, then he caught a lioness alive with the all-bewitching Cestus, and dragging the beast away showed her fettered to his merry mother. The maiden saw in the darkness how mischievous Eros teased herself also as she leaned her arm on Cythea and Adonis, while he made his prey the proud lioness, bend a slavish knee before Aphrodite, as he cried loudly, garlanded mother of the loves. I lead to you Aura, the maiden too fond of maidenhood, and she bows her neck. Now you dancers of love stricken or commonos, crown this cestus, the strap that waits on marriage, because it has conquered the stubborn will of this invincible lioness. Such was the prophetic oracle which Aura the mountain maiden saw. Nor was it vain for the loves, since they themselves bring a man into the net and hunt a woman. The maiden awoke, raved against the pruned laurel, upbraided Eros and the Paphian, but bold sleep she reproached more than all and threatened the dream, she was angry with the leaves and thought, though she spoke not. Daphne, why do you persecute me? What has your tree to do with Cyprus? I was deluded when I slept under your neighboring branches, because I thought yours was a plant of chastity, but I found nothing of your reputation or my hope. And so, Daphne, when you changed your shape you found how to change your mind. Surely you are not the servant of conjugal Aphrodite after your death. This is not the tree of a decent girl but of a bride newly wed. One might expect to see such dreams near a myrtle, this dream is worthy of a harlot. Did Pitho plant you, did your laurel Apollo plant you with his own hand? She spoke thus, angry at the plant and Eros and sleep all together. And once it happened that Artemis queen of the hunt was hunting over the hills, and her skin was beaten by the glow of the scorching heat, in the middle of glowing summer, at midday, when Helios blazed as he whipped the lion's back with the fire of his rough whistling whip, so she got ready her car to cool her hot frame along with the naiad nymphs in a bath in some hill burn. Then Artemis hill ranger fastened her prickets under the yoke straps. Maiden Aura mounted the car, took reins and whip and drove the horned team like a tempest. The unveiled daughters of ever-flowing Oceanos her servants made haste to accompany the archeress, one moved her swift knees as her queen's forerunner, another tucked up her tunic and ran level not far off, a third laid a hand on the basket of the swift-moving car and ran alongside. Archeress diffusing radiance from her face stood shining above her attendants, as when Selene in her heavenly chariot sends forth the flame of her ever-wakeful fires in a shower of cloudless beams, and rises in full refulgence among the fiaft stars, obscuring the whole heavenly host with her countenance, radiant like her, Archeress traversed the forest, until she reached the place where the heaven-fallen waters of Sangario's river are drawn in a murmuring stream. Then Aura checked her swinging whip, and holding up the prickets with the golden bridles, brought the radiant car of her mistress to a standstill beside the stream. The goddess leapt out of the car, took the bow from her shoulders, and Heck urged the quiver, the daughters of Oceanus took off the well-strung hunting nets, and, another took charge of, the dogs, Loxo loosed the boots from her feet. She in the midday heat still guarded her maiden modesty in the river, moving through the water with cautious step, and lifting her tunic little by little from foot to head with the edge touching the surface, keeping the two feet and thighs close together and hiding her body as she bathed the hole by degrees. Aura looked sideways through the water with the daring gaze of her sharp eyes unashamed, and scanned the holy frame of the virgin who may not be seen, examining the divine beauty of her chaste mistress, virgin Aura stretched out her arms and feet at full length and swam by the side of the swimming divinity. Now Artemis Lady of the Hunt, stood, half visible on the river bank, and wrung out the dripping water from her hair, Aura the maid of the hunt stood by her side, and stroked her breasts and uttered these impious words. Artemis, you only have the name of a virgin maid, because your rounded breasts are full and soft, a woman's breasts like the Paphian, not a man's like Athena, 
and your cheeks shed a rosy radiance. Well, since you have a body like that desirous goddess, why not be queen of marriage as well as Sidaea with her wealth of fine hair, and receive a bridegroom into your chamber? If it please you, leave Athena and sleep with Hermes and Ares. If it please you, take up the bow and arrows of the loves, if your passion is so strong for a quiver full of arrows. I ask pardon of your beauty, but I am much better than you. See what a vigorous body I have. Look at Aura's body like a boy's, and her step swifter than Zephyrus. See the muscles upon my arms, look at my breasts, round and unripe, not like a woman. You might almost say that yours are swelling with drops of milk. Why are your arms so tender, why are your breasts not round like Aura's, to tell the world themselves of unviolated maidenhood? So she spoke in raillery, the goddess listened downcast in boding silence. Waves of anger swelled in her breast, her flashing eyes had death in their look. She leapt up from the stream and put on her tunic again, and once more fitted the girdle upon her pure loins, offended. She betook herself to Nemesis, and found her on the heights of Tauros in the clouds, where beside neighbor Sidnos she had ended the proud neck boasting of Typhon's threats. A wheel turned itself round before the queen's feet, signifying that she rolls all the proud from on high to the ground with the avenging wheel of justice, she the all-vanquishing deity who turns the path of life. Round her throne flew a bird of vengeance, a griffin flying with wings, or balancing himself on four feet, to go unbidden before the flying goddess and show that she herself traverses the four separate quarters of the world, high-crested men she bridles with her bit which none can shake off, such is the meaning of the image, and she rolls a haughty fellow about as it were with the whip of misery, like a self-rolling wheel. When the goddess beheld Artemis with pallid face, she knew that she was offended and full of deadly threatenings, and questioned her in friendly words. Your looks, archeress, proclaim your anger. Artemis, what impious son of earth persecutes you? What second Typhius has sprung up from the ground? Has Titius risen again rolling a love-mad eye, and touched the robe of your untouchable mother? Where is your bow, Artemis, where are Apollo's arrows? What Orion is using force against you once more? The wretch that touched your dress still lies in his mother's flanks, a lifeless corpse, if any man has clutched your garments with lustful hands, grow another scorpion to avenge your girdle. If bold Otos again, or boastful Ephialtus, has desired to win your love so far beyond his reach, then slay the pretender to your unwedded virginity. If some prolific wife provokes your mother Leto, let her weep for her children, another Niobe of stone. Why should not I make another stone on Sipylos? Is your father pestering you to marry as he did with Athena? Surely Cronion has not promised you to Hermes for a wife, as he promised pure Athena to Hephaestus in wedlock. But if some woman is persecuting you as one did to your mother Leto, I will be the avenger of the offended archeress. She had not finished, when the puppy-breeding maiden broke in and said to the goddess who saves from evil. Virgin all-vanquishing, guide of creation, Zeus pesters me not, nor Niobe, nor bold Otos, no Titius has dragged at the long robes of my Leto, no new son of earth like Orion forces me, no, it is that sour virgin Aura, the daughter of Lantos, who mocks me and offends me with rude sharp words. But how can I tell you all she said? I am ashamed to describe her calumny of my body and her abuse of my breasts. I have suffered just as my mother did, we are both alike, in Phrygia Niobe offended Leto the mother of twins, in Phrygia again impious or offended me. But Niobe paid for it by passing into a changeling form, the daughter of Tantalos whose children were her sorrow, and she still weeps with stony eyes, I alone am insulted and bear my disgrace without vengeance, but Aura the champion of chastity has washed no stone with tears, she has seen no fountain declaring the faults of her uncontrolled tongue. I pray you, uphold the dignity of your titan birth. Grant me a boon like my mother, that I may see Aura's body transformed into stone immovable, leave not a maiden of your own race in sorrow, that I may not see Aura mocking me again and not to be turned, or let your sickle of beaten bronze drive her to madness. She spoke, and the goddess replied with encouraging words. Chaste, daughter of Leto, huntress, sister of Phoebus, 
I will not use my sickle to chastise a titan girl, I will not make the maiden a stone in Phrygia, for I am myself born of the ancient race of titans, and her father Lantos might blame me when he heard, but one boon I will grant you, Archeress. Or the maid of the hunt has reproached your virginity, and she shall be a virgin no longer. You shall see her in the bed of a mountain stream weeping fountains of tears for her maiden girdle. So she consoled her, and Artemis the maiden entered her car with its team of four prickets, left the mountain and drove back to Phrygia. With equal speed the maiden Adrastea pursued her obstinate enemy Aura. She had harnessed racing griffins under her bridle, quick through the air she coursed in the swift car, until she tightened the curving bits of her four-footed birds, and drew up on the peak of Sipylos in front of the face of Tantalos's daughter with eyeballs of stone. Then she approached the haughty Aura. She flicked the proud neck of the hapless girl with her snaky whip, and struck her with the round wheel of justice, and bent the foolish unbending will. Argive Adrastea let the whip with its vipers curl round the maiden's girdle, doing pleasure to Artemis and to Dionysus while he was still indignant, and although she was herself unacquainted with love, she prepared another love, after the bed of Pellini, after the loss of Ariadne, one was left in her own country, one was a stone in a foreign land like the statue of Achaean Hera, and more than all for the ill success with Baroe's bed. Nemesis now flew back to snow-beaten Tauros until she reached Sidnos again. And Eros drove Dionysus mad for the girl with the delicious wound of his arrow, then curving his wings flew lightly to Olympus. And the god roamed over the hills scourged with a greater fire. For there was not the smallest comfort for him. He had then no hope of the girl's love, no physic for his passion, but Eros burnt him more and more with the mind-bewitching fire to win mad obstinate aura at last. With hard struggles he kept his desire hidden, he used no lover's prattle beside aura in the woods, for fear she might avoid him. What is more shameless, than when only men crave, and women do not desire? Wandering Bacchus felt the arrow of love fixed in his heart if the maiden was hunting with her pack of dogs in the woods, if he caught a glimpse of a thigh when the loving winds lifted her tunic, he became soft as a woman. At last buffeted by his tumultuous desire for aura, desperate he cried out in mad tones. I am like lovelorn Pan, when the girl flees me swift as the wind, and wanders, treading the wilderness with boot more agile than echo never seen. You are happy, Pan, much more than Bromius, for during your search you have found a physic for love and a mind-bewitching voice. Echo follows your tones and returns them, moving from place to place, and utters a sound of speaking like your voice. If only Maid Aura had done the same, and let one word sound from her lips. This love is different from all others, for the girl herself has a nature not like the ways of other maidens. What physic is there for my pain? Shall I charm her with lover's nod and beck? Ah when, ah when is Aura charmed with moving eyelids? Who by love mad looks or wooing whispers could seduce the heart of a she bear to the Paphian, to Eros? Who discourses to a lioness? Who talks to an oak? Who has beguiled a lifeless fir tree? Whoever persuaded a cornel tree, and took a rock in marriage? And what man could charm the mind of Aura proof against all charms? What man could charm her, who will mention marriage, or the cestus which helps love, to this girl with no girdle to her tunic? Who will mention the sweet sting of love or the name of Cyprogenia? I think Athena will listen sooner, and not intrepid Artemis avoids me so much as prudish Aura. If she would only say as much as this with her dear lips, Bacchus, your desire is vain, seek not for maiden aura. So he spoke to the breezes of spring, while walking in a flowery meadow. Beside a fragrant myrtle he stayed his feet for a soothing rest at midday. He leaned against a tree and listened to the west breeze whispering, overcome by fatigue and love, and as he sat there, a hammer-dryad nymph at home in the clusters of her native tree, a maiden unveiled, peeped out and said, true both to Cyprus, and to loving Lyaeos. Bacchus can never lead Aura to his bed, unless he binds her first in heavy galling fetters, and winds the bonds of Cyprus round hands and feet, or else puts her under the yoke of marriage in sleep, and steals the girl's maidenhood without bride price. Having spoken she hid again in the tree her age-mate, and entered again her woody home, 
but Bacco's distressed with love breeding dreams made his mind a parade, the soul of dead Ariadne born on the wind came, and beside Dionysus sleeping sound, stood jealous after death, and spoke in the words of a dream. Dionysus, you have forgotten your former bride, you long for Aura, and you care not for Ariadne. O oh my own Theseus, whom the bitter wind stole! O oh my own Theseus, whom Phaedra got for husband! I suppose it was fated that a perjured husband must always run from me, if the sweet boy left me while I slept, and I was married instead to Laeos, an inconstant lover and a deceiver. Alas, that I had not a mortal husband, one soon to die, then I might have armed myself against love mad Dionysus and been one of the Lemnian women myself. But after Theseus, now I must call you to a perjured bridegroom, the invader of many marriage beds. If your bride asks you for a gift, take this distaff at my hands, a friendly gift of love, that you may give your mountaineering bride what your Manoyan wife gave you, then people can say, she gave the thread to Theseus, and the distaff to Dionysus. You are just like Cronian changing from bed to bed, and you have imitated the doings of your woman mad father, having an insatiable passion for changing your loves. I know how you lately married your Scythonian wife Polini, and your wedding with Althea, I will say nothing of the love of Coronice, from whose bed were born the three graces ever inseparable. But O oh my Sinai, proclaim my fate and the savage glare of Medusa. Shores of Naxos, cry aloud of Ariadne's lot, constrained to a hateful love, and say, O oh bridegroom Theseus, Minos's daughter calls you in anger against Dionysus. But why do I think of Scropia? To her of Paphos, I carry my plaint against them both, Theseus and Dionysus. The wing of sleep. He lamented the sorrow of Ariadne in his dream, and sought for some clever device which could meet all needs, and lead him to love. First he remembered the bed of the astacid nymph long before, how he had wooed the lovely nymph with a cunning potion and made sleep his guide to intoxicated bridles. While Bacchus would be preparing a cunning device for her bed, Lantos's daughter wandered about seeking a fountain, for she was possessed with parching thirst. Dionysus failed not to see how thirsting Aura ran rapidly over the hills. Quickly he leapt up and dug the earth with his wand at the foundation of a rock, the hill parted, and poured out of itself a purple stream of wine from its sweet-scented bosom. The seasons, handmaids of Helios, to do grace to Laeos, painted with flowers the fountain's margin, and fragrant whiffs from the new-growing meadow beat on the balmy air. There were the clustering blooms which have the name of Narcissos the fair youth, whom horned Selene's bridegroom Endymion begat on leafy Lotmos, Narcissos who long ago gazed on his own image formed in the water, the dumb image of a beautiful deceiver, and died as he gazed on the shadowy phantom of his shape, there was the living plant of a Miclean iris, there sang the nightingales over the spring blossoms, flying in troops above the clustering flowers. And there came running thirsty at midday Aura herself, seeking if anywhere she could find raindrops from Zeus, or some fountain, or the stream of a river pouring from the hills, and Eros cast a mist over her eyelids, but when she saw the deceitful fountain of Bacchus, Pitho dispersed the shadowy cloud from her eyelids, and called out to Aura like a herald of her marriage. Maiden, come this way. Take into your lips the stream of this nuptial fountain, and into your bosom a lover. Gladly the maiden saw it, and throwing herself down before the fountain drew in the liquid of Bacchus with open lips. When she had drunk, the girl exclaimed, Naiads, what marvel is this? Whence comes this balmy water? Who made this bubbling drink, what heavenly womb gave him birth? Certainly after drinking this I can run no more. No, my feet are heavy, sweet sleep bewitches me, nothing comes from my lips but a soft, stammering sound. She spoke, and went stumbling on her way. She moved this way and that way with erring motions, her brow shook with throbbing temples, her head leaned and lay on her shoulder, she fell asleep on the ground beside a tall branching tree and entrusted to the bare earth her maidenhood unguarded. When fiery Eros beheld Aura stumbling heavy knee, he leapt down from heaven, and smiling with peaceful countenance, spoke to Dionysus with full sympathy. Are you for a hunt, Dionysus? Virgin Aura awaits you. With these words, 
he made haste away to Olympus flapping his wings, but first he had inscribed on the spring petals, Bridegroom, complete your marriage while the maiden is still asleep, and let us be silent that sleep may not leave the maiden. Then Iabacos, seeing her on the bare earth, plucking the lethean feather of bridal sleep, he crept up noiseless, unshod, on tiptoe, and approached Aura where she lay without voice or hearing. With gentle hand he put away the girl's neat quiver and hid the bow in a hole in the rock, that she might not shake off sleep's wing and shoot him. Then he tied the girl's feet together with indissoluble bonds, and passed a cord round and round her hands that she might not escape him, he laid the maiden down in the dust, a victim heavy with sleep ready for Aphrodite, and stole the bridal fruit from Aura sleep. The husband brought no gift, on the ground that hapless girl heavy with wine, unmoving, was wedded to Dionysus, sleep embraced the body of Aura with overshadowing wings, and he was marshal of the wedding for Bacchus, for he also had experience of love, he is Yokefellow of the moon, he is companion of the loves in nightly caresses. So the wedding was like a dream, for the capering dances, the hill skipped and leapt of itself, the hammer dryad half visible shook her age made fur, only maiden Echo did not join in the mountain dance, but shamefast hid herself unapproachable under the foundations of the rock, that she might not behold the wedding of woman-mad Dionysus. When the vine bridegroom had consummated his wedding on that silent bed, he lifted a cautious foot and kissed the bride's lovely lips, loosed the unmoving feet and hands, brought back the quiver and bow from the rock and laid them beside his bride. He left to the winds the bed of Aura still sleeping, and returned to his satyrs with a breath of the bridal still about him. After these caresses, the bride started up, she shook off limb loosing sleep, the witness of the unpublished nuptials, saw with surprise her breasts bare of the modest bodice, the cleft of her thighs uncovered, her dress marked with the drops of wedlock that told of a maidenhood ravished without bride gift. She was maddened by what she saw. She fitted the bodice again about her chest, and bound the maiden girdle again over her rounded breast, too late. She shrieked in distress, held in the throes of madness, she chased the countrymen, slew shepherds beside the leafy slopes, to punish her treacherous husband with avenging justice, still more she killed the oxherds with implacable steel, for she knew about charming Tythonos, bridegroom of dawn, the lovelorn oxherd, knew that Selene also the driver of bulls had her Latmian Endymion who was busy about the herds of cattle, she had heard of Phrygian Hymnos too, and his love that made him rue. The lovelorn herdsman whom another maiden slew, still more she killed the goat herds, killed their whole flocks of goats, in agony of heart, because she had seen Pan the dangerous lover with a face like some shaggy goat, for she felt quite sure that shepherd Pan tormented with desire for Echo had violated her asleep, much more she laid low the husbandman, as being also slaves to Cyprus, since a man who tilled the soil, Aesian, had been bedfellow of Demeter the mother of sheaves. The huntsman she killed believing an ancient story, for she had heard that a huntsman Cephalos, from the country of unmothered Athena, was husband of rose-crowned dawn. Workmen of Bacchus about the vintage she killed, because they are servants of Lyaeos who squeeze out the intoxicating juice of his liquor, heavy with wine, dangerous lovers. For she had not yet learnt the cunning heart of Dionysus, and the seductive potion of heady love, but she made empty the huts of the mountain-ranging herdsmen, and drenched the hills with red blood. Still frantic in mind, shaken by throes of madness, she came to the temple of Cyprus. She loosed the girdle from her newly spun robe, the enemy Latmian herdsman, though his country and legend alike vary, was her love, and she cast him into an unending sleep. Hymnos, CF 15. 204 FF, Iasian, Odyssey V. 125, Cephalos, C4. 194. Of the Cestus, and flogged the dainty body of the unconquerable goddess, she caught up the statue of marriage consummating Cythea, she went to the bank of Sangarios, and sent Aphrodite rolling into the stream, naked among the naked naiads, and after the divine statue had gone with the scourge twisted round it, she threw into the dust the delicate image of love, and left the temple of Cybelid foam born empty. Then she plunged into the familiar forest, wandering unperceived, handled her net stakes, remembered the hunt again, lamenting her maidenhood with wet eyelids, and crying loudly in these words. 
what God has loosed the girdle of my maidenhood. If Zeus wise took some false aspect, and forced me, upon my lonely bed, if he did not respect our neighbor Rhea, I will leave the wild beasts and shoot the starry sky. If Phoebus Apollo lay by my side in sleep, I will raise the stones of world-famous Pytho wholly to the ground. If Silenian Hermes has ravished my bed, I will utterly destroy Arcadia with my arrows, and make gold chaplet Pytho my servant. If Dionysus came unseen and ravished my maidenhood in the crafty wing of a dream bridal, I will go where Sybil's hall stands, and chase that lust-mad Dionysus from high-crested Timolus. I will hang my quiver of death on my shoulders and attack Paphos, I will attack Phrygia, I will draw my bow on both Cyprus and Dionysus. You, Archeress, you have enraged me most, because you, a maiden, did not kill me in my sleep still a virgin, yes and did not defend me even against my bedfellow with your pure shafts. She spoke, and then checked her trembling voice overcome by tears. And Aura, hapless maiden, having within her the fruitful seed of Bacchus the begetter, carried a double weight, the wife maddened uncontrollably cursed the burden of the seed, hapless maiden Aura, lamented the loss of her maidenhood, she knew not, whether she had conceived of herself, or by some man, or a scheming god, she remembered the bride of Zeus, the recantion Pluto, so unhappy in the son Tantalos whom she bore. She wished to tear herself open, to cut open her womb in her senseless frenzy, that the child half-maid might be destroyed and never be reared. She even lifted a sword, and thought to drive the blade through her bare chest with pitiless hand. Often she went to the cave of a lioness with newborn cubs, that she might slip into the net of a willing fate, but the dread beast ran out into the mountains, in fear of death, and hid herself in some cleft of the rocks, leaving the cub alone in the lair. Often she thought to drive a sword willingly through the swelling womb and slay herself with her own hand, that self-slain she might escape the shame of her womb and the mocking taunts of glad Artemis. She longed to know her husband, that she might dish up her own son to her loathing husband, child slayer and paramour alike, that men might say, Aura, unhappy bride, has killed her child like another procne. Then Artemis saw her big with new children, and came near with a laugh on her face and teased the poor creature, saying with pitiless voice, I saw sleep, the Paphian's chamberlain. I saw the deceiving stream of the yellow fountain at your loving bridal. The fountain where young girls get a treacherous potion, and loosen the girdle they have worn all their lives, in a dream of marriage which steals their maidenhood. I have seen, I have seen the slope where a woman is made a bride unexpectedly, in treacherous sleep, beside a bridal rock. I have seen the love mountain of Cyprus, where lovers steal the maidenhood of women and run away. Tell me, you young prude, why do you walk so slowly today? Once as quick as the wind, why do you plod so heavily? You were wooed unwilling, and you do not know your bedfellow. You cannot hide your furtive bridal, for your breasts are swelling with new milk, and they announce a husband. Tell me heavy sleeper, pig sticker, virgin, bride, how do you come by those pale cheeks once ruddy? Who disgraced your bed? Who stole your maidenhood? O oh, fair-haired naiads, do not hide or as bridegroom. I know your furtive husband, you woman with a heavy burden. I saw your wedding, clearly enough, though you long to conceal it. I saw your husband clearly enough, you were in the bed, your body heavy with sleep, you did not move when Dionysus wedded you. Come then, leave your bow, renounce your quiver, serve in the secret rites of your woman mad Bacchus, carry your tambour and your tootling pipes of horn. I beseech you, in the name of that bed on the ground where the marriage was consummated, what bride gifts, did Dionysus your husband bring? Did he give you a fawn skin, enough to be news of your marriage bed? Did he give you brazen rattles for your children to play with? I think he gave you a thiasus to shoot lions, perhaps he gave symbols, which nurses shake to console the howling pains of the little children. So spoke the goddess in mockery, and went away to shoot her wild beasts again, in anger leaving her cares to the winds of heaven. But the girl went among the high rocks of the mountains. There unseen, when she felt the cruel throes of childbirth pangs, her voice roared terrible as a lioness in labor, and the rocks resounded, 
for Dolorous Echo gave back an answering roar to the loud shrieking girl. She held her hands over her lap like a lid compressing the birth, to close the speedy delivery of her ripening child, and delayed the babe now perfect. For she hated Artemis and would not call upon her in her pains, she would not have the daughters of Hera, lest they as being children of Bacchus's stepmother should oppress her delivery with more pain. At last in her affliction the girl cried out these despairing words, stabbed with the pangs of one who was new to the hard necessity of childbirth. So may I see Archeress and wild Athena, so may I see them both great with child. Reproach Artemis in labor, O midwife seasons, be witness of her delivery, and say to treat Eugenia, O virgin bright eyes, O new mother who mother had none. So may I see Echo who loves maidenhood so much, suffering as I do, after she has lain with Pan, or Dionysus the cause of my troubles. Artemis, if you could bring forth, it would be some consolation to Aura, that you should trickle woman's milk from your man's breast. So she cried, lamenting the heavy pangs of her delivery. Then Artemis delayed the birth, and gave the laboring bride the pain of retarded delivery. But Nica, the leader of the rites of Lyaeos, seeing the pain and disgrace of distracted Aura, spoke to her thus in secret pity. Aura, I have suffered as you have, and you too lament you your maidenhood. But since you carry in your womb the burden of painful childbirth, endure after the bed to have the pangs of delivery, endure to give your untaught breast to babes. Why did you also drink wine, which robbed me of my girdle? Why did you also drink wine, Aura, until you were with child? You also suffered what I suffered, you enemy of marriage, then you also have to blame a deceitful sleep sent by the loves, who are friends of marriage. One fraud fitted marriage on us both, one husband was Auras and made virgin Nica the mother of children. No more have I a beast slaying bow, no longer as once, I draw my bowstring and my arrows, I am a poor woman working at the loom, and no longer a wild Amazon. She spoke, pitying Aura's labor to accomplish the birth, as one who herself had felt the pangs of labor. But Leto's daughter, hearing the resounding cries of Aura, came near the bride again in triumph, taunted her in her suffering and spoke in stinging words. Virgin, who made you a mother in childbed? You that knew nothing of marriage, how came that milk in your breast? I never heard or saw that a virgin bears a child. Has my father changed nature? Do women bear children without marriage? For you, a maiden, the friend of maidenhood, bring forth young children, even if you hate Aphrodite. Then do women in childbed under the hard necessity of childbirth no longer call on Artemis to guide them, when you alone do not want Archeress the lady of the hunt. Nor did Ilithia, who conducts your delivery, see your Dionysus born from his mother's womb, but thunderbolts were his midwives, and he only half made. Do not be angry that you bear children among the crags, where Rhea queen of the crags has born children. What harm is it that you bear children in the mountains, you the mountaineer wife of mountain ranging Dionysus? She spoke, and the nymph in childbirth was indignant and angry, but she was ashamed before Artemis even in her pains. Our poor creature! She wished to remain a maiden, and she was near to childbirth. A babe came quickly into the light, for even as Artemis yet spoke the word that shot out the delivery, the womb of Aura was loosened, and twin children came forth of themselves, therefore from these twins the high peak mountain of Rio was called Indiman. Seeing how fair the children were, the goddess again spoke in a changed voice. Wet nurse, lonely ranger, twin mother, bride of a forced bridal, give your untaught breast to your sons, virgin mother. Your boy calls daddy, asking for his father, tell your children the name of your secret lover. Artemis knows nothing of marriage, she has not nursed a son at her breast. These mountains were your bed, and the spotted skins of fawns are swaddling clothes for your babies, instead of the usual robe. She spoke, and swift she plunged into the shady wood. Then Dionysus called Nica, his own cybelid nymph, and smiling pointed to Aura still upbraiding her childbed, proud of his late union with the lonely girl, he said. Now at last, Nica, you have found consolation for your love. Now again Dionysus has stolen a marriage bed, 
and ravished another maiden, woodland or in the mountains, who shrank once from the very name of love, has seen a marriage the image of yours. Not you alone had sweet sleep as a guide to love, not you alone drank deceitful wine which stole your maiden girdle, but once more a fountain of nuptial wine has burst from a new opening rock unrecognized, and Aura drank. You who have learnt the throes of childbirth in hard necessity, by teller to your dance-weaving daughter I beseech you, hasten to lift up my son, that my desperate Aura may not destroy him with daring hands, for I know she will kill one of the two baby boys in her intolerable frenzy, but do you help I echoes, guard the better boy, that your teller may be the servant of son and father both. With this appeal Bacchus departed, triumphant and proud of his two Phrygian marriages, with the elder wife and the younger bride. And in deep distress beside the rock where they had been born, the mother in childbed held up the two boys and cried aloud. From the sky came this marriage, I will throw my offspring into the sky. I was wooed by the breezes, and I saw no mortal bed. Wines my namesakes came down to the marriage of the wind maid, then let the breezes take the offspring of my womb. Away with you, children accursed of a treacherous father, you are none of mine, what have I to do with the sorrows of women? Show yourselves now, lions, come freely to forage in the woods, have no fear, for Aura is your enemy no more. Hares with your rolling eyes, you are better than hounds. Jackals, let me be your favorite, I will watch the panther jumping fearless beside my bed. Bring your friend the bear without fear, for now that Aura has children her arrows in bronze armor have become womanish. I am ashamed to have the name of bride who once was virgin, lest I sometime offer my strong breast to the babes, lest I press out the bastard milk with my hand, or be called tender mother in the woods where I slew mid beasts. She took the babes and, laid them in the den of a lioness for her dinner. But a panther with understanding mind licked their bodies with her ravening lips, and nursed the beautiful boys of Dionysus with intelligent breast, wandering serpents with poison-spitting mouths surrounded the birthplace, for Aura's bridegroom had made even the ravening beasts gentle to guard his newborn children. Then Lantos's daughter sprang up with wandering foot in the mid-temper of a shaggy-crested lioness, tore one child from the wild beast's jaws and hurled it like a flash into the stormy air, the newborn child fell from the air headlong into the whirling dust upon the ground, and she caught him up and gave him a tomb in her own moor, a family dinner indeed. The maiden archeress was terrified at this heartless mother, and seized the other child of Aura, then she hastened away through the wood, holding the boy, an unfamiliar burden in her nursing arm. After the bed of Bromius, after the delirium of childbirth, Huntress Aura would escape the reproach of her wedding, for she still held in reverence the modesty of her maiden state. So she went to the banks of Sangarios, threw into the water her back-bending bow and her neglected quiver, and leapt headlong into the deep stream, refusing in shame to let her eyes look on the light of day. The waves of the river covered her up, and Cronion turned her into a fountain, her breasts became the spouts of falling water, the stream was her body, the flowers her hair, her bow the horn of the horned river in bull shape, the bowstring changed into a rush and the whistling arrows into vocal reeds, the quiver passed through to the muddy bed of the river and, changed to a hollow channel, poured its sounding waters. Then the archeress stilled her anger. She went about the forest seeking for traces of Lyaeos in his beloved mountains, while she held Aura's newborn babe, carrying in her arms another's burden, until shamefast she delivered his boy to Dionysus her brother. The father gave charge of his son to Nica the nymph as a nurse. She took him, and fed the boy, pressing out the life-giving juice of her child nursing breasts from her teat, until he grew up. While the boy was yet young, Bacchus took into his car this Bacchus his father's namesake, and presented him to Attic Athena mid her mysteries, babbling Euoi. Goddess Pallas in her temple received him into her maiden bosom, which had welcome for a god, she gave the boy that pap which only Erechtheus had sucked, and let the alien milk trickle of itself from her unripe breast. The goddess gave him in trust to the Bacchants of Eleusis, the wives of Marathon wearing ivy tripped around the boy I echoes, and lifted the attic torch in the nightly dances of the deity lately born. They honored him as a god next after the son of Persephone, and after Semele's son, 
they established sacrifices for Dionysus late born and Dionysus first born, and third they chanted a new hymn for Iacos. In these three celebrations Athens held high revel, in the dance lately made, the Athenians beat the step in honor of Zagreus and Bromius and Iacos altogether. But Bacchus had not forgotten his Sidonian darling, no, he remembered still the bride once his, then lost, and he placed in Olympus the rounded crown of Ariadne passed away, a witness of his love, an everlasting proclaimer of garlanded wedding. Then the vine god ascended into his father's heaven, and touched one table with the father who had brought him to birth, after the banquets of mortals, after the wine once poured out, he quaffed heavenly nectar from nobler goblets, on a throne beside Apollo, at the hearth beside Maya's son.